All right, if folks could gradually make their ways back to their seats, we can get started promptly at 8 a.m. Waiting for the National Institute of Standards to tell me it's eight o'clock. All right. Good morning. Uh, welcome to day three of the council meeting and the last day of daylight savings time of 2022. So there'll be further reminders <clears throat> later in the day to uh, reset your clocks. Uh, before we get started, I'll ask our executive director if there are any announcements. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, no, my announcement was similar to yours. Uh, don't forget daylight savings this evening. Um, other than that, that's all. All right, well, we'll get started. Uh, we are on time and let's try to stay that way. Uh, first agenda items H2 and I'm, I'll pass the gavel to Vice Chair Pete Hessemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope that we are on time wasn't a warning to me. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over immediately to Jim Seeger to give us an overview on this agenda item. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman, and good morning, Council Members. Uh, so we're here on the uh, Trawl Catch Review Program and Intersector Allocation Review Hearing Schedule Agenda Item H2. Um, at its your last meeting, you initiated a process for reviewing the, both the trawl catch share program and your intersector allocation. And there are draft re review documents that will be prepared for you for your meeting uh, next June. Um, and then you also, at September, you directed that public hearings be ha held in the spring in advance of that June council meeting. Under this agenda item, you're scheduled to adopt a, a schedule and locations for those hearings. Uh, an initial proposal is provided for you under agenda item H2, attachment one, and I will turn to that, um, that next here. Looking at attachment one, uh, you'll see first at the top there, uh, the list of nine hearings that were held uh, the, in your, your first review of this program. Um, and then in the middle of the document, you'll see sort of some of the things that we kept in mind as we developed the staff proposal that uh, is at the bottom, and I'll turn to the, be turning to that next. Uh, but in thinking about the location for, for these hearings, we thought about the fact that this they are they do need to cover both the trawl catch share program as well as the intersector allocations. Uh, we looked at the a mix of virtual and in-person hearings as being a way to accommodate different preference uh, styles as well as a broad range of geographic locations and the potentiality that folks may have uh, conflicts on one date uh, but might be able to make another. Uh, and then we also kept in mind that uh, when you uh, next address this issue at your June 2023 council meeting, you'll be in Vancouver, Washington. And so that provides yet another opportunity for people who aren't able to make a particular uh, hearing in their area. So at the bottom then you'll see the uh, staff proposal. Uh, there is a proposal for four in-person hearings, uh, one in Washington, one in Oregon, and two in California. And you'll see that uh, the only uh, location we specifically pinned down was uh, Eureka, uh, at least our recommendation is Eureka in California, and that for each of the other, uh, for Southern California, or I guess that's Central California, and for Oregon and Washington, we have a couple, a few choices there for you to consider. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the uh, two virtual hearings uh, that we're proposing, uh, one in the evening at the start of the uh, hearing uh, process there, and uh, one perhaps a midday one uh, towards the end of that, end of that uh, uh, series of hearings. Mr. Chairman, that uh, completes the overview and, and I think presents the decision that you have before you. Mr. Vice Chairman, excuse me. 
Thank you, Jim. Any questions on the overview? Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Dr. Seeger. Um, as we see in that attachment one, nine ports were visited over a two-week two -week period previously. And I know as part of Council's continued discussions about efficiencies, there's been you know, the request for consideration of in-person and uh, virtual meetings. So can you explain the what factors are driving the proposed reduction in these hearings, given the support we've heard from Council? And is there any uh, or from Council uh, testimony and report AB reports for those hearings and the importance of them? And then can you also speak to the capacity to increase that potential schedule? Yes, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, uh, Ms. Watson. Um, yeah, we were looking at uh, trying to be, um, uh, you know, good custodians of, of council funds. The, the previous time around, it was the first time, right, uh, to review the trial catch share program. And so there was a lot of attention uh, being given to it. And, um, you know, we produced an 800 to 1,000 page document and uh, um, did a, a really a full meal deal effort with uh, teams uh, going to all these hearings. And uh, we we're just thinking that might be um, appropriate to scale it back, both in consideration of uh, we've gone through the review process once, a little more focused now, uh, just trying to be a little bit more efficient and, and good custodians. But um, I believe that there is, um, uh, Mr. Executive Director Burton can, can speak to uh, budget and staff implications, but I believe there's flexibility for adding. Thank you. Further questions for Jim? <coughs> Not seeing any. I think we'll move on then to the gap report. And we have Travis Hunter to present that. Good morning, Travis. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Um, Travis Hunter, and this morning I'll be reading the gap report on trawl catch share program and intersector allocation review hearing schedule. The Ground Fish Advisory Subpanel received a brief overview from Dr. Jim Seeger on the proposed hearing schedule for the upcoming Trawl Catch Share Program and Intersector Allocation Review and offers the following comments and suggestions. Giving consideration to both budget and staff time requirements for in-person meetings, staff have proposed four in-person hearings and two virtual hearings, six meetings total, to be completed over a one and a half week period between the end of April and beginning of May, 2023. This compares to nine in-person meetings that were held during the last program review. It is the GAP's preference that the two in-person meetings be held in both Washington, Seattle and Westport, and Oregon, Astoria and Newport, as is being proposed for California, Eureka and the San Luis Obispo Monterey area. For a total of six in-person meetings, along with the two virtual meeting options, eight meetings total. Given the geographic locations of the trawl and fixed gear sectors, the gap feels it is unrealistic to plan for a single hearing in Oregon, unlike in Washington, where if necessary, a single in-person meeting is more feasible. If the council staff determine that there can only be four in-person meetings, the gap recommends these meetings be held in Seattle, Astoria, Newport, in Eureka. The GAP appreciates the addition of holding virtual hearings as a way of increasing stakeholder participation and helping to address concerns with the potential limited geographic scope of in-person meetings. It is the GAP's preference that more in-person meetings be held. However, the council staff could consider the addition of a third virtual meeting to help ensure as much participation and stakeholder input as possible. Lastly, when finalizing the hearing schedule, the GAP recommends the council and staff be cognizant of the time of the year and when vessels or sectors may be actively fishing, i.e. moving the proposed May meetings into April to better accommodate the fishing schedule of the at-sea fleet. And that concludes the GAP report. Thank you. Any questions for Travis on the GAP report? Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, good morning, Travis. Thank you um, for the GAP report this morning. Just a quick point of clarification. Um, reads very clear that more meetings and two in each state is the preference of the GAP. Um, <clears throat> but if there isn't an ability to accommodate that, um, I'd just like to know how Eureka was chosen over the Monterey or San Luis Obispo area. If you could elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah. 
uh, through the vice chair, uh, Ms. McKnight. The, um, it was discussed, um, it, it seemed to be, if, if you're asking specifically why in, you know, in California, Eureka was chosen over the others, it was the amount of uh, trawl effort and participants there. And at that time, um, there was no other discussion or uh, mention of preference from anywhere else. And I'm from Eureka, so <laughs> I was in the room. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think Mr. Seeger would like to weigh in on it. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Just a, a point of a little bit of clarification there. Um, so the staff proposal includes Eureka and then a choice of the two other ones. So um, yeah, it was pinned down because of the, uh, the trial presence there, but then we weren't sure where California. We thought that Eureka was probably a pretty good choice. It can be changed. Um, and then we just, uh, between San Luis Obispo and Monterey, we weren't sure which where you'd want to. You know. Chair Gorelnik. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the report. Um, did the GAP discuss um, whether uh, the Ape, whether the June council meeting in Vancouver, Washington would also provide an opportunity for public input in addition to uh, the one hearing that was scheduled in Washington? Um, through the vice chair, Chairman Grelnick, um, it, it wasn't, that was not discussed much, but it was assumed that that, that there would be opportunity for uh, public, at least public comment and, uh, and discussion within the gap if it was uh, on the agenda for that meeting. Good. Further questions for Travis on the gap report? I don't see any hands, so thank you, Travis. Thank you. I think that takes us to public comment, and I do not do not see any. I'll just confirm there is no public comment. So with that, we'll move into council discussion and action to adopt the 2023 public hearing schedule and locations. I'll look for a hand to kick off any discussion. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the GAPS report and their recommendations and hearing on a hearing schedule. And I also appreciate council staff coming up with one that we could actually be reviewing today. Um, from the Oregon perspective, I'm in support of the GAPS recommendation to have two in-person meetings in Oregon, in Astoria and Newport. Um, and I'd also like to adhere to their recommendation for council staff to consider the dates of these meetings with regards to the different fishery sectors to increase participation. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion, Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, yes, I, I would like to um, also support the GAP statement um, requesting two or more in-person hearings um, specifically for Eureka and then the San Luis Obispo or Monterey area. Specific to that, um, I, I heard that there was a lot of discussion about trial participation relative to the selection of, of Eureka. Um, however, I want to emphasize that um, intersector allocations are also being reviewed as this process, and that's a pretty um, significant and important uh, consideration in the central and southern part of California. So um, having an in-person hearing in San Luis Obispo or Morro Bay area would be uh, the preference of California to ensure that we have the voices and, and folks in the right room to, to in provide input. Right, thank you. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair, and um, I also appreciate the GAPS uh, statement very much and, and the discussion about um, having good widespread participation at these meetings. Um, as we talked about um, the alternatives for Washington, uh, Seattle, and our Westport, one of the things that were we talked about was um, particularly uh, with regard to the idea that a, a in-person meeting could be in Astoria was that that could capture a lot of um, also Washington participation and that would also then uh, allow for an in-person meeting in Seattle um, where we have a large uh, 
um, representation um, of our fleet. So Astoria, if it's an option for Oregon, um, also supports input from the Washington um, participants. And I think the idea of the Vancouver meeting also um, allows for that too, if that gives some flexibility in terms of in-person meetings. All right, thank you. Um, Chair Gorelnik, thank you. I've got a question for council staff. Um, first, let me say I'm sympathetic to more meetings rather than fewer, but um, I also think that um, the virtual meeting has some merit as well. So if we increase the number of in-person meetings, will that compromise the ability to have um, the virtual meetings? Mr. Vice Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, I, don't, I don't see that be a compromise there in terms of staff time for that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Further discussion on this, Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, and just to clarify, Dr. Seeger, for the in-person, they would be in-person only, not a hybrid approach, correct? Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Watson, that's correct. Thank you. All right, I'll watch for further hands, but Jim, I, I'm gonna look to you and see what you've got here. I do not believe we need to do this through motion unless uh, it's not clear to you, so please. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, you're right, what I've got here then, uh, based as council guidance, uh, starting north would be to have a uh, hearing in Washington and then Astoria, Newport, Eureka, and then the San Luis Obispo Monterey area. Uh, and also, uh, particularly with respect to the uh, hearings in the northern area where the at sea fleet is uh, is more likely to be present to hold those uh, prior to sometime in April so that uh, they would be in port for those hearings. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to clarify, Jim, that um, the preference would be for San Luis Obispo over Monterey. Oh. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> uh, I, I had down uh, San Luis Obispo Morro Bay area. If I said Monterey, I thought I thought I heard you say the Morro Bay area. Yeah, okay. And, and I, I, maybe I misspoke there. Maybe I misheard too, but San Luis Obispo <laughs> okay. for sure. Okay, thank That's you. Okay. <laughs> All right. With that, I'll I'll look to Oregon and Washington. Also, is that clear? All right. Is there anything further? We need to take up on this, Jim. I think you're good, thank you. All right, with that, we will close out this agenda item and I will pass the gavel back to our chair. All right, thank you very much uh, for excellent quick work on that agenda item. Uh, so now we come to another agenda item, one we're all looking forward to, H3, civil fish gear switching. And in the staff seat, this is such a great agenda item. We have two staff officers there, Jim and Jesse. So we'll give Jesse a chance to get settled in. And then um, we, I think we also have a change in the CDFW seat and maybe the WDFW seat. So welcome Corey Niles and welcome Mercy Remco to the table. And Jim and Jesse, whenever you're ready, you just uh, please get started. There we go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you just mentioned, we're here to talk about uh, the gear switching and your selection of preliminary preferred alternative agenda item H2. Uh, for this agenda item, you have three attachments and an NIMS report that were in your advanced briefing materials. Uh, supplementally, you received a NIMS report on workload. You're not sharing. Oh. Nobody see. Okay.
you missed this first pretty slide, but uh, now we're on this one here, and we got the list of uh, briefing materials there for you. Uh, supplementally, you received a, a NIMS report on workload uh, related to the alternatives and options, and uh, you have supplemental reports from the GAP, GMT, and the EC, and of course, uh, public comments available to you on the uh, Council Briefing Book webpage. Concerns about gear switching has been discussed since prior to the cat share review that was completed in 2017. And we've gone through a fairly lengthy process, the most recent steps of which you completed with the finalization of a range of alternatives for analysis at the September 21 and June 22 council meetings. We've identified a number of actions for you to consider at this meeting, which include reviewing the new alternative two Based, developed based on your instructions from your June meeting, reviewing the analysis of the individual and collective approaches to allocations, selection of a PPA, elimination of any options that you find are not viable, uh, and this will help uh, focus in, in any of the alternatives, your PPA or any of the uh, non-PPA alternatives, but anything you can eliminate will help uh, reduce what you the amount of material that we have to uh, present to you next time and help focus uh, public comment on final action, assuming that you move uh, forward with an action alternative. And then providing other guidance as needed. With the selection with respect to the selection of the PPA, I wanted to mention that that involves not only the selection of an alternative, but the specification of all the related options. And this is needed so that NIMP staff and council staff can comb through the PPA and identify any remaining issues to be addressed prior to moving uh, to an FPA. If you're not able to adopt a PPA at this meeting, and assuming that no action is not adopted, uh, then we would need two additional meetings after this one to complete this action, one to adopt a PPA and one to adopt the FPA. So the basic message here is that we, we uh, for PPA, we need to have all the options specified uh, and we can't go straight to an FPA on this. We really need to have the PPA and, and have some time to, uh, uh, to go through it very carefully before you move to an FPA. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that completes the uh, overview of the uh, situation summary and uh, we have more presentation to go through, but I thought I'd take a, a moment here and see if there's any questions about the task before you today and how we're going to be moving forward. Excellent. Excellent. Let's be deliberative about this. So let's see if there are any questions at this stage before we get into the presentation. And I'm not seeing any hands, so please proceed. Okay, um, so one of the things that we will, what's that? Oh, we lost it again. Okay. Just take a moment here while we resolve. Uh... Okay, right. <laughs> Okay, so now I've lost it though. All right, we've got a technical issue to resolve, so we'll take a pause, um, but stay in the room so we can get started right away um, when we get that resolved. Mm -hmm.
All right, we're back online. So our short unscheduled break is over. And so if everyone could come back, I want to um, let everyone know that this is a, this is a, a going to be a complex agenda item. It's a very important agenda item. Um, after, and, you know, the public comment will be very important in our deliberations. And so for the benefit uh, of the public, what I'd like to ask council members to do is before we go to public comment, lay out any issues you want the public to comment on. And so we will make sure we do that before we go to public comment so that we're not raising things in discussion that the public has not heard. So with that, Mr. Seeger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, between this agenda item and the previous one, things will average out. Okay. Um, so we've gone through our action list here, and we're going to talk now about what we'll be presenting you today. Um, we're going to start with analysis of the problem, touching on the sections of the analysis that are highlighted here. Uh, then we'll do an overview of the alternatives, uh, focusing on alternative two, uh, and also discussing quantitative differences between the individual versus collective approach for dealing with group ownerships when evaluating allocate, allocation based on gear switching history. And then final, finally, we'll provide a summary of the initial analysis of impacts, including the uh, performance of the action alternatives and fishery impacts. So that's the plan for this presentation. So we'll start with the analysis of the, of the uh, of the problem. Uh, first, let's talk a bit about uh, the, the history of trawl attainment. Um, trawl attainment is difficult to evaluate for the period before the program started because there are many species uh, that were not, there were not for many species, there were not specific trawl allocations. Two analyses were done in connection with the last catcher review. One looked at data going back to 1995 and found downward trends for Dover Sole and Ling Cod that continued into the period of the catch share program. And the other went back just to 2009 and also found a downward trend for Dover Sole and, and one for Thorny Heads. During the IFQ program, the five species listed here have been more fully attained, uh, while attainment for most other species has been well under 50% of the available quota pounds. A species of predominant concern with respect to undertainment is Dover Sole. Relative to the 90s and 2000s, Dover sole attainment has declined from about 80% 80, 80 down to 20% in 
in large part due to ACL increases. But at the same time, harvest ha has declined, uh, but to a much lesser degree from around uh, 20 million pounds in those periods of the 90s and 2000s to down to about 15 million pounds during the IFQ program. In the previous, in, uh, in the analysis, we reviewed different potential causes of trawl under attainment. Um, and as reported to you in previous presentations, we found that even though there have been fewer participating vessels under the catch share program, this is probably isn't a likely cause of the under attainment issue, um, that it is possible that markets could be limiting attainment to some degree. Uh, we found that it's unlikely that infrastructure degradation has led to a, the trend in uh, reduced attainment. Um, and that with respect to the program design, the quota share program design, that um, quota share control limits could theoretically be playing a role in discouraging investments. And finally, uh, the use of sable fish quota pounds by gear switchers could be, could be a constraint to attainment, particularly if gear switching levels increased. And you see the uh, related section numbers there on that slide. With respect to gear switching activity, first we note that sablefish makes up virtually all of the harvest by gear switching vessels. As reflected in the graphic here, with years across the bottom and the percentage of the trawl allocation used up the side, uh, gear switching runs from has run from a bit under 20% to a bit over 35% of the trawl allocation. Note that from 2013 to 2019, there was somewhat of an upward trend, but that was disrupted over the last couple of years. For 2011 to 21, the total number of vessels and permits gear switching was the same at 42, and the average number participating each year was basically the same at, as well at 14. We looked at the amount of gear switching in the past, but levels of gear switching in the future could change for a variety of reasons. First, even if conditions are stable, gear switching may increase or decrease simply due to the normal variation uh, extending the range of what we've seen to date. Second, with biomass and management measure changes, sablefish quota pound availability and the need for quota pounds could change in the future. Future fluctuations in next vessel prices, quota pound prices, fishing costs may change gear switching levels. And included in these fluctuations may be the relative attractiveness of opportunities in other fisheries in which gear switchers participate. Then we want to note that as consolidation occurs in the trawl fishery, there are increasing numbers of unused trawl permits that could be available for gear switching. Something else we looked at as a possible trend indicator uh, for gear switching in the future was whether there was any uh, pattern of, of gear switchers acquiring quota share over time. And we looked at that, but we didn't see uh, any kind of a strong trend there that might indicate some kind of, as I said, ongoing investment that would uh, project into the future. So now I'll turn to an uh, overview of the alternatives. Um, so we have the no action alternatives and four action alternatives with the newest alternative uh, being alternative two, having been developed based on the general guidance you provided at your June, at your June meeting. Recall that for alternative one, there would be a one-time conversion process in which all of the existing Northern Sablefish quota share would be designated as either any gear or trawl only with any gear being like status quo. Then each year, the annually issued Northern Sablefish quota pounds would be issued as trawl only and any gear quota pounds and given to the corresponding quota share owners. Next, we have the new alternative two. Here, instead of two types of quota share, we just have all of the existing quota share. Then each year, all of the existing northern sablefish quota pounds that to be issued for that year would be designated as either any gear or trawl only. Then one of the major challenges for implementing was 
was given that there would not be gear specific quota share, how do we distribute that gear specific quota pounds among the quota share accounts in a manner that takes into account gear switching history? To do that, we specified that there would be gear ratios associated with the quota share accounts and that the ratios would differ for quota share accounts owned by qualified gear switching participants. So each year, the gear specific quota pounds would be distributed among those quota share accounts based on those account specific ratios. So now look, let's look at how those quota share accounts would be established at the time, excuse me, the quota share account ratios would be established at the time of implementation. First, the ratio for, ratio for accounts owned by gear switching participants would generally be 100% any gear quota pounds. Second, the ratio for accounts owned by non-gear switching participants would generally be, would generally be what we called, receive what we called a standard ratio. And for the purpose of this example, I'm using 17% uh, any gear to 83% trawl, only quota pounds as the standard ratio. Finally, there would be blended accounts. The ratios for these accounts would be somewhere between the ratios for the other two. So in this example, somewhere between just above 17% to just below 100% any gear with the remainder being trawl only. These blended accounts <clears throat> would include accounts owned by both gear switching participants and non-gear switching participants under using the individual approach and those owned by gear switching participants that have more quota share than they owned on the control date. The standard ratios would be set such that no more than 29% of the quota pound is issued as any gear with the actual percentage varying depending on the quota pound split chosen by the council. So quota share accounts are not transferable. So over time they would expire. And as the gear switching participant accounts and the blended accounts expire, or as quota share was moved out of those accounts, the standard ratio would need to be adjusted to meet the council policy for the, the amount of any gear quota pound that's to be issued. So the 29% that we're, we're showing here. Over time, the only accounts left would be those for which the standard ratio is issued. And that ratio would match the quota pound split allocation uh, option split it's quota pound split option selected by the council, again, that 29% or something less. As a side note, any new accounts that are opened would also receive that standard ratio. As we worked from alternative one to develop alternative two, we assumed that since there was no phase out or attrition of any gear quota share in, a, in alternative one, and because the specification of a phase out is really a major policy choice that hadn't been discussed, that at a minimum, the total gear switching opportunity provided an opportunity in, in alternative two should remain stable. And for that reason, as identified in the previous slide, we included that ongoing adjustment to the standard ratios to achieve the quota pound split identified by the council. So quota share, quarter share accounts expire when there is a change to the name of the owner listed on the account. However, this could create some unevenness in the treatment of different accounts. So we provided some options for the council to consider that might address those situations. I wanna to touch on those options. First, some quota share accounts owners might avoid expiration by passing ownership from one group to another while maintaining the, base, the business name so that the account never expired. To address this, we included an option that would cause the quota share account to expire with the addition of a new entity to the underlying ownership, even if the ownership uh, name didn't change on the quota share account. At the same time, there could be situations where quota share accounts expire because of a change in the name listed that does not involve a change in the underlying ownership. For example, if someone uh, had held the quota share account as an individual, but then incorporated and became an LLC and then wanted to change the name to reflect that. An option is provided that would allow accounts to be replaced as long as the new owners are not added. 
And here I do want to note uh, a few words need to be deleted to correct the language of that option that's noted here on the slide. So both alternatives and one and two include the same quota share split options. And those are one, one option provides 29% any gear quota pounds and 71% trawl only. And the other provides the option of the lesser of the, of the 2971 split or 1.8 million pounds. For simplicity, for the remainder of this presentation, we'll be using the 29% as the example. So finally, we have alternatives three and four. Um, under alternative three and four, some permits will be endorsed for gear switching. Those would generally have larger annual northern staple fish limits than vessels uh, fishing under permits that were not endorsed for gear switching. The limits for endorsed permits will be individualized to the gear switching history and possibly the quota share holdings uh, related to each recipient. Vessels fishing under permits not endorsed for gear switching will all receive the same gear switching limit, generally smaller than that received for the endorsed permits. And then the difference between alternatives three and four is just that alternative three, the permit has to have the qualifying history. And for alternative four, it's the vessel that is required to have the qualifying history. And then the vessel owner designates the permit to which the endorsement would be attached. We did make a minor addition to this alternative to state that under no circumstances would an endorsement limit be set above the annual vessel quota pound limit. And that's on page 25 of the uh, attachment one. At the June council meeting, we provided a number of examples of group ownership situations that created complexities in applying qualifying criteria. After reviewing these, the council decided to use what we call the individual approach for those situations, but asked for an analysis to confirm that it would perform as expected. As a reminder, in situations where you have ownership groups, each individual's qualification would be evaluated. Under the individual approach, the allocation rules would be applied for each qualifying individual share of the interest of the interest in each individual's share of interest in the group's quota. Under the collective approach, if one individual in the in ownership group qualifies, then the allocation rules would be applied as if the entire ownership group qualified. In terms of the degree of difference between the approaches, under alternatives one and two, choosing the collective approach would give between three and seven quota share accounts as much as 1.9% more any gear quota share or quota pounds. Uh, that would be under the collective approach as compared to the individual approach. Um, and that amount, that 1.9% is the amount that would be split among them. So it would be, um, the 1.9 is the upper end of the range would be split among the seven. Under alternatives three and four, it would give one permit a slightly uh, higher limit and otherwise it would uh, not affect the, the results. Next section of our presentation will go into uh, impacts, initial analysis of the impacts and Ms. Dorp <laughs> Dorpinghaus will be handling that. Uh, let me just see if there are any questions on this section before we move forward. Uh, and we'll have a, a, another chance at the end to ask questions over, uh, over what Ms. Dorpinghaus will be presenting as well as the entire uh, presentation. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. Seeger. On slide nine, um, you have a graph showing uh, gear switching through time. Can you provide any insight to how this year's looking? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Watson. Um, in terms of overall allocation, we're uh, pretty much on track with sort of the pre-COVID, uh, so the averages um, for 2011 to um, 2019 uh, in terms of the gear switching portion, we were on track with the pre-COVID levels up through about September. And looking at the October landings, they, ta they tailed off a bit. So I think, um, I'll get you the exact numbers, but I think they were uh, kind of in the 
we were expecting like seven, eight, nine, ten percent, and they were kind of more in the three to four percent range for for October. So a little bit of tailing off uh, for October, and we'll see what happens. The most, of, a lot of the gear switching does occur in this latter part of the year. Thank you. Further questions, Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Jim, just um, one of the most common questions ever asked is, is the, are these slides available online? I've, I'm not oh. seeing them in the briefing book. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, Ms. Krause asked me to let you all know that they will be post. Mundell, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, let, let you all know that they will be posted after, um, after the presentation. Any further questions to this point in the presentation? All right, thank you. So, Jesse, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties here. Um, so like Jim said, I am going to be going through our initial analysis of impacts. So for the impact analysis, we want to kind of think about this in two different ways. First, we have what we are terming the performance of the action alternatives. So this is related to regulatory changes, number of qualifiers, gear switching allowances, things like that, how the alternatives work. And so if we were talking about a car, hypothetical example, this would be things like, how fast does it go? What type of engine does it have? Kind of thinking about it that way. The second section is going to be our overall fisheries impacts. And this is what's covered in section four in attachment three. This is what the broader impacts of how the action alternatives compare to no action in terms of effects of the fishery. So in our car example, this would be like, what are the environmental impacts of a car? And today we're gonna to focus on two particular sections from section four, um, which are trial attainment under scenarios and then quota pound sellers and quota pound prices. So first up, we're gonna talk about the performance of the action alternatives. And I'm gonna to try to do my best as Butch likes to say to, to bust out the crayons and <laughs> um, explain kind of these very complicated alternatives and how they work. So as we walk through how the action alternatives would function, we're going to use table five and attachment three as our guide. And so I have kind of a snapshot of table five up here on your screen and the page references. And so each of the slide headings you're going to see are going to correspond to a row or group of rows noted by a bold heading. So for example, we're going to go through a slide that talks about the 29% maximum and then the rows that are within this kind of group. And while we aren't gonna hit every box on table five today, it will still provide you with a really good resource to follow along. Central to the design of the action alternatives is the 29% maximum gear switching level the council set. So at the highest level, we ask, is the maximum of 29% attainable under the various action alternatives? 
For alternatives one and two, the answer is yes, 29% is attainable. And there is the option for a smaller percentage under that quota pound split option two. For alternatives three and four, it's a maybe. This ultimately depends on the um, set of qualification and endorse endorsement options selected by the council if you so choose that alternative. So while 29% might be attainable, is it likely? For alternatives one and two, um, the main driver here is going to be how challenging it is to sweep up the any year quota pounds that are ultimately issued. Um, that's going to drive um, how likely it is to reach 29%. For alternatives three and four, again, the overall level is going to be dependent on the endorsement limit options, but it is reasonably likely that we could see attainment of the endorsement limits, whatever those may be. And then finally, is there a phase out of gear switching, which would result in zero sable fish gear switching over time? For alternatives one and two, no, there would not be, um, but alternatives three and four, there is an option for endorsements to expire. After our history-based opportunities are issued, each alternative differs in how those opportunities exist over time and therefore what the likely gear switching levels may be. So up here on the screen, I have um, our different alternatives and I'm gonna talk about alternatives three and four together um, a lot today because they have a lot of the same mechanics, they just have different types of qualifiers and therefore results. For alternative one, um, the history-based opportunities do not expire over time as the quota share designation would remain any gear or trawl only. For alternative two, our quota pound um, alternative, uh, the history-based opportunities would expire over time. As Jim mentioned um, in our overview of alternative two, as the quota share accounts expire, those ratios, that standard ratios would change. And then finally, for alternatives three and four, as I just mentioned, there is an option for a phase out in which the endorsement limit would expire upon transfer or the addition of a new owner. So how do our qualifiers receive gear switching opportunity? Again, I'm gonna talk through these in kind of alternatives one and two, and then alternatives three and four. So for alternatives one and two, we start with our current quota share owner. Then we evaluate whether or not they owned quota share on the control date, and if they owned a vessel that gear switched between 2011 and the control date during which the gear switching occurred. If you meet all of these criteria, we're left with this group in the middle um, that would be our gear switching participants as noted by the star. For alternatives three and four, there are two distinct periods for evaluation. Qualification option one um, would give the endorsement to the current at time of implementation, permit or vessel owner, depending on the alternative. However, under option two, the level of investment in the gear switching fishery is increased as the qualifier would have had to have owned the permit or vessel and quota share as of and since the control date, resulting in our qualifiers in this overlapping area shown by the star. And then with option three, it brings in the added need of needing to own a gear switching vessel or trawl limited entry permit as of and since the control date, resulting in our qualifiers being those that meet all three criteria. After determining our qualifiers, what are our kind of overall results? So I'm gonna start at kind of a higher level and then we're gonna work our way through the alternatives. So on the screen here, I have the number of gear switching qualifiers um, in the top row um, by alternative. And then the bottom row is the maximum amount of the allocation, so quota pounds, that would be allocated to gear switching qualifiers. Now this is a little different than what's in table five for alternative one. And so here we have what the quota pound equivalent of the any year quota share that would be allocated to gear switching participants. So just to boil that down, if we're looking at alternative one, there would be nine to 24 quota share accounts that would received at the history-based opportunity. So 100% or nearly 100% of their quota share would be any gear. 
and this would result in those participants receiving 8.7 to 17.4 percent of the allocation as any GEAR quota pounds. Now, all of these results you see on the screen are based on 2021 ownership information and quota share holdings, so all these are subject to change by implementation. In addition, I'll just note that we're still working with NIMPS um, staff to um, make sure all of our data is uh, correct. And so before we get to final action. Now we're gonna take a little slight detour from table five and go through each of these alternatives a little bit more in depth so you understand how these values were determined, which will then play later into how the fishery is impacted. In order to orient you to the main drivers of how the gear switching opportunity will, would be allocated, we're gonna use the tables in attachment two, which lists out the various options for each alternative. So starting with alternative one, our gear specific quota share alternative, the main determining factors we are gonna discuss are how the selection of the gear switching participation options and the non gear switching participation options affect the distribution of the any gear and trawl only quota share. So here we have a table that shows our participant category in the first column and then our two gear switching participation options across the top. Gear switching participants under option one, which is one landing between 2011 and the control date, would receive 15.7% of the quota share or 17.6% of the quota pounds as any gear. Under option two, which would require 30,000 pounds in at least three years prior to the control date, it will result in 7.8% quota share or 8.7% of the quota pounds. Now, regardless of the quota pound split option chosen, these values are going to remain the same. As a reminder, we're only going to use quota pound split option one as we work through our examples. So that's 29% any gear, 71% trial only. So 29% of the quota pounds represents 26.1% of the quota share as the quota pounds include the AMP pass through. So under both options that I have up here on the screen, the total quota share across the two participant categories would total to 26.1% and the total quota pound equivalent would be 29%. For our non gear switching participants, the amount of any gear quota share that would be distributed is dependent upon the gear switching participant amounts and the quota pound split options. For our, so for our table here, it's the difference between the total row and the gear switching participant row. As an example, under gear switching option one, this would leave 10.4% of the quota share or 11.6% of the quota pounds to be distributed across non gear switching participants. The same principle applies under gear switching participation option two, with more any gear quota share allocated to non gear switching participants. But then we need to consider who would qualify as a non gear switching participant and the number of entities that this would be distributed across. So this next table shows the non gear switching participation options and I'm just going to use gear switching participation option one as an example. So taking that 10.4% from our top table, moving it down to the bottom. Um, we're going to see that 10.4% of any gear quota share is going to be distributed across these participants. Under option one, which would be all current quota share owners that owned quota share on the control date but didn't qualify as a gear switching participant, we'd be looking at about 100 quota share accounts, which that quota share would be distributed across. So about 17% of everybody's quota share would be issued as any gear. However, when looking at option non gear switching participation option two, fewer individuals would qualify as this would require some bottom trawl activity in the two years prior to implementation. This would result and about 44 quota share accounts um, in which that 10.4 would be distributed across, which means that a higher percentage of their any gear quota of their quota share would be issued as any gear. So you can see a difference between 17% and then up to 35% under non gear switching participation option two. 
Now I know this is even a lot of numbers and there is a lot more in the appendix, specifically under section A 2.1.3, you can find a, um, a series of summary tables of the different combinations and how the quota share and quota pounds would be distributed. Moving on to alternative two, again, using our attachment two table here. And the main thing we're gonna focus on is our gear switching participation criteria. So our gear switching participation criteria is the same as we just discussed under alternative one. And I'm gonna use a pretty similar table as the previous slide, except um, because this alternative just affects the quota pounds, not the quota share. So the quota share would just remain a sable fish north, not being gear specific. Um, you can see that we have our participant categories and then the amount of any gear quota pounds under our two gear switching participation options. Under gear switching participation option one, gear switching participants would receive 17.3% of the any gear quota pounds and 10.9% under option two. As with our alternative one example, the total um, quota pounds issued as any gear would be 29%. So then our non-gear switching participants would receive the remainder of those any gear quota pounds. Now, one key difference between um, another key difference between alternative one and two is that there's only one type of non-gear switching participant. So after we identify our gear switching participants, um, everybody else is treated uh, the same. So how is this opportunity distributed across quota share accounts? As Jim mentioned, when we were um, in his diagram discussing alternative two, there are three types of quota share accounts. We have all any gear, all that would be that standard ratio, and then we have our kind of blended accounts. So as you can see in the lower table, um, under both gear switching participation options, most quota share accounts would receive that standard ratio when we first are implemented. For gear switching participation quota share accounts, nearly half would be all any gear and the other half would be blended. And those blended accounts again are due to post control date quota share purchases or having a mix of gear switching and non gear switching participant owners. Again, there's a series of summary tables in section A 3.1 um, on how these quota pounds would be distributed. Finally, we have our alternative three and four alternatives. Um, and while there are a lot of options, we're gonna focus on endorsement qualification options and endorsement limit options, because those really drive how the gear switching endorsements are distributed and then the total amount of gear switching that would be allowed by gear switching participants. So under alternative three, our permit-based qualifier, here we have a table that shows our endorsement limit options in the first column, the qualification options across the top, and then the number of permits that would qualify under each option listed in each of the columns. The numbers in the table represent the combination of those qualification options and endorsement limit options and would be the sum of the endorsement limits, so the, um, to the percentage of the total trawl allocation that could be gear switched. couple things I wanted to point out here is that you'll notice that we have the same results for qualification option one and then qualification option two. And this is because our qualifying permit owners have all owned quota share as of and since the control date. Jim discussed the individual versus collective approach. And um, while that would not have a large effect on um, the numbers you're seeing on the screen, one permit's individual limit would be impacted by that selection. Currently, there is a 10,000 pound or a to be determined percentage of um, that vessels could gear switch without a non endorsed permit. Um, based on historical effort and our analysis, it's likely that few vessels would actually utilize that limit. And then moving on to alternative four, our vessel based qualifier alternative. 
So here again, we have the exact same tables on the previous screen. We have our endorsement limit options in the first column, the qualification options along the top, and then the number of vessels that would qualify under each option. So overall, we see gen similar patterns to alternative three, but the main difference comes in when we start to bring in this idea of quota share ownership. And that's because while our, all of our qualifying permit owners all owned quota share as of and since the control date, only four of 11 vessel owners um, have owned quota share as of and since the control date. So you can see that large um, drop between options one and option two, um, but and then from option two to option three on the endorsement limits. Similar to alternative three, one permits limit would be affected by the individual versus the collective approach under this scenario. And again, the 10,000 pound um, allowance for non-endorsed permits, um, likely few vessels would utilize that limit. Okay, so we have issued these history-based opportunities at implementation, whether it's any year quota share, quota pounds, or endorsement limits. Then what happens over time? How can these opportunities be redistributed? So National Standard 4 and Section 303A of MSA require considerations of the accumulation of excessive shares. And currently, none of the alternatives propose new limits for quota share control limits at 3%, the annual vessel limit of 4.5%, or um, we have no limits on the number of trawl permits um, that anyone can own. So we can see here that there's substantial variation across the alternatives in terms of how much maximum achievable individual share of gear switching opportunity could someone accumulate over time. So I'll walk through this. So we have alternative one, again, our, our quota share specific alternative. So if someone were to accumulate the um, equivalent of 3% of the any year quota share, they could own between 11.5 to 12.8% of the gear switching opportunity. For alternative two, our, any, our gear specific quota pound alternative, um, it would be 0.8 to 0.9%. And this would be if someone, again, owned 3% of the quota share, and then you have 29% of the any year quota pounds going to that quota share account. For alternatives three and four, um, given that there are no proposed permit limits, someone could theoretically buy up all of the endorsed permits and then have 100% of the gear switching endorsed opportunity. Although they would be subject to any kind of annual vessel limit that was in place. There's been a lot of talk about um, around the council and various items about how changing climate conditions and the desire to have more flexibility. And so there might be times in the future where the council may find it advantageous to further restrict or allow more gear switching. Um, so there's two lenses I wanna kind of look at this idea of flexibility at. So fishing operations may be able to scale their flexibility by scaling their opportunity to an optimal level for their business. So for alternative one, this could be by purchasing any gear quota share or leasing quota pounds in season. For alternative two, um, it would be acquiring any gear quota pounds. And then for alternatives three and four, um, if someone wanted to lower, um, maybe fish a little bit less, they could use a partial endorsement limit, or you could use multiple permits through transfer. Um, you can't stack, but you could register one after another and fish multiple permit limits. On the management side, fishery managers could um, increase or decrease the maximum gear switching level. So some of thoughts here. So alternative one, you could provide more quota pounds for one quota share type and less for the other type. Or you could choose to give one quota share type owner quota pounds of an opposite type. So in that manner, so later you could say all Trawl, quota, trawl only quota share owners would receive some portion as any gear instead of all trawl only. For alternative two, you could change the standard ratio over time. And for alternatives three and four, you could look at changing the endorsement limits.
So finally, I just wanted to note that all of these alternatives would need some sort of data system modification. Um, and I'm just going to hold off because I know Ms. Summers is going to speak to notes reports one and two in great detail, and it discusses that initial assessment of modifications and cost. And I know that was a lot of information, so I want to pause here before going on to the next section um, and see if there are any questions. I'm sure there are. There's quite a lot of information. So, Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Jesse. I don't have the slide number, but um, a few slides back on the the, the redistribution, that one, yes, thank you. Um, obviously, I did not absorb this part of the analysis, but I'm not understanding alternative one, how an entity could achieve that share. So if there's a limit on quota share of 3%, can you go through the, how does that happen? Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Niles, uh, so this is the achievable share of the quarter, the gear switching opportunity. So 3% of the 29% or 3% quota share, three out of 29 or yeah. Okay. It's not quite 29 because it's AMP has to get thrown in there and some other adjustments, but that's basically why it's a bigger number than you anticipate. Thank you, Mr. It's still early. Okay, now I, I got it now. Thanks. Further questions? I thought there would be more. Let me just see if there are any online questions. Because Joe Oatman is participating remotely. Uh, so I don't see any hands, so please continue. Okay. So moving on to overall fishery impacts. Again, this is section four. So a considerable amount can be done in terms of our analysis of the action alternatives compared to no action, but some areas we are noting as challenging and there's a list of those in section 4.1.1 with some discussions. So we're gonna look at a few different things here. Um, we have some analytical scenarios, including gear switching being constraining or not constraining, um, trawl responses to gear switching limits. And um, these are more considered in the short term. We do have some discussion on long-term impacts. Those are mostly qualitative discussions. And you'll note as you're going through the document that some sections are to be completed after the November meeting. And just, kind of wanted to throw in here that there are a number of areas of the analysis we are continuing to develop um, and in particular analysis of impacts on quota pair buyers and sellers first receivers and communities and we've done considerable work on these topics but just ran into some challenges and so you know we had to put that kind of aside to ensure we were able to complete the remainder analysis that you have before you um, which we do think is sufficient to take a ppa at this meeting if you so choose so kind of focus on two sections, as I said, which is section 4.4. Um, this looks at overall trawl fishery harvest, X vessel revenue and attainment. So there are three scenarios we examined. Gear switching is constraining and trawlers do not change their species mix. Gear switching is not constraining and trawlers do change their species mix. And gear switching is not constraining and trawlers do not change their species mix. And I'll just note that when we say gear switching is constraining, it means that trawlers would land more of a complex if they had more sablefish quota pound available. So under our first scenario, we would expect to see a positive net change in ex vessel revenue and non whiting trawl attainment for the sector, with trawlers making more revenue, increasing overall attainment. So the table here on your screen is a summary of what's provided in section 4.4, uh, and it shows us the range of hypothetical X vessel revenue and non whiting trawl attainment changes under three ACLs, 2013, 2019, and 2021, and a range of gear switching limitations. So this would assume that in those years, gear switching, the actual gear switching levels were reduced down to um, between zero and 29%, and trawlers were taking up that sable fish um, at the designated ratio and were able to increase their overall revenue and attainment. 
Under our second scenario, um, we would expect that trawlers would increase the proportion of sable fish within their catch, increasing their overall revenue per metric ton. And finally, our third scenario, um, this would result in just a gear switching limitation and would be a net loss to the fishery. So next we're gonna look at uh, the final section is quota pound sellers, quota pound prices. This is section 4.6. Overall, it seems unlikely that any of the alternatives would cause there to be a substantial surplus of sable fish quota pounds left unused. So we'd still expect folks could still sell their sable fish quota pounds if they so desired. But the question is at what price? With respect to the any gear quota pound issued under alternatives one and two, we would expect prices to increase relative to status quo. This means that the impact to quota, pals, quota pound sellers would depend on the proportion of their quota pounds that they usually sell to gear switchers. If they get enough any gear quota pounds to cover their usual sales, they could be better off. If less than that, they may be better or worse off depending on how much of each quota pound type they get and what happens to the trawl only quota pound prices. So now let's through, let's walk through the impacts on trawl only um, quota pounds for alternatives one and two, or what would happen to status quo quota pounds, the so sable fish quota pounds under alternatives three and four. In general, for those quota pounds, we would expect price decreases and the degree of those decreases would depend mostly on trawl profits on their sable fish quota pounds when taking into account only their sable fish quota pound profits though profits for the complex as a whole will also have an influence. If trawlers are generating a profit on their sable fish alone without taking into account the other species, then we would not expect the sable fish quota pound prices to decline substantially because taking into account both the ex vessel price advantages that fixed gear has and the harvest cost advantages that trawl vessels have Profitability per pound between these different groups of vessels is roughly comparable, just varying by a specific vessel. However, if trawlers generate a loss from any sable fish they catch, probably due to high sable fish quota pound prices, then we would expect the trawl only or status quo quota, quota pound prices to drop to the point that the catching sable fish became profitable for trawlers and all of the sable fish quota pounds is purchased for use. This could result in a more substantial quota, sable fish quota pound price drop, and it could take a few years for the market to work this out so that there would be surplus sable fish quota pounds observed on the market during the adjustment period. So again, we have our council action here for today with the main goal of potentially adopting a PPA and providing other guidance as needed. And we'd be happy to take any questions on the PowerPoint um, or any of the attachments in your briefing book. All right. Questions on all that information? Corey Niles. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. Chair. Um, and yeah, Jesse, you have, I'm not going to remember any what, what slide this was, but the um, you had some arrow kind of arrowy things pointing at each other, um, talking about the uh, and I didn't see a lot of crayons in there for the record, but the uh, the um, the part about the likelihood of reaching the max of 29 percent in a year. Is this the one? Maybe? Yes. Um, so I was, I was thinking you were going to get there. The the is it likely part um, for for alternative one? Um, can you maybe summarize summarize what's in the analysis in terms of are you what is the likelihood that on a alternative one you would see the full twenty nine percent any uh, any gear used with fixed gear. If, you, if I'm not making sense, please let me know. I'll re rephrase. Mr. Chair, Mr. Isles, yes. Um, 
So yeah, for alternative one, our gear specific quota share um, alternative, with it being issued as any gear quota share, um, people could buy up to the 3%. So um, in comparison to, um, so people could accumulate and then use any gear quota share. So there could be that kind of um, purchasing up by gear switchers of the 29%. Um, counter that with alternative two in which uh, there would just be quote of pounds issued across accounts. It would take a lot more uh, potential transactions to accumulate up the same amount of quota pounds, uh, any year quota pounds potentially for the same amount of gear switching. Does that answer your question or Jim, do you have more? Yeah. yeah. Alternative one is more likely than alternative two. Does that answer your question, Cor? All right, Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, Chair Rolnick, and um, thank you, Jesse, um, for this presentation. Um, you try to replicate it as far as look at all the different scenarios that affect the fishery and how it was, you know, getting fish across the dock. You know, this last year, we've seen the whiting fishery enter into the equation as far as needing quota pounds to cover their overages. So now we have a new stressor on the availability of that fish. In your analysis, have you looked at that effects at all? You might not be there yet, but I thought I'd just ask now. Mr. Chair, Mr. Vice Chair, um, we actually in section, the one on quota pound, stable fish quota pound availability that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, there is a lot of discussion about um, not particularly this like last year in terms of numeric, but we do note the um, increased bycatch. And based on our analysis that, you know, strategies such as whiting or even midwater rockfish on a per pound basis of sable fish, they make a considerable more amount of ex vessel revenue and therefore would likely be more likely to pay for sable fish quota pounds um, compared to, you know, more competing strategies, which we've identified things as like DTS shelf slope strategies and gear switching and kind of this competitive strategy. So I'm not sure if that quite answers your question, but we haven't done anything specifically with the more recent trends, but we have discussed it more in a qualitative aspect on what could happen um, as bycatch needs change. Maggie Summer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and the analysis, Jesse and Jim. I have a, a really just a comment. You had a slide on flexibility to modify gear switching levels and uh, some information on that in Table 5 in Attachment 3. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. Just a comment on... Um, the scenarios presented there for alternative one in how fishery managers might scale flexibility by increasing or decreasing the maximum level. Just wanted to note that NIMS has not evaluated those uh, approaches such as providing more quota pounds for one quota share type. And I, I can't, I'm not prepared to comment at this time on whether they are feasible and if so, how those might be achieved. But I wanted to flag that uh, I think there's some big questions around whether those might be workable. Thanks. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to echo thanks for the presentations and the detailed reports. Um, my question is about some of the aspects of attachment three that are noted to be um, completed in the future, specifically around communities and potentially some economic analysis. Can you speak to your plans for that or? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Watson. Um, yes, for so for example, for communities, um, you know, we do have some constraints with respect to confidentiality because we have so few buyers in terms of kind of trying to get down to uh, displaying something specific for some of the some of the smaller communities. Um, and then um, we also there's also challenges in trying to predict uh, how things might uh, distribute and, and redistribute over time. So a lot of our 
uh, description with respect to communities will be more uh, sort of baseline to the degree that we can. Uh, it will include income impact type information uh, that you've seen before. We will uh, try to uh, separate things out by the gear switching segments of the fleet versus the non-gear switching segments. And we will be trying to look at uh, size of operations to the degree that we can as they're distributed among communities, um, including uh, say smaller trawlers versus uh, larger trawlers and so forth. Uh, we've also been looking at uh, working with Mr. Uh, Niles' help, uh, looking at uh, historic information on the quota pound transfers, uh, who who is selling to who, uh, as another way to kind of trace out uh, what might happen uh, with respect to those transactions if, if suddenly they were unable to uh, continue in that regard. Um, so that's that's just uh, a, you know a few things we're we're looking at moving ahead on. Further questions. Mercy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jesse. Um, you had a slide surrounding the content in section 4.4 on uh, X vessel revenue projections and attainment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I note in the report, uh, you indicate that the April 2021 analysis was updated uh, to look at the impact to competing strategies under the same set of ACLs and allocations. But I'm wondering if you might have also um, added an ACL alternative that um, more uh, properly reflects the increase to the ACL that we're expecting to see beginning in 23-24. Mr. Chair, Ms. Remco. Um, no, not at this time, and that was based on some direction um, and input at the last meeting. They kind of all blend together at this point a little bit, um, but the GMT and the SSC look, uh, recommended looking at kind of a three-year baseline, and so that's why we have it here in this idea of, you know, 23 be, 2013, excuse me, being a low ACL, um, 2019 being a high higher ACL with um, a high gear switching attainment and overall attainment, and then 2021 being, again, high ACL, low gear switching. Um, but uh, we did not specifically look at even a further increase um, as we are looking at in 23, 24. <laughs> further questions? Mercy. Thank you. So just on that last point, thank you, Jesse. I understand that. Can you remind me how much higher the 2023 ACL is compared to the 2019? Mr. Chair, Mr. Gamco, I can definitely find that out unless somebody wants to message it to me or GMT members in the audience and happens to know off the top of their head. I unfortunately do not know. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. No worries. I, I just, um, you know, acknowledging that um, the analysis we see in front of us really doesn't fully capture, I think, what we're expecting to see into the future. Thank you. And if that information comes, you'll let us know. Corey. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, yeah, well, Mar Marcy's thinking about the future. I was thinking of the past and um, Jim, this was in your part of the presentation. Um, and I think, you know, having been come into this process during the development of Amendment 20, I think the question I was having in mind is, it, what, what page was this on the analysis? Or is this in the analysis? <laughs> is it the question I have? But on your, on your um, pointing out that in terms of the Dover Soul attainment, we've gone, you know, the percentage is looks drastic because, um, and you said mainly because the ACL has gone up. Yeah, thank you. Wow, you guys are good at this. Um, the uh, we've, we were talking more about a, a drop from 1995. I think is there time frame you're talking about um, to 20 million pounds to 15 million pounds, and you had just responded to Jessica about you know now we have you know this 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 um, frustrating issue of, of uh, confidentiality and having few buyers, but. Do we have, is it, how many boats were there around when 20 million pounds were being harvested and how many buyers, is that, is that in the analysis back in the, in the late nineties? We could, um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Niles, we could look back and, and find that. We haven't looked at the vessel counts going, going back that far. Um, yeah. 
All right, further questions? Jesse, Jesse please. Mr. Chair, um, I got a helpful chat from now, well, all the people, um, that it, from 2022 to 2023, the increase is 37.5% increase in the ACL. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was curious about the comparison with 2019, since you referenced that being at the highest end of the range that you examined. Jesse. Mr. Chair, Mr. Grimko, so 2021 but would have been the highest we examined, so that was in excess. But um, in terms of the difference between 2019 and 2023, the difference was 2,880 metric tons. Thank you. All right. Further questions? Mr. Pettinger, Vice Chair. Yeah, I probably should give some clarity to that issue. Um, the increase we're seeing is from the spawning biomass and the fish that are marketable. The fish we're catching and bringing in are not including that biomass estimate because they're not in the spawning biomass yet. In Canada, that, that's not counted against the vessel's catch because they're not in the spawning biomass. So the fish we're catching is is that is, it's not the catch is not re representative of, of the of the ACL, I guess. The, the biomass, the, the biomass in the ocean is not with the representative of the ACL. ACL is based on the spawning biomass, not the overall total biomass. So while it's going up, it's not going up fast enough. So it's a little clarity to that issue. They did. Uh, Jesse. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I also had one more thought that I was, as I was thinking through why we did what we did. Um, so while the ACLs are also going up in the upcoming biennium, the idea is obviously that this is a long-term change. And so that's why we also looked at kind of this variety in ACLs. Um, going back historically because while the ACLs could go up in the next coming years, they could also go back down to levels we've seen in the past. So we kind of discussed that more on a qualitative fashion, but that's also just wanted to point that out there to kind of complete what we, why we did what we did. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually have a question for Mr. Pettinger because his comment, um, just triggered some thinking in my mind. I'm curious, um, and I, I don't think we're discussing um, stock assessments or uh, specifications here today, but what I'm curious about in response to your comment is um, if we're interacting with fish of other size classes, um, wouldn't that be catch, I, I believe you're speaking of, of trawl fishery activity so how, how does that comment relate to um, the item that we're considering here today pertaining to gear switching? Um, we are, I think you're talking about the, we're having more stable fish available to us according to the stock assessment, but the stock assessment does not acknowledge the small fish that are in the water yet that we're catching. So there's actually way more fish in the water as far as the overall biomass. We're not talking about spawning biomass with ACL. We're talking about we're, we're interacting with all those fish. And so it, that's why it's the constraining is because those fish we're catching aren't acknowledged in the number rather than deal with as an ACL. I'm going to suggest that we continue this during council discussion rather than reports, if that's okay. Let me see if there are any other questions on the presentations or as Jesse invited, any questions on any of the attachments in the briefing book? And since I see no other hands, I'll ask my question, which doesn't, which relates to the attachments and not to the presentation. Um, table 10 in attachment three, I just want to make sure I understand this correctly because I'm a salmon guy, so this ground fish stuff can, can, tends to befuddle me. So, so table 10 purports to report revenue per thousand pounds of sable fish. And if I look at the 2020 portion of the table, 
I just want to make sure I'm interpreting this correctly, that the DTS trawl fishery uh, expects $5,000 in revenue per thousand pounds of sable fish and the gear switchers 1,162 um, dollars per thousand pounds of sable fish. It, I'll give you a second to find that. <laughs> it's a big document. Do, do, I mean, that's frankly what it says. And, and then I have a follow-up question if you just confirm that. Mr. Chair, you're correct. Okay. Uh, and so uh, the difference in value in 2020 versus the earlier years, that just reflect a drop in value of sable fish? And, and referring here to the gear switching? Yeah. If you uh, know. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I believe, yeah, so the price would have dropped in 2020. So, you know, per thousand pounds, they're likely making less money. And in terms of the overall change, you know, we also probably saw some different, um, and while we looked at 2020, just speaking more to the trial strategies was, we actually had the RCA open up in 2020. So we, that's why we're kind of seeing that shift. And there's a whole discussion on some of those other strategies. And uh, obviously with the COVID pandemic, things changed as well. So, um, but yes. All right. And so it looks like the value of the sable fish is much, much higher in the DTS trawl fishery than it is in the gear switching. Is that a fair... <laughs> Sorry, confirm. If you don't have to answer that, I'm just yeah, yeah, it, it no. just on on paper. That's the way it looks, and I'm just again as a salmon guy, I want to make sure I'm not drawing a, a ridiculous conclusion. But no, Mr. Chair, no, you're you're correct. So, um, looking at and this is all species revenue per thousand pounds of sable fish. So, it, the DTS strategy would be those vessels and how identified those trips would be, you know, Dover, thorny head sable and anything else they caught per thousand pounds of sable fish on average. Um, yeah, that's their revenue per thousand pounds. So yes, they make more per thousand pounds of sable fish than gear switchers on average gross revenue, gross revenue excuse me. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. Last call for questions. Uh, I know you'll be available. Maggie summer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just to follow up on that, but I think the last words I heard to my left were, I, I just wanted to ask whether that's net revenue. Does that factor in cost or is that? Mr. Chair, Ms. Harris, revenue. this is ex-vessel revenue. Okay. Thanks. All right, last call, although we're not going to let Jim and Jesse leave until we're done with this agenda item. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, we're obviously not going to get through uh, all the reports on this agenda item um, without taking a break. So I just, we've been at this a little over an hour and a half. I just want to check with folks if you want to dive into a couple of reports where we take a break or you'd want to take one now. All right, so I'm getting some nods and other expressions that we want in a break now. So it's a 937. Let's be back at 950, 13 minutes.
this big. Three or four guys help me get out. All right. With that introduction, the song Ballroom Blitz. We're in a ballroom. We're going to blitz through this agenda item. Do, do consideration, of course. So if everyone could please take their seats. If you need to bring coffee back with you or a donut, that's fine. And we'll start going through um, our reports just as a reminder. Uh, after the reports, we'll ask uh, council members uh, to offer any comments they want the public to consider uh, in advance of their public comment. So I think where we are right now, we've heard from staff um, and we'll go through the reports and I'll first turn to Maggie Summer to give the NIMS report. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, I will speak to H3A NIMS report one and then NIMS report, supplemental revised NIMS report two. Uh, I will preface that by saying we don't often bring into the council discussion a lot of detail on what uh, we think it would take to implement management changes. But in this case, we thought it might be helpful to illustrate some of these details to help understand how they would work. So NIMS staff from the Groundfish Branch, Permits and Monitoring Branch, and the Northwest Science Northwest Fishery Science Center's Scientific Data Management Program, which is responsible for the IFQ database, reviewed the current alternatives, identified key tasks that will be necessary to implement the action alternatives, and developed the input contained in H3A NIMS Report 1. This report has been in the briefing book since the advanced briefing book was out, uh, and I won't read through it verbatim, but I will hit some highlights. It does provide uh, information and a bit of advice on considerations related to the timing, administrative complexity, and cost of implementing the Council's uh, alternatives. It builds on and updates <clears throat> information provided to the Sablefish Area Management and Trawl Allocation Attainment Committee in 2019 and 2020. We provide general comments and then a description of tasks that we anticipate at this time would be necessary and discuss some challenges related to each. <clears throat> Timing. Once the council takes final action, we are projecting approximately 18 months necessary to complete the tasks for initial implementation of any action alternative. <laughs> we think a January 1st implementation date will likely be necessary uh, due to the timing of issuing quota pounds and the annual nature of some of the uh, uh, proposed gear switching endorsement limits. So if the council selects a preliminary preferred alternative in November 2022, this meeting, and a final preferred alternative in April 2023, then the earliest the action could be effective would be January 2025. I'll add at this time that we think if final action occurred in June 2023, uh, we probably could still meet a January 2025 implementation date. However, with all that said, I'd like to emphasize the uncertainty in the projection. Uh, there could be unforeseen needs or complications in any of the steps required, which could extend the timeline. We will keep the council updated as we go through. We address the issue of complexity, recognizing that the complexity of the alternatives stems from a desire to achieve diverse and sometimes competing objectives. Uh, but we also note that complexity is difficult for, uh, makes the alternatives difficult for the public and decision makers to understand and evaluate, and it impacts workload and cost. In general, alternatives which are more complex, in particular those which would require ongoing annual or continuous active tasks by NIMPS would have a higher workload and cost burden. And we note that more complex alternatives might bring an increased risk of future new council and NIMPS action necessary to make adjustments to them if, it, uh, if the effect is not as intended. In section three, we addressed cost. 
again, we we um, remind everyone that NIMPS tasks necessary to evaluate, implement, and administer the alternatives are subject to cost recovery. Gear switching action will increase the total incremental costs in the IFQ sector, which would result in direct cost to industry when the annual cost recovery fee percentage is less than the cap of 3% of the ex vessel value. Because the annual IFQ cost recovery fee percentage has frequently been at or near 3%, gear switching could increase total incremental costs above that limit with NIMS needing to cover any excess which could potentially lead to delays in implementation if sufficient funds aren't necessary. We, uh, I already addressed complexity and recurrence, um, noting in particular, uh, again, that recurrence affects um, more than just initial implementation cost. It would add ongoing cost to the program if alternatives which require uh, recurring activities by NIMS um, is selected. We note that at this time, alternative one, the gear specific quota shares appears to be primarily one time workload. Alternatives two, three, and four would likely have varying degrees of ongoing workload. In section four, we address implementation tasks and considerations. The tables, uh, outline the general tasks that we anticipate will be necessary to implement each of the current action alternatives and below the tables we describe significant issues that we're aware of at this time. Uh, again, this represents our, our best current assessment, but in working through actual implementation, we fully expect that we would discover new steps, new challenges or other differences from the description below. So please don't um, take this as a, a final description of what steps would be necessary. I won't read through the tables, uh, but I'll note that table one presents the administrative steps common to all of the alternatives to take them through the rulemaking process. Moving down to alternative one, table two presents the steps we believe necessary to implement alternative one, the gear specific quota share alternative. And below that table, we note that modifying the current IFQ database would require redesignating and redistributing the Northern Sable Fish quota share. <clears throat> On this one, the Northwest Fishery Science Center's scientific data management team estimated that alternative one would have a high total startup workload and cost, including uh, time to do the coding necessary, to the IFQ database, the web user interface, et cetera, along with validation and testing to ensure that it's working as intended. One benefit of alternative one, again, is that we believe it has few ongoing costs after initial development and implementation. In the report, we noted a potential risk of delay with this alternative because all, quota share, all new quota share allocations would have to be settled before quota pounds are issued at the start of the year if there was a holdup on any, uh, any related to any one account. If it, there was an appeal that was still in process, uh, we, we thought that this could potentially delay implementation of all of it. I will just note at this time that I think this needs further exploration and, and we can come back and provide more information to the council on uh, this risk and potential pathways to address it uh, at final action. Alternative two, the gear specific quota pound alternative. Uh, when this report was produced, we noted that we were less certain of the tasks and issues described uh, for here uh, related to alternative two than for the other alternatives. Uh, table Three presents the tasks we think would be necessary to implement alternative two. And below table three, we note that it would require a new method for calculating and issuing two different quota pound types based on one quota share allocation for each quota share permit. It would have a high st total startup cost and workload similar to alternative one. And we believe it, it would be the most complex and annually recurring, uh, 
annually recurring tasks beyond an initial implementation compared to the others. Annual calculation and issuance of two quota pound types would compound with other annual quota share maintenance uh, and issuance tasks, <coughs> quota, pardon me, tasks carried out by NIMS West Coast Region Permits and Monitoring Branch and the Scientific <coughs> Data Management Program. In addition, if the sector-wide proportion of trawl only in any gear quota pounds is fixed at a constant ratio, then at this time, we believe, and as described in the staff presentation earlier, there would uh, potentially need to be an annual uh, uh, review and possibly recalculation of the standard ratio and the individual ratios of some, quota, some of the quota share accounts. This could present a significant challenge due to the time needed for the ratio reviews and recalculation, et cetera. So uh, we conclude with noting that alternative two would have the highest burden to routinely administer along with initially implement. We address alternatives three and four together because we think that implementation would be identical for those. It's only the qualification criteria that differ. Table four presents the steps we think would be necessary to implement the endorsement alternatives. Below that table, we note that uh, these alternatives would require database changes, additions to endorsements, uh, to, to the trawl limited entry permits, database modifications, fish ticket system changes, et cetera. We note that monitoring and enforcement of individual gear switching limits for each endorsed permit would be necessary, and that's something we don't currently do, including when permits are transferred between vessels within a year. This would require programming and process changes to enable that tracking. This, uh, at this time, we haven't determined yet how much work would be needed on a continual basis after implementation to accomplish that. In addition to tracking gear switched catch by trawl limited entry permit, tracking gear switched catch against a standard annual gear switching limit for vessels when they're not registered to an endorsed trawl permit would be required. This annual allowance of, for example, 10,000 pounds or a percentage to be determined for vessels to gear switch when not fishing with an endorsed permit introduces a complex programming and process task when combined with the permit tracking need, especially since a vessel could fish with both an endorsed sequentially and a non-endorsed permit in a year. This allowance was, in our understanding, intended to avoid creating regulatory discards for vessels incidentally encountering sable fish when targeting species, targeting other species with non-trawl gear, which we believe it would be an infrequent occurrence based on the historical analysis, and to maintain a low level of gear switching opportunity for any participant. In light of the additional administrative complexity of this feature, we encourage further exploration of its need, benefits, and potential alternatives. I'd also like to note uh, that we would need to um, tracking trawl permit ownership if the council selects the option in which gear switching endorsements expire uh, upon an ownership based trigger. We do note that the most logical approach and timing for that would be to uh, expire those endorsements that meet the trigger on annual renewal of the permit. We address the issue of overages uh, and I, I'll save that. There is uh, additional information, I believe, coming from the enforcement consultants as well as a bit in NIMP Supplemental Report 2. Section 5 addresses several other considerations. Uh, as staff noted, um, we, we hope that the Council can uh, come to a single specification of a PPA, uh, in, in other words, make selections between all the options so that we are all able to uh, focus in on the preferred action moving forward. 
The report uh, provides a brief discussion of flexibility and stability for, uh, from the participant, individual participant perspective, uh, noting that alternatives one and two may provide for more flexibility for individual participants uh, compared to alternatives three and four. But I'll acknowledge that flexibility and stability are terms uh, certainly open to interpretation uh, and, and circumstance. And while this paragraph discusses them relative to individual participants, there may be other views on what flexibility and stability mean to different types of participants and to fishing communities. We note uh, the requirement for fair and equitable allocations and encourage the council to discuss and articulate how the alternative it selects meets that standard. We also uh, uh, point out variations and contingencies and make the connection to uh, potential, potentially changing ocean conditions, stock abundance and distribution, uh, and certainly market and other factors and uh, encourage consideration of a wide range of possible variations that could affect the fishery and what the nexus is with gear switching. Finally, we conclude that while there's a high degree of uncertainty in our estimates of the time and actual cost to implement any one of the action alternatives, uh, we, we can, looking at them as a whole, conclude that in relative terms, alternative one is likely to be a low, uh, to incur a total lower cost because it doesn't require substantial work beyond initial implementation. Alternative two appears to have the highest overall cost with complex ongoing tasks and alternatives three and four are likely to be in the middle. We understand that cost and workload are, are certainly only one of the factors the council may be considering as it selects, uh, it makes its decisions moving forward on gear switching, but we wanted to add this to the conversation at this time for the council's consideration. Thanks. All right, thank you. Let's see if there are any questions of NIMPS on this report. Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Ms. Summer, for the NIMPS report. Uh, my question kind of gets at your last point about cost and thinking about this in terms of the IFQ cost recovery fee percentage, which has been near the 3%. Um, can you elaborate a bit on the possibility of not being implement, not being able to implement this due to costs? Great. Thanks, Ms. Watson. Um, this implementing the action alternatives would require uh, additional work of the teams responsible for managing the IFQ database uh, and other data systems within NIMPS. Uh, Funding to support that is not currently built into our base budget. Certainly, we would be um, seeking fund additional NIMS funding as needed to implement this council action as with any. Um, I hope to be able to provide more information on, uh, you know, I, on relative to your question as we get to a final preferred action stage and hopefully have a, a, a more clear idea of a single alternative to focus on. Any further questions? Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, not, not a question for this time. Um, just um, Maggie mentioned, I believe you're, you let off with, um, this is not something you do all the time, but I just wanted to, th to thank you all for, uh, um, for doing this. I know costs were part of the discussion before, and it's been really helpful to not have to speculate um, as much as we were in the past. So I just, I, I hope you all will do this more in the future and, and, and thank you. And um, I really appreciate the also the, and, and to the council staff for the attention to the national standards. I think, I think you got six in there and, um, and four for sure. And whoever came up with those national standard guidelines, I think um, really grounded them in, in, in good policy thinking and good fishery science. And I, I hope we, we continue to use those more and more. And yeah, just really appreciative of, of the effort and, and bringing that information, realizing it's the best you can do at this time and, and, and might change, but yes, thank you. Bob Dooley. Thank you, 
Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Maggie, I, in the your presentation to the GAP and the webinar that you did prior to the GAP meeting, um, prior to the meeting, to the council meeting, I, I attended that online and I heard your comment regarding cost that n alternative number one was the most cost efficient. I think if that's, you know, uh, and that number two was the most cost um, total. And then three and four were somewhere in the middle. But then you also made a comment later at the end that potentially three and four, depending on alternatives that were chosen, could be the most cost effective. And I, I'm curious, do you have any more to say about that or have you thought about that some more? Because I was, it left me a little bit confused about what knobs to turn when looking at them to get to get get to this cost. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. Uh, because alternatives three and four using the endorsement approach would require some level of ongoing work, ongoing tracking of gear switched landings, uh, and associating those, pardon me, gear switched catch, including discard mortality, and associating that with permits. Uh, we, at, at this point, we are estimating that those would still be a higher cost overall than alternative one, regardless of selection of the options within, within those alternatives. And I'll address that a bit in supplemental notes report too. Thank you. Any further questions on the first NIMS report? All right, Maggie, would you please uh, continue with your second report? Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Um, supplemental NIMS report two was uh, put into the briefing book on Wednesday. The uh, Here we recognize that one of the council's tasks for this meeting will be to choose between the multiple options within the current action alternatives. And so the purpose of this report is to provide our estimates of the one time and recurring workload for each option. Uh, this report doesn't present comprehensive information on workload related to the fundamental mechanisms of each alternatives approach to limiting gear switching or to the administrative rulemaking requirements. Those were discussed in NIMS report one and are both under further evaluation at this time. We used the format of the tables in H3 attachment two that Jim and Jesse mentioned uh, a bit ago in order to um, help everyone follow along. And we note that uh, this is probably obvious, but be while the rows, uh, uh, um, because the rows in the tables below reflect sets of options from which only one will be selected there and there are different numbers of options for different cases. Please don't just count up the numbers of highs, mediums and lows and sum them and take that as a representation of the total workload of each. Uh, before I get into the rest of it, I will um, give you the punchline that it's not the choice between options within an alternative that drives workload and cost in our estimation. It's the, it's the choice between different alternatives themselves. It is the difference between the underlying mechanisms, whether it's a quota share designation or a quota annual quota pound distribution in gear specific quota pound types or an endorsement that uh, we believe really drives the differences in workload and cost. So uh, table one presents the estimated workload of alternative one options. We have split that out into estimated one time and recurring workload. Underneath the table, uh, we note that at this time, uh, as I just said, we don't see the council's choice of options within the alternative as having a significant impact on overall workload estimates. We do, again, think it would have a high initial one-time workload for applying the qualification criteria, programming and testing changes to the IFQ database and web application, e-ticket system, and reporting systems and processes such as the ground, West Coast Groundfish Observer Program, PACFIN, et cetera. 
That's indicated by the high estimate for the quota pound allocation split at the top of table one, although the actual values of the split would make little difference to the workload and cost. And again, we anticipate little to no recurring workload with alternative one. Alternative two is addressed in table two. At this time, we don't see the council's choice of options within alternative two likely to have significant impact on overall workload estimates. And we note a similar high initial one-time workload. We address uh, the uh, determining the stand adjustments to the standard ratio over time. And again, based on our understanding at this time, alternative two would present a high recurring workload a substantial amount of the recurring workload would stem from the need to review and adjust the standard ratio and at least some individualized quota share account ratios over time and to the potential for appeals of expiration of a quota share account or its gear switching connection. This recurring workload would involve the Science Center's Scientific Data Management Program, the West Coast Region's Sustainable Fisheries Division Permits and Monitoring Branch, the Groundfish Branch, and potentially NOAA's Office of General Counsel. The anticipated need for adjustment of the ratios over time is based on an assumption that staff highlighted earlier that the council intent is for the specified sector-wide allocation split, such as 71-29, to be held constant over time. In other words, fix the allocation split at implementation and allow the standard ratio to fluctuate in order to maintain the same split as gear switching quota share accounts expire or quota is sold and transferred to an account with a lower ratio. If instead the council chose to fix the standard ratio at implementation, and allow the sector-wide split to trend toward less any gear quota pounds as gear switching quota share accounts expire. In other words, allow attrition of any gear quota pounds as the gear switching status associated with those accounts expire, then there would be no need for annual review and recalculation of the standard, standard ratio and the associated recurring high workload. NIMS is not recommending one approach over the other simply suggesting consideration of the idea. Alternatives three and four are addressed together in table three. There are some, rel again, relatively minor differences we, we estimate in workload between the various qualification and endorsement limit options. Obviously, the more components to an option there are, uh, the greater the workload will be. Uh, we see very little, uh, pardon me, no significant difference between alternatives three and four in terms of the workload related to the options uh, or to the qualification criteria. Associating gear switching history with a vessel is, e that's alternative four, is easier than with a trawl limited entry permit. Uh, but we note that the necessary permit history approach has already been developed by council staff, although it would require uh, NIMS working with council staff again to uh, go through that and verify it if this alternative was, or alternatives requiring uh, history association with a permit is selected. We address non-endorsed gear switching. Again, the provision for an annual gear switching limit of 10,000 pounds or a to be determined percent of the trawl allocation of Northern Sable fish by vessels when registered to a non-endorsed permit adds ongoing high workload due to the need to track catch by permit and by vessel when registered to a non-endorsed permit, including over permit transfers during a year. The council should consider the potential need for and benefit of this provision. We address overages and we first point out that all catch, regardless of how gear switching overages are treated under alternatives three and four, all catch must be covered with Northern Sablefish quota pounds as with every other IFQ species. None of the options, none of the alternatives would change that requirement. That individual accountability and the harvest specifications are the mechanism for ensuring conservation objectives are met within the program. NIMS recommends that the council establish a gear switching overage provision that presents sufficient deterrence without excess burden and cost. 
if the intent is for some amount of exceedance of an endorsement's gear switching limit not to be considered a violation, then the council should clearly specify that. In addition to the existing options, the council could consider a variation such as if an overage is not more than a certain amount, such as 10% of the endorsement's annual limit, a flat poundage, or a combination such as 10% of the endorsement limit, but not more than 1,000 pounds, then it's not a violation. If the overage is larger than that, then it's referred to law enforcement as a potential violation, and if confirmed, could result in a fine. Allowing for a relatively small amount of catch over the endorsement's limit without a violation accommodates the difficulty in precisely estimating catch while at sea, but includes an enforceable threshold that is a meaningful deterrent against gear switching far more than the limit. NIMS considers the potential impacts of this overage approach to be similar enough to the existing provision and option that it could be included without formally revising the range of alternatives. That concludes Supplemental Revised Report 2. All right, thank you, Maggie. We'll see if there are questions on your report. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Maggie, for this report. I, I do want to echo Corey's appreciation for these detailed reports. It's really helpful when thinking about all of the different components under these alternatives. Um, my question is if you could maybe clarify under Alt 3 and 4, the non-endorsed gear switching component. Uh, you mentioned council could consider removing this 10,000 pounds. And I just wonder if you could provide additional insight on if that was removed from these alternatives. Is that a large cost admin or is that a minimal cost savings. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Uh, I am unable to quantify that at this time. It would certainly be some savings in terms of workload and cost, but I, I don't have a, a quantified estimate of that for you. Thanks. Further questions on the NIMS report? Not seeing any hands. So thank you very much, Maggie. We'll next go to the team report. Whitney Roberts. Welcome, Whitney. Good morning, council members. For the record, my name is Whitney Roberts. I will re be reading Supplemental GMT Report 1 under Agenda Item H3A, Groundfish Management Team Report on Sable Fish Gear Switching. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the briefing book materials and public comments and held a discussion with Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jesse Dorpinghouse of Pacific Fishery Management Council staff. As noted in the past, the team largely views the gear switching action item as a council policy call, but the team offers the following comments with a focus on management implications of the action alternatives presented in the briefing book, recommendations for revisions to the range of alternatives, and general suggestions for selecting a preliminary preferred alternative if the council does so at this time. Regarding management implications, under all alternatives presented in the briefing book, the GMT does not anticipate any impacts to the catch accounting of sablefish north of 36 degrees north latitude, in other words, northern sablefish, other than necessary changes to the individual fishing quota database outlined in the NIMS Report 1. Northern stable fish catch by vessels permitted in the IFQ fishery will still be debited from the IFQ allocation for northern stable fish, regardless of gear type. However, utilization of northern stable fish quota pounds by each gear type will need to be tracked and monitored at the gear-specific fleet level if alternatives 1 or 2 are chosen. Additionally, adjustments to the IFQ impact projection model used during the biennial harvest specifications and management measures process may be necessary if changes are made to quota pounds in the IFQ database. If gear switching is limiting trawl attainment, mortality of non-sable fish trawl caught species may increase under reduced gear switching levels. If trawl vessels are able to increase their dover sole attainment, catches of short spine thorny head will likely also increase given that they are caught in the same target strategy along with sable fish. In other words, the dover sole thorny head sable fish target strategy. Short spine thorny head north of 34 degrees 27 north latitude annual catch limits have been declining since 2015. And although attainments have been below 60% since at least 2016, Short spine thorny head could potentially become a constraint to IFQ vessels in the future if a reduction in gear switching leads to higher DTS attainment by the trawl fleet. 
Other species caught as trawl bycatch do not have formal allocations, such as Pacific spiny dogfish, and may require in-season management to minimize incidental catches if trawl attainment increases from a reduction in gear switching and the species ACL is exceeded or at risk of being exceeded. Some non-IFQ stocks have trip limits that can be adjusted in season, or the council may choose to implement a bycatch reduction area or block area closures in season, potentially for a specific gear type. Given the likelihood for variations in sablefish harvest, harvest limits, market dynamics, IFQ participation, and other external drivers of IFQ attainment, management actions may be necessary in the future to respond to any unintended consequences resulting from more restricted opportunity in the fishery. Under range of alternatives, as alternative two is currently written and interpreted, the National Marine Fisheries Service has stated that it is the most complex and burdensome in terms of regulations, cost, and analysis, so the council could consider removing this alternative from further consideration, which would allow the analysts and council to better focus on any remaining alternatives. Additionally, the GMT notes that alternative four, qualification options two and three, tie an endorsement to ownership of a qualifying vessel as of the control date. This means that if an otherwise qualifying entity purchased a new vessel, either for operational capacity safety reasons or some other reason, after the control date, they would not qual qualify for a gear switching endorsement. The GMT encourages the council to prioritize alternatives that account for current business practices, such as owning quota shares while leasing a vessel or upgrading vessels. While alternative three includes a vessel replacement exception that would account for such business choices and investments, including a similar provision under alternative four would be overly complex due to its tie to a vessel rather than a permit. Therefore, the GMT recommends not including alternative four for further consideration because we believe that alternative four would not sufficiently meet the purpose and need. The GMT notes that under alternatives three and four, there is a possibility of one entity owning all gear switching endorsed permits, and therefore the council may want to consider a permit limit or a limit on the total gear switching opportunity that could be held by one entity to avoid excessive shares. Alternatives three and four also currently include a gear switching limit overage option that would deduct any overage of the gear switching endorsement limit from the following year's endorsement limit by the overage amount. The GMT agrees with NIMS Report 1 that adding this overage provision to alternatives 3 and 4 would not prevent future overages from occurring and would be more complicated to track with the transfer of permits. The GMT notes that this overage provision is overly complex and burdensome and recommends not including for further consideration an option or provision that would reduce the following year's gear switching limit by the amount of any prior year's overage. A permit or vessel that exceeds its gear switching limit would still be required to cease gear switching activity for the remainder of the year and the council could consider a threshold violation as outlined in supplemental NIMS report 2 without needing to reduce the following year's opportunity to gear switch. All northern sablefish quota pound overages would still need to be covered with quota pounds as currently required and therefore an endorsement limit overage reduction would not provide any additional conservation benefits. And lastly for P PPA selection. The GMT is generally supportive of alternatives and options that promote management flexibility and are the least restrictive while still meeting the purpose and need. Given that there is still a large amount of uncertainty as to how the changes implemented under this action could impact the future of the IFQ fishery, the GMT encourages the council to minimize the extent to which managers will need to respond to any unintended consequences of any added restrictions. The GMT also encourages the council to consider under during final action, identifying the mechanism by which adjustments would be made if unexpected outcomes lead the council to want to further decrease or increase the amount of gear switching allowed. For this, see table 25 on page 73 of attachment three. Additionally, participants in all ground fish fisheries have expressed the need for management flexibility as climate change impacts fish stocks and marine resources in the future. The GMT recognizes that operational flexibility is tied to business decisions and therefore is defined differently for each individual operation and cannot be grouped simply as trawler flexibility and gear switcher flexibility. Nonetheless, as part of this action, providing additional sable fish opportunity for one group of participants would generally be expected to reduce opportunity for another group of participants. National Standard 4 guidelines point out that an allocation of fishing privileges may impose a hardship on one group if it is outweighed by the total benefits received by another group or groups. An allocation need not preserve the status quo in the fishery to qualify as fair and equitable if a restructuring of fishing privileges would maximize overall benefits. 
For any count action the council takes, there should be strong rationale indicating why potential costs to some user groups would be outweighed by uncertain benefits. Lastly, when selecting a PPA, the council should consider the trade-offs between providing gear switching opportunity and flexibility to a broader fleet of vessels versus providing a larger proportion of gear switching opportunity to a smaller suite of vessels. The council should weigh this trade-off through the lens of the overall objectives of this action. And that concludes the GMT report. Thank you very much, Whitney. Are there questions on the GMT report? Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Ms. Roberts, and thank you to the GMT for this report. I noticed that you mentioned that short spine thorny head have been declining since 2015, although attainments have been below 60%. Uh, can you please elaborate on the cause of those ACLs declining? Is it due to abundance? Is it due to assessment cycles? Thank you, um, Jessica, and through the chair for the question. Um, I. I I cannot speak to the abundance, but I will say that the short, short spine thorny head um, have not been assessed uh, since 2015, I believe, or it's been at least 10 years, um, which is why they're on the schedule to be assessed in the next cycle. So um, it is, it, it has been a while since they've been assessed. Um, the From that past, that last assessment, the ACLs, um, were projected to steadily decline um, under the the catch projections that the D GMT provided that were average at the time. Um, and so it, there may be new results from this short spine thorny head assessment coming up, but um, in the GMT conversation, it was clarified that regardless of the outcome of this new assessment for short spine, the ACLs for short spine thorny head are likely always going to be lower than the Dover sole ACLs. So proportionally an increase in Dover sole attainments um, could, is why they could, short spine thorny head could be a constraint in the future. Thank you. Any further questions of the team report? Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and, um, and along, thanks, Whitney, and, and the team. Um, along the lines of Jessica um, is questioning here, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm having a lot of good, thank you for the statement, very stimulating. Um, and, and, and Maggie in the NIMS report brought up the, the variations and contingencies, <laughs> like, and I'm, I'm having some trips down memory lane here. Um, just maybe on, on dogfish, um, yeah, I just remember last summer seeing the, the initial results of the assessment coming out with an ACL about half of what it is now and then wondering what that meant and, and almost certainly meaning that you were not going to be trawling on the, on the shelf for large portions of the year. Um, we heard Brad talk about, you know, the, the sable fish, the small sable fish that probably aren't accounted for in this assessment. Um, you know, we, in, in, that, in the whiting fishery, um, holding back uh, a quota because they, they might need it to finish their seasons. And I remember when we developed this program that, um, you know, canary rockfish was probably the, the, the primary focus. Um, and then, and, and by the time I think I can't, it was a cycle or two later, I remember Miss Ames when she was staffing the GMT saying that the IFQ model said sablefish was going to be the most constraining and, and not believing her, <laughs> but it turned out to be true. So that, yeah, some good thoughts here. I didn't think about um, on, on the thorny heads. Um, I guess so. Two questions for you on on those. Are you suggesting that um, you or the or council staff could could do some projections on on including thorny heads on how much Dover sole might be utilized? So that's question number one. Um, is it a suggestion for some analysis? And then and then two. You guys, you all talk about the um, options that maximize flexibility. I'm not, not phrasing it correctly, but did, you don't say which which ones might have the most flexibility. And do you have any, any thoughts to elaborate on that? Thank you, Mr. Niles, for the question through the chair. Um, to your question about short spine thorny head, the intention of putting that information in our report was not necessarily to suggest additional analysis. It was mostly just to um, look at this action through the lens of uh, management implications because we are the ground fish management team um, and just to provide input on um, implications in the future um, that may result from this action. So. Um, 
we're not suggesting using this information to determine um, any final action. Um, it's really just a, an informational um, piece of information that may uh, be good to know if that um, answers your question. Uh, so yeah, in short, no suggestion for additional analysis um, came up as part of the GMT discussion. Um, and then the second piece um, with regard to management flexibility, uh, we didn't highlight any specifically because we thought that the analysis, there's a couple tables in the analysis that did so. Um, and uh, I think I, I think it's cited in the report, um, table 25 may be one, but um, there were tables that for each alternative highlighted um, low, medium or high uh, complexity in terms of um, administration and, and analysis um, that would go into those. And so we were mostly referring to those tables when we meant management flexibility. All right, further questions to the team, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on that table 25, just a, a, another follow-up, um, and probably this would have been a question for Jesse, but um, I'm curious as to um, your understanding of how or, or the mechanism by which those adjustments might be accomplished. Are you, is the suggestion that there be an in-season type of a mechanism to allow for it, or would this be, um, you know, a, a new agenda item that the council would need to schedule and proceed with a two or three meeting process uh, and the supporting NEPA, NEPA materials? Or maybe you can elaborate on what your understanding is. Thank you, Mr. Emko, for the question through the chair. That is a good question because it's a question the GMT also asked ourselves, and we were hoping to um, have some clarification um, from either the council or National Marine Fisheries Service on what is the appropriate mechanism. It was, uh, we didn't come up with any suggestions for what that mechanism will look like, but we did think through um, the possible mechanisms being biennial harvest specifications or um, through new management measures that are prioritized and which of those might be more efficient. Um, we didn't speak to which are um, most appropriate or our actual options. And I would look to the National Marine Fisheries Service to clarify if those are, um, which of those would be options. And then um, as we note, the council could decide at final action um, what those would look like in practice. Does that answer your question, Ms. Yermko? Thank you, Mr. Er, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, it, it answers it as well as any, you know, anything we have in front of us. And uh, maybe at some point we can hear more from Jim or Jesse or Nims. Thanks. All right. Any further questions? Phil Anderson. I don't have a question. I just wanted to compliment the GMT on their report, um, sitting down and trying to figure out uh, what they can offer us for additional advice, um, areas that we need, uh, potential pitfalls we need to watch for, that they did, had a really thoughtful discussion and that's certainly represented in their report. So thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks for that, Phil. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands. So thank you very much, Whitney. Uh, we'll next hear from the gap. I have four names. Um, I don't know if everyone's coming up or not. Uh, Susan Chambers, Shems Judd, Jeff Lackey, and Bob Alverson. And feel free to pull up some more chairs if you need to but there are still only two microphones, so you'll have to share. All right. Good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the council. Uh, my name is Shems Judd. I'm up here with Bob Alverson and Jeff Lackey. We'll be taking a tag team approach to the gap statement this morning. Uh, we'll be reading from uh, agenda item H3A, 
ground fish advisory sub panel report on sable fish gear switching. <laughs> The GAP received an update on the Sablefish gear switching alternatives from Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jesse Dorpinghouse. The GAP offers the following comments and recommendations. The GAP reached consensus on removal of alternatives two and four from the list of alternatives under consideration. Specifically, the GAP recommends listing them as considered but rejected alternatives. With regard to alternative two, uh, NIMS has stated that it is the most complex and burdensome in terms of ongoing cost and analysis. The Groundfish Management Team report highlighted similar concerns. Given that cost and complexity and the fact that it doesn't offer advantages over the other alternatives, the GAP recommends removing it from the range. With regard to alternative four, the GAP concurs with the GMT statement that it does not adequately address current business practices, is overly complex, and doesn't meet the purpose and need of the action. As such, the GAP rec recommends removal of alternative four as well. The GAP is also in agreement on the importance of meeting in person in April, um, specifically to address this issue. This is a highly contentious and longstanding issue, and the GAP will discuss this um, under agenda item C10, future workload. The GAP recommends the council develop a set of preliminary indicators about the possible effectiveness related to any gear switching alternative selected with results to be evaluated at a future review. At that time, the council could respond with further action based on the results. Beyond those areas of consensus, the gap remains sharply divided on the other gear switching issues. Uh, following our two perspectives, one presenting the fixed gear sector's preferred approach and the other representing the approach preferred by the trawl and processing representatives on the gap. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Bob Alverson for the fixed gear perspective. Through the chair, um, fixed gear sector, the GAP fixed gear representatives fully support the council's principles that recognizing participation and investments that were made by participants in gear switching, gear switching was provided and intended to, in the council's motion when establishing the trawl quota share program under amendment 20. The following are from the environmental impact statement for trawl individual fishing quota analysis concerning gear switching as well as a comment from the judge when the program was adjudicated. Recipients are free to use quota share from with, with any ground fish gear including trawl long line and fish pots switching permanently from trawl to, to some other gear. And Council action regarding gear switching takes into account the opportunity to reduce bycatch and other possible adverse environmental impacts. And from uh, the ruling on the judge, in addition to the proposed action under Amendment 20, trawl rationalization allows limited entry trawl permit holders to switch from trawl to fixed gears to fish their quota, which in turn would reduce trawl impacts. It also allows non-trawl vessels to harvest the allocation to the trawl sector if they acquire a trawl permit in IFQ. And Amendment 20 is a mitigative measure, or at, worst, or at worst is neutral with respect to the natural environment because trawl fleet consolidation, gear switching, and observer monitoring are likely to mitigate environmental impacts relative to the status quo. During the time the council has been debating the analysis and analyzing restrictions to gear switching over the last five years, between 1.5 to 29% of the trawl allocation in the north has been left unharvested. In addition to the surplus sablefish quota not harvested annually, the trawl fleet has chosen to annually divert 30 to 33% of their trawl sablefish holdings to gear switching. We would submit the reason for this is the lack of trawl markets for arrowtooth flounder, dover sole, and other flounder species. The council's analysis of the current alternatives to restrict gear switching fail to explain how these flounder markets are enhanced and provide more opportunity to trawlers. In fact, during the sablefish management and trawl allocation uh, attainment committee's discussions, the staff pointed out that should other flounder markets increase, trawlers would be incentivized to use their sable fish to harvest the other ground fish. In essence, the suggested gear switching problem would disappear on its own through natural market forces. 
The Council's current alternatives suggest the Council knows better than the trawl fleet how to maximize the delivery of trawl quota. This is accomplished by devaluing at least 71% of the trawl sablefish quota by an estimated $50 million in the hope that this will result in additional ground fish landings. The devaluation would be absolute, having the greatest negative impact on the most financially vulnerable members of the trawl fleet that are entirely dependent upon the limitations in the Pacific Northwest market. While the forthcoming new markets is unsupported in the current analysis and seems highly speculative and at best just hopeful. The fixed gear sector of the gap currently recommends that the best alternative is status quo. We further recommend not developing a preliminary alternative at this time. We rec recommend the following alternatives uh, to one and alternatives one and three in order to compare them against status quo. The council's alternatives require under alternative one, the use of the owner's vessel to qualify in addition to quota landed before the cutoff date. There are fixed gear participants who purchase trawl sable fish prior to the cutoff date. They lease their quota to other fixed gear operations prior to the cutoff date while their vessel was participating in other fisheries. If you own quota that was leased to someone who who gear switched and that happened before the control date, then it should be issued as any gear. It does not seem fair to condemn or restrict this purchase of quota. The quota was purchased prior to the cutoff date and used with fixed gear vessels and operated under the rules of the trawl IFQ program. The council could add options uh, that waive the vessel ownership requirements altogether or waive the vessel ownership for one, uh, gear switching buyers, these are processors, by the way, gear fishing switching processors that owned quota share and received a minimum of 30,000 pounds of gear switching sable fish in three years, 2011 to the cutoff date. And or B, where members of a fisherman's collective marketing act registered cooperative who contributed sable fish quota share that they own to the co-op that was harvested by members of the gear switching vessels. We recommend dropping alternative two, it was previously mentioned. Alternative three, this, this should be a permanent permit based alternative based on the delivery of quota share landed and owned by the participant. The endorsed permit should be transferable without any phase out of the fishing privilege. The alternative with its most restrictive options may leave only six permits active. These permits would be very valuable and we recommend the council consider adding an ownership and control limit to this option. Our concern is over the next 20 years, these permits will likely be sold as fishing families in their current involvement in the fishery. Without a limited limit of ownership and control, a single entity that can afford to purchase very valuable permits could control too many permits and control this part of the sable fish market. We recommend dropping alternative four. In conclusion, the fixed gear gap members do not believe the council has demonstrated the need for the current proposed restrictions to gear switching and support status quo as a preferred alternative. We recommend delaying taking action on a PPA. If the discussions continue, we recommend working from alternatives one and three. Fixed gear representatives also recommend delaying the decision about whether to adopt the individual or collective approach to allow more time for affected parties, parties to provide their input. My name is Jeff Lackey and I'll be reading from the, I'll be reading uh, the trawl sector portion. Uh, for the background, the bottom trawl fishery has a unique place in West Coast fisheries and its value goes well beyond just a measure of X vessel value. Sablefish is a lifeblood species for the bottom trawl because it widely co-occurs with trawl dominant species and as an economic component that makes bottom trawl viable for both the trawl vessel and the ground fish processor. 
Sablefish denotes capacity for viable trawl attainment. Uh, second, bottom trawl is the glue for the processor that helps the business model that holds the business model together. Other fisheries are often time dependent, like crab, whiting, and shrimp. Bottom trawl can fill the time between those other fisheries downtimes and facilitate year-round processor employment, thereby enhancing processor capacity, resiliency, and year-round opportunities for both trawl and non-trawl vessels. Third, the ground fish processor is important to the community because of the nature and volume of the trawl fishery requires a large amount of infrastructure, employment, and brick and mortar processor anchored in a community. When trawl goes away in a community, the community and other fisheries suffer as well. It is in everyone's best interest to support healthy trawl fisheries with their brick and mortar processors. Fourth, ground fish facilitates geographic distribution of fisheries because trawl supports that processor capacity anchored in a community. So the greater the trawl fishery capacity is directly impacted by sable fish allocation dedicated to only trawl, then the greater the probability of geographic distribution of brick and mortar processors supporting multiple fisheries. A healthy geographic distribution also facilitates achievement of optimum yield, which can only be achieved with effort dispersed off all three states. Based on that background, trawl representatives on the GAP support moving forward with the PPA at this time and recommend selection of alternative three, qualification option three, endorsement option three. That alternative with those sub options would reduce fixed gear catch of Northern Sable trawl IFQ quota to 6.5%. Below is the rationale and explanation of how alternative three, qualification three, endorsement option three will best meet the purpose and need of the action. We need to keep gear switching from impeding attainment. The purpose and need states that the purpose of the action would be to keep Northern Sablefish gear switching from impeding the attainment of Northern IFQ allocations with trawl gear. Sablefish caught by fixed gear reduces the capacity of the fishery to attain other species with trawl gear because sablefish is critical both logistically and economically to facilitate sustained markets and trawl harvest. Reducing fixed gear catch of Northern Sablefish trawl IFQ quota to 6.5% would incentivize processor investment and market development and significantly increase capacity for overall sector attainment. Uh, the second is goals two and three of the fishery management plan. <clears throat> the purpose and need also references management goals two and three of the fishery management plan, which uh, respectively seek to maximize the value of the ground fish resource as a whole and to achieve the maximum biological yield of the overall ground fish fishery. Limiting fixed gear attainment to 6.5% incre increases the capacity to achieve both of those goals. The revenue of DTS strategy per unit of sable fish is 2.3 to 4.3 times that of gear switching, as table 10 of attachment three, and other trawl strategies have a higher ratio. There is also additional value in the increased employment required to process trawl caught fish above and beyond sable fish. Other trawl caught species caught with sable fish contribute to achieving the maximum biological yield of the overall ground fish fishery. The goal of Amendment 20, full utilization, uh, the purpose and need also states, this action would seek to improve the program towards the goal of Amendment 20 to the FMP, which created the shore-based IFQ program of providing for full utilization of the trawl sector allocation. As with the two prior points, a 6.5% fixed gear limit provides a much greater capacity for utilization of the trawl sector allocation than a limit of 29% for the status quo or alternatives one and two. Uh, this section is a recommendation for PPA based on the previous information. Alternative three with qualification option three and endorsement option three. Uh, below are the recommended sub options and features for alternative three that result in a limit of 6.5% fixed gear catch. Endorsement qualification option three. Permit with 30,000 pounds of fixed gear landings in three years, uh, plus ownership of the permit and quota share as, as of and since the control date, plus ownership of a vessel that gear switched as of and since the control date. Endorsement limit option three, amount of QS owned as of and since the control date. Additional recommendations for alternative three, trawl permit without a gear endorsement. 
No fixed gear allowance for those permits with an endorsement, without an endorsement. Uh, remove alternative three from alternative three, the allowance for a low level of gear switching activity. This would simplify oversight and monitoring. Gear switching limit overages. Uh, follow the suggestion from NIFS report two, quote, allowing for a relatively small amount of catch over the endorsements limit without a violation, end of quote. Endorsement expiration. Endorsement could either A, expire on transfer to a new owner or new owner added, or B, automatically expire 12 years after implementation of regulations. This would simplify oversight and allow sufficient planning time to either exit the trawl fishery or add trawl capability to the vessel. Uh, proposed endorsement transfers. The endorsement is only valid on a vessel with common ownership. In the case of multiple vessel ownership, the permit owner can declare which vessel would fish the endorsement for the year. Uh, the next section is rationale for recommending alternative three with qualification three and endorsement option three to achieve 6.5 percent limit. Uh, one, it, this option and sub-options covers the 3.75 percent to 6.5 percent group. And per the analysis for alternatives three and four, those meeting both ownership, um, that is permit vessel QS ownership, and participation, that is pre-controlled date, three years by 30,000 pounds requirements, own between 3.7 percent in alternative four and 6.5 percent in alternative three amount of quota share. Uh, second, efficiency in identifying the group. Relative to other alternatives and other sub-options, alternative three with qualification, uh, with a qualification option three and endorsement option three provides the most capacity to increase trawl sector utilization and meet purpose and need while at the same time efficiently identifying fixed gear entities meeting both ownership and participation requirements and allowing those entities to continue to use fixed gear. Third, considers current operations and investments. Specify an allowance of endorsements in their limits based on a combination of vessel and permit and QS ownership and participation is a direct result of considering investment and current operations. This consideration language is from the purpose and need. It is also worth noting the trawl uh, vessel and processor investments for the fishery participation are decades and generations long, reaching tens and perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. Fourth, ownership of a gear switching vessel. This is an essential piece of the endorsement qualification. Not including ownership of a vessel, gear switching vessel would have the three serious drawbacks. Uh, first, it would substantially lower the bar for both participation and ownership, but especially participation because ownership of a gear switching vessel represents active participation. Second, it would reduce capacity to increase utilization of trawl sector allocation, reduce capacity to achieve optimum yield and F&P objectives, and not best achieve purpose and need. Third, lowering the bar for qualification in this way would lessen the distinction between endor endorsement qualifiers and non-qualifiers. Uh, trawl sector specific recommendations. Uh, first, narrow alternative three by selecting alternative three with qualification option three and endorsement option three is the PPA. The other sub options in alternative three should be removed for further consideration. Second, move alternatives one, two, and four to considered but rejected alternatives. Third, maintain the individual approach. Eliminate the collective approach from analysis. Fourth, use net effects for analysis. For future analysis on impacts to communities and buyers, use a net effect. For example, if a community both loses fixed gear sable and gains trawl ground fish, then the result is the net effect of the catch process processing and sale of the fish. And also use the most recent three years as a baseline to get the most current impacts of net effect. So to conclude for the future, we are on the doorstep of a bottom trawl fishery having all its foundational components in place a well-managed fishery to prevent overfishing, healthy stocks, access to fishing grounds, including former rockfish conservation areas, a post-pandemic world, and it's a dedicated full trawl allocation of northern sablefish. The 6.5% maximum fixed gear catch of northern uh, sablefish trawl IFQ quota would be the last piece to enable stakeholders to grow markets over the next five to seven years. 
realization of those gains and catch value year-round employment, fishery geographic distribution, and community stability would positively impact fishery management plan goals two and three, objectives six, seven, nine, and 16, and amendment 20 goals one, two, and three, and objectives two, six, and seven. And that concludes your report. All right, well, thank you for both of those reports. I imagine there might be a question or two. Uh, Jessica, followed by Corey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My first question, I just wanna first acknowledge the GAPS report and thank you for all the detail and effort that went into it. My first question is in the consensus that was reached by the GAP for the removal of alternatives two and four, the GAP stated that they would like to leave in as considered but not selected. Is that for the reason of wanting some additional further data comparisons or just so that it is noted that they were considered? Uh, Ms. Watson, uh, through the chair, I think that's just for NEPA purposes. Um, yeah, uh, no additional uh, consideration or analysis was contemplated by the GAP. Corey, I thought you had your hand up. Th thanks, Mr. Chair, and yeah, and thanks to the GAP. I do. Um, I know it's not easy having different viewpoints, but it, I do. I do appreciate every, everyone laying out the viewpoints in as fully as possible, and not having to worry about reaching full consensus. So I, I appreciate this approach. Realize unless it, it might be painful for you all. Um, Bob, this is a question for Bob. Um, as a lead in, I guess, you know, prior to this meeting, I was I was thinking the excessive consolidation part wasn't so relevant to our decision, um, and that we already we have control limits that are staying um, in place among all the alternatives. Um, but now there's there was a couple of public comments, and now you all on page the bottom of page three for alternative three talk about ownership of control. And, and Bob, you brought this up in our morning meeting, and I, I think I half got it, but would you, um, could you elaborate on, on what the concern is there and, and what, what you're meaning by that? Yes, through the chair. Is that coming through? Yeah, okay. Um, so in if you take the most uh, restrictive format on alternative three or the, the least one, you, you're gonna end up with six permits or maybe 11 permits. And this is going to be the, a unique window through which gear switching can be, be done. And um, these permits could be extremely valuable. Um, a, a tier one permit in, in the Sablefish tier program sells for anywhere, depending on the length of boat it is, uh, from six hundred dollars to $800,000. And that's 54,000 pounds. So... I don't know if you could accumulate uh, 296,000 pounds, that's a, a trawl um, limit onto one of these permits. But these, these, depending on how many pounds the council eventually allows to be gear switched to this, this could be a very valuable permit. And 20 to 30 years out when fishing families sell out, people pass away, they, they, they stop their participation. What we're seeing in the North Pacific Council is the fishing families are disappearing and the Pollock quota and, the, and these big quotas that are up there are going to very large corporations. So our concern is, could I go to Taiwan, my friends in Taiwan, the market Black Cod or, 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 or uh, Korea, China, and get financial backing to, to buy these up as they come on the market? or could someone else, and then they uniquely control all the all the trawl block guide that can be gear switched. So that's our control that we, we're suggesting maybe you can only own one uh, type of thing. So that's what we're concerned about. Then ask your question. Look to this side of the room, I don't see a hand. Go back to this side, Krista and then Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so different line of questioning, but I believe also for you, Mr. Alverson. Um, so looking at alternative one, you put in a couple of potential sub options, points A and B. And I'm just wondering if those were included in alternative one moving forward, if that would substantially change the position of the fixed gear sector. Thank you. 
through the chair. I wasn't sure quite what the question was. Could could you ask it again, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you have in your statement points A and B under alternative one, which would be that the council could add the options to waive vessel ownership requirements for gear switching buyers who meet a minimum of 30,000 pounds um, or for members who are part of a Fisherman's Collective Marketing Act cooperative. And I'm just wondering if those were chosen by the council to include in alternative one, if that would substantially change the position of members of the fixed gear sector. Through, through the chair. Um, so the, the, I think the fixed gear sector will still believe that um, the analysis hasn't met the criteria to, to, uh, to, to restrict gear switching, but we're looking as a fixed gear group, how to, how to tell the council how this might be less injurious to the fixed gear industry. And so the A, we have um, a guy that, that specialized in buying sable fish fixed gear quota, and he bought some uh, prior to the cutoff date. He brought, bought some uh, trawl quota, and he used that to entice uh, fixed gear people to deliver to him. And subsequent to that, he bought a boat, and he operates the boat. So this quota was always used is um, always used as fixed gear. And we don't think that if you go down this right road, it would be less injurious to a number of people that bought quota before the cutoff date, put substantial investments in, you know, the 30,000 pounds that back then, uh, I'm not sure exactly what he bought, but it was going for about $16 a pound. So he probably dropped a half a million dollars at that time, thinking this was going to be the way this, the program was going to run. So it would, it would be less injurious to the fixed gear industry if, if they were included, these exemptions. And Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Another question for you, Mr. Alverson. Under Alt 3, I don't see the, from your perspective, any preference stated for endorsement or qualifier options under that alternative. Um, it is mentioned that it could leave only six permits. Was there any consensus on, from a gear switching perspective, on sub-option qualifications there, or just that, as stated in the in the beginning that if that moved forward, you would be supportive of all one and all three being further analyzed. So through the chair, uh, the fixed gear sector does not in, endorse alternative three as it, it, it just reduces the total percentage to too small. Um, in fact, uh, the six and a half percent on the most uh, restrictive format we believe does not respond to the council SEMTEC meeting where they wanted to uh, consider past investments. So I think it, during those meetings, it was suggested that there was maybe 12% of all the trawl quota was held by fixed gear people prior to 2017. And so if you go to 6.5, everybody loses half of their investment. So we, we just can't bring ourselves there, but it, one in three are the most functional to, to work from. And we felt it would be helpful to drop two and four as they just create too much complexity for the, the industry and the council. Further questions of the gap? Marcy Aramco. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll move to the trawl sector section of the report, if I may. Uh, looking at page four, um, argument for uh, increasing the trawl fishery capacity um, by dedicating allocation to only trawl uh, will increase the probability of geographic distribution of brick and mortar processors supporting multiple fisheries. Um, I'm hoping you can provide me some, is this a reference from some scientific publication? 
Um, wh where was this? How was this determined? What's your source? Um, experience. Um, I'll give give one. I'll give two examples um, where we've had some consolidation of fillet lines in Oregon, either almost uh, doing away with or severely curtailing. When overall capacity goes down, fillet lines get consolidated into fewer ports, or some ports get really small ones or don't have year-round fillet lines. So we see when capacity goes down, there's consolidation. And we also see when um, uh, the, the fillet lines allow for the year-round employment, when, when uh, crab all of a sudden started up last year in Newport, there was uh, some rockfish going on that they had people to jump over. If they didn't have that, they wouldn't. And so we're in Eureka talking uh, to, talk, well, I don't know if I, it's hard not to talk about specific places, but well, I'll just say in Eureka, um, when, when, when buyers are limited, there's a trawl facility that has employees and it has capacity so they can take salmon deliveries or they can uh, do oysters or they can take a lot of um, fixed gear sable quota, not gear switching, but a lot of a lot of tier fishery, other, other, they have the capacity, the brick and mortar processors have capacity. And we've seen in California when trawl goes away, uh, that, that infrastructure and capacity goes away and um, it really affects other fisheries. So it's just anecdotal talking to people and seeing it for myself in Oregon and talking to people in other states. Do you have a follow up there, Marcy? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Um, actually, I have a, I'll go to a different question in the same sector, if that's all right. Um, so another, um, if, I, if I read the takeaway from the trawl sector's uh, argument, um, I'm struggling if you are making your recommendation on Alt three qualification option three and endorsement option three based on its projected outcome of reducing the fixed gear catch to 6.5%. As I read the report, it seems to me it's it, what you're looking for is attaining the cap of 6.5% that it's, it's about picking that number as compared to the 29% that is driving your recommendation. And so maybe you can answer that first and then I have a follow-up question. Thank you. Yes, so is, is your question that is the, the number driving the recommendation, the number 6.5 driving the recommendation for the PPA? Y yes, yes, it's the, it's the, it's the number that, let me see if I can find it in the report that kind of responds to that. Um, so page six, near the top rationale for recommending alternative three with qualification option three and endorsement option three to achieve the 6.5%. So it basically those four items are why going for the, the lowest number that maximizes the capacity for the trawl fishery, yet recognizes for the purpose and need current operations and investments by the combination of the participation and the ownership criteria to, to cover those that meet that criteria and the quota share they own, but then the remainder uh, go for the capacity of the trawl fishery to achieve uh, uh, the benefits. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So my follow-up question is, do, do you really care who takes the 6.5% or who those uh, ownership interests are assigned to? Or are you looking merely to achieve the limit? Both. It, it matters simply because if somebody owned a vessel and they were out on the water year after year, they owned their quota share, they owned their permit, and they, they participated. Um, if somebody's gonna get that 6.5%, it should be those people. And so 
I, I think that's something that a lot of people, even on the trial side, believe. If somebody's going to do it, it should be those people. Okay, thank you. Maggie? Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Thank you to the GAP. I, I, mean, uh, I ha actually have a couple concise questions for each of the sectors, but I'll, I'm going to start with that 6.5% that Marcy was just asking about because it is... Um, it, it, it seems like such a focus of the um, this portion of this report, and I'm looking, for example, at at the last paragraph on the future. A 6.5 percent maximum fixed gear catch would be the last piece to enable growth in markets over the next five to seven years. And I think I heard you a moment ago say that you, you chose 6.5% because it was the lowest level offered by the alternatives that the GAP is recommending keeping in the range. And um, But I, I wonder if there's anything specific about the, the number 6.5% about that value rather than anything else, because it is called out so much in this report. Thanks. So we didn't choose the lowest number of the alternatives. The lowest number was 3.7% in alternative four. But it, in, in many people's estimation, that would probably leave out some of those people we talked about who own the vessel, were on the water, own the quarter share, own the permit, generational. Um, and if anybody's going to be able to do it, those people should. And so it, it wasn't just the lowest number. It was make sure we include the people who met that all those criteria and the quota share they owned. And then everything above that 6.5%, the, the reason the 6.5% is so key is that anything above that 6.5% represents least fish or insufficient participation. And uh, so minimizing the capacity of the trawl fishery to achieve OY for least fish is sort of a makes that 6.5% cutoff so key because everybody below that 6.5% had the ownership of the vessel on the water three years pre control date, had all that. Everything above it is least fish or insufficient uh, participation. Thank you. Uh, Jess, do oh, you have a follow up? I'm sorry. I have several others, but okay. they're unrelated. I'm happy to wait. Well, let me go to Jessica, and then I'll come back to you, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Maggie. On sticking with this 6.5%, um, my question is, it seems like in some of this rationale stated specifically under goals two and three of the fishery management plan on page five, um, and also talking about the purpose and need, um, is my understanding through this rationale that any reduction in gear switching would increase capacity under this argument? Yes. Um, Sablefish is important <clears throat> logistically and economically, and it represents capacity. I use the word capacity because pretty much nothing about the future is a guarantee but it is important for capacity to incentivize stakeholders uh, to have a viable uh, uh, fishery to which catch and process fish. Back to you, Maggie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this one is, I believe, a quick clarification from Mr. Lackey on the proposed endorsement transfers is the gap proposing or this portion of the gap proposing that permits would remain transferable to other vessels but the endorsement would only be valid when the endorsed permit is registered to a vessel that has joint ownership in common with the endorsed permit and does the level of joint ownership matter Yes, and I didn't think about the second question. We didn't talk about it. Uh, Thanks. Further questions? Maggie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this one is for the fixed gear sector portion of the report on the bottom of page two. 
Uh, there's a statement about devaluing Charles Sable fish quota by an estimated $50 million. Uh, where did that figure come from? Through the chair, um, we have testified before on that and it comes from uh, the, the current market uh, sales for sable fish, uh, fixed gear sable fish uh, through Dock Street brokers and other brokers in the Northwest out of Seattle. The, the going price right now, if you go to one of their, their logs, they uh, can get one of their links, is uh, in Alaska, prices are somewhere between uh, uh, 10 and $12 a pound. They were running about uh, prior five years ago, 15, 14 to $16 a pound. And um, so right now, let's say you have a quota of 9,000 9, tons for everyone. The trawlers get 58% of that, um, comes to about 10 million pounds. And then um, if, uh, how did I figure this out? Um, so if, if the small sable fish that the trawlers land are, are uh, receiving a, a smaller price, the, the, the exchange, the, the, the asset value is probably going to be more like four or five dollars a pound rather than fourteen dollars a pound. So the, the differential on a, on a, about 10 million pounds is going to be uh, um, well, I figured there would be a five million pounds there. so it'd be about 50 million dollars when you differential between uh, what an asset value of trawl would sell for versus what an asset uh, value of uh, fixed gear se se sells for right now. Thank you for the reminder. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Final question uh, also for the fixed gear sector. Um, I noted at the top of page three, the fixed gear sector currently recommends that the best alternative is status quo, but recommends not uh, selecting a preliminary preferred alternative at this time. Did why why did the that sector of the gap not recommend selecting no action as the preliminary preferred alternative? Did you discuss that option? Through the chair, uh, we're recommending certain um, additions to alternative one and alternative three, and we thought that uh, if the council picks those up or some others that uh, the trawlers want that those should be analyzed against status quo and so it probably uh, puts the council back one meeting for making uh, that that preliminary preferred decision thank you that was your final question all right let's see if there are any other questions jessica please thank you mr chair this question um goes back to the trawl section or Mr. Lackey, uh, with regards to that propo proposed endorsement tran transfers, can you provide some additional uh, rational discussion that the gap had around including that here? Um, that was, that was, um, that was to, keep the intent of somebody who qualifies that they get the benefit of the fixed gear and then not be leased out and put on different boats, that it be the person who qualifies to be, to be identified, to have this benefit that it stays with them. Corey. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and I was going to ask the same question Maggie did about the, the $50 million. Um, and, and maybe this this one for both of you to respond to, or I'll ask Jeff first, um, because I, I peppered Bob about it this morning a little bit. But yeah, on your on your ending there, um, and Jeff on the on the future, um, you know, the purpose of one of the action alternatives here would be to help that future come about. Um, and we're hearing exciting things, you know, from within my state about um, buyers who haven't really participated heavily in, in, in the Dover Soul and, and bottom trawl market, making investments, having some prospects for sales, contracts, so on and so forth. So um, my point to Bob was, you know, if that takes off, um, 
and utilization really goes up, then you're probably you wouldn't lose fifty million dollars in quota value. You might you might even stay even, or you might even it might be worth more. You know, if it's a, kind of like a stock market type thing, maybe if the bottom trawl sector takes off, then like uh, and as Mark was saying about table ten in the analysis, I'm assuming those are those are excess revenues, but maybe with profits similar ratio that if everyone can get to the average DTS number, it should be more profitable. Uh, it could be as profitable as, as fixed gear. So, um, but you're also, you're also bringing some good points. It's not just about um, efficiency and profit. There's geography and, and history, cultural, um, I'm not, words are failing me. I hear Bob and, and I'm sympathizing with Bob for doing the math out loud. That was impressive, Bob. I can't do that on the fly, but yeah, any, any reactions to, to what are the thoughts here? Um, are you saying that you think it could be as, as profitable and you're gonna get these other benefits or these other benefits outweigh it, even if, even if it's not as um, competitive with fixed gear. Okay. And so uh, you're, you're asking in reference to sort of the $50 million question. Yep. Um, I just, looked on Jefferson this morning because you can look up past auctions of quota share. And then this year there was four auctions of sable fish for an average of a, somewhere in the neighborhood of 624,000 a percent. Um, and previous to 2020 or 2021, there had been a total of six sales with an average of somewhere around $800,000 a percent. And so that was back when sable was a much higher X vessel value. And so if I'm looking at those two numbers, I'm not seeing the difference in value. Of course, it's a small sample, but it's all, it's all I have to go by. And yes, I do believe that not only in the future could Sable be very, uh, very valuable from the trawl perspective, but all of a, a person who has Sable North quota, the vast majority of them are also going to have other species quota share and often trawl vessels and gear and everything else that are worth more in a healthy fishery and worth less in a depressed fishery. So yes, I believe that the trough, the best value for the trawl fishery and participants who own uh, its, its assets, they're all far better off if we have a healthy trawl fishery dispersed on the coast. Looking for... Did, did part, you want my side of that or... Go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> so... To the chair, um, so Corey, if the uh, the trawl, um, say for arrowtooth and Dover and the other groundfish species, all of a sudden had more demand, and 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 there was hence more demand from the trawlers to participate with their black cod in in the um, um, to land that fish, then yes, your trawl. If you had a quote and it had been designated as trawl only, it would come up in value. But this almost dovetails into Jesse's and, and, and Jim's discussion in the SAMTAC that if those prices come up for the trawlers, then the program self-corrects itself because the trawlers are going to be incentivized to use the sable fish on their own rather than uh, for, to catch the other species, rather than the gear switch. So I would counter that should that scenario happen, the, the price of, of ground fish come up and the demand for it to come up, gear switching goes away and it self corrects. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands. I want to thank uh, you gentlemen for your reports and your patient response to all the questions you got. Um, Greg Bush, on behalf of the enforcement consultants. Morning, Mr. Chair, members of council. My name is Greg Bush, representing the enforcement consultants. We'll be reading agenda item H3A, supplemental EC report one. Enforcement consultants report on sable fish gear switching. The enforcement consultants have reviewed the material associated with agenda item H3, sable fish gear switching, including H3A, 
Supplemental Revised NIMS Report 2 and have the following comments. The EC recommends consideration of administrative adjustments to overages under alternatives three and four. We recommend allowing coverage within a set number of days with purchase of additional quota pounds or allowing an overage up to a certain percent of remaining balance, such as 10%, or allowing an overage of up to a set amount, such as 500 pounds, before being considered a violation and referred to enforcement. Alternatives three and four do not appear to address how overages would be addressed. For example, overages of up to 10% or 500 pounds could be administrative re administratively reduced from the following year's quota. Overages above the percent or weight allowances would be referred to enforcement. This concludes the EC's report. All right, thank you very much. Let's see if there are any questions on the EC's report. I'm not, oh, Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Greg, for the report, appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm looking at the <clears throat> overages above the percent or weight allowance would be referred to enforcement. Is there a typical or a, a, a custom sample of what you do with those overages in, in, as far as the penalty? Is it, do you just it, uh, basically the penalty is equal to the value of the overage or how is that done typically or is there a typically? Through the chair, um, thank you for the question, Mr. Dooley. Um, the actual assignment of penalties is through NOAA General Counsel Enforcement Section and we, we apply their penalty provisions. Um, the actual amount depends on a number of different circumstances one example, for instance, I could give from a from a standard overage for, say, an open access vessel that has a trip limit. In that case, if there's, if it's, um, we have a summary settlement schedule that we're we're using that's posted on the general counsel's website um, that you could you could look at, and it'll show if it's a um, first time overage and there is no attempt to hide the overage and it's we're notified of the overage it's one time the value of the fish. So it's the ex vessel value. So the fisherman does not, is, is not allowed to keep the, the proceeds from that overage. And, and that is typical for your, your first time assessment. And then the circumstances change based on, or the, the penalty would change based on other circumstances. Thank you, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thanks, Greg, for the report. I may have missed it, but one of the recommendations you make in here is allowing an overage of up to a certain percent of the remaining balance. So I suspect that's the remaining balance of the, the endorsement qualification. Is, is there a problem with defining that at the start of a fishing trip at the end, uh, at the time of delivery or anything there that should be taken into consideration. Thank you for the question, Mr. Hasmer, through the chair. Um, the enforcement consultants are, are just providing, we, we wanted to just note that there is a concern about overages not being defined within alternatives three and four, and it would be up to management to, dis, to determine what would be an acceptable percent or weight or even no no allowance for an overage and it would go to enforcement with for any overage um the there's challenges i believe with calculating what the remaining balance would be say from one trip to the next because there may be some adjustments that take place based on observer data and others for for the ifq fishery since that's a that's a catch base versus landing base fishery. So, so when we're determining what the actual landing percent is and what the overage is, we're, we may not know that until it could be days or weeks after the actual landing because there may be some adjustments that are made based on other information. So, so I, I couldn't answer that specifically because there, there are some challenges when you're dealing with IFQ versus some of the other fisheries that are landing based. All right, thank you. I think that's what I wanted to hear. There are some challenges and things to consider there is what you're saying. Are there any further questions? 
Thank you very much. Well, that, that completes the reports that we have under this agenda item. As I said before, um, if there are any other thoughts that council members have they want the public to consider, um, I'd give that opportunity now, uh, pointing out this is not an opportunity for any discussion on anything that puts forward, just something uh, if, 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 if any council members want to seek input from the public when we come to public comment. Let me also say on public comment that we will hold off on public comment uh, until after um, agenda item H4, then we'll come back to public comment on H3. I note that we have uh, many, many folks wanting to comment on agenda item H3. So we will be exercising um, the discretion to reduce the amount of time for public comment. And I'll announce that at the start of public comment. So let me just see before we go, um, Jim Seeger. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a, a, a minor item. Um, it kind of came up towards the end of the uh, question and answer with uh, uh, Jesse and I, um, and there was something that was kind of implied, and I just wanted to be sure it was in, in explicit uh, to inform both the council discussion now and the public comment coming up. Uh, and that had to do with the revenue table that you pointed out, table 10, and those revenue ratios, and it was mentioned those are, are ex-vessel or, or gross revenues uh, and don't take into account the profit differential. Um, I do want to just note that in other parts of the analysis where it does get into the costs of harvesting and the differential between the fixed gear and the trawlers, uh, that you'll see there um, that uh, because the, uh, the, the, uh, the profit differential for the, uh, for the trawlers is much lower. I mean, they make a few, for example, on the Dover Solar, they're just making a few cents a pound. So even though when you look at that table, the ex-vessel ref, ex revenue ratios for a thousand pounds of sable fish look very different. If you just, if you start looking at the profit margins, uh, they are very close together. And further, um, the primary purpose of that table is more comparing between uh, the different trawl strategies, just to demonstrate that the Dover Sole was the one that was closest to uh, the level of the uh, gear switching um, and probably was looking at it now I, I, if I were to do it again I probably wouldn't include the gear switching in that table just because it can be misinterpreted. All right great I imagine during council discussion we may get further into that. Um, so do you have a uh, Corey is this the, now's the time to raise issues we want the public to consider for the public comment go ahead. Um, well, it's a question for Jim response to that, but I can wait till council discussion, but I, I think I've heard in the past and maybe not in the analysis, Jim, but I, I've heard that it is net revenues are, you know, on par. So if, if that's the analysis, um, you know, my memory banks are going back many years, so I don't know where it was, if it's in the analysis now, but um, I, I, that I don't think, I don't think, well, if it's not in there now, it'd be nice to put in there for the next round. Yeah, let's put a pin in that and bring that back during discussion. It's worthy of discussion. Bill Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman, and appreciate uh, making the opportunity here to, to um, provide some comments um, and some um, a uh, proposal that I would like to um, uh, get on the table just in, in advance of the public comment time frame. Um, so if you'll uh, bear with me here for a moment, I have a few few things I want to say as a preamble to uh, putting up on the screen the, the proposal. So I, I, like many others around the table, just really appreciate all the work that's been done um, since June uh, on this topic. Um, the work that Jim and Jesse uh, have done has, has been extraordinary. Um, appreciate the work that National Marine Fisheries Service did in helping us understand the complexity uh, and costs of implementing the, the various alternatives. Um, but I've had a, uh, the privilege of having a number of conversations with a number of you around the table and some of you in the room and some that are not in the room, uh, particularly over the last month or so on this topic. And I've learned a great deal from all of those that I've talked to and uh, great, greatly appreciate the time that you uh, you gave me. 
I'm aware of the continuum. I'm calling it uh, between the alternatives and what I'll call the, uh, they're not necessarily extremes, but they're on the opposite ends of that continuum. And I'm also aware of the various um, perspectives, at least up to this point in time, of some of you around the table um, uh, relative to the options that are in, or the alternatives and sub options that are in front of us. So in consideration of, of all that, uh, the um, results of the analysis and the conversations um, that have been had around the table here as well as, as uh, outside this room, um, I attempted to, uh, to, to put together an alternative that uh, builds off and is informed uh, by what I've heard and, and learned. And it, uh, it basically utilizes alternative one in terms of the design and implementation, but draws from alternative three in terms of the qualifying criteria. Uh, the purpose and need statement was a fundamental consideration and guiding light in the construction of the alternative. And I would just uh, note a couple of excerpts from the purpose and need. Um, Participant, and this is we're coming from the purpose and need that participants engaging in gear switching are using northern sable fish quota that may otherwise be used by trawl gears. This may lead to uncertainty in the trawl access to sable fish, thereby affecting the development of markets and infrastructure. Further, it says uh, the purpose of this action would be to keep northern sable fish gear switching from impeding the attainment of northern IFQ allocations with trawl gear while considering impacts on current operations and investments. Uh, I, I, if there's one point that's kind of around um, the table and, and uh, within industry uh, that there is seems to be a consensus on, and that is the need to uh, honor you know, the current investments and um, so certainly certainly mindful of that and finally I, I was striving to develop uh, an alternative that minimized to the extent possible the disruption to the, the current fishery while at the same time provided a reasonable degree of certainty relative to sable fish availability to the trawl and the processing sectors along the west coast so with that bit of a preamble, I'll just walk through um, what I would like the uh, uh, public to, to take a look at, as well as my colleagues around the table here um, when we get to that point in our decision-making process. I tried real hard to, to not introduce new new things here, so to, to, to take things from what we have in front of us, uh, so not to, you know, just what, it'll be up to the eye of the beholder, I guess, if you think this is coming out of the right field or not, but um, so the alternative is based on alternative one, but as I said, would use the current alternative three qualification criteria uh, under option two to determine who qualifies for any gear quota share. And further, anyone that did not qualify for any gear quota share would have their quota share converted to trawl only quota share. And then the following are the specifications for the alternative. Um, so the, uh, I may have gone just a bit too far. Um, uh, the current Northern Sable fish uh, valid with use uh, with any gear uh, will be converted to trawl only quota share and the any gear uh, uh, and any gear quota share. So um, so the process there is uh, gear switching participation criteria to qualify for any gear quota share. Quota share own, owner must own a permit that landed northern stable fish quota pounds with non-trawl gear totaling at least 30,000 pounds per year in at least three of the years between the January 1, 2011 and the control date of September 15, 2017. 
and the permit must have been owned, must have been owned as of and since the control date, and only the amount of quota share owned as of that date and since the control date will be eligible for conversion to any gear quota share. So then there's the procedure. Um, so if you could scroll down a little bit for me, please. Um, um, the, the, the procedure then is that NIMS would categorize current individual owners of Sable Fish North Quota Share based on participation criteria listed above and convert uh, Quota Share based on the steps that are listed below. Uh, and the end result is that each quota share holder would receive the same percentage of the total Sable Fish Quota Pounds after the conversion that they would have if the conversion had not been carried out, except designating designated as trawl only or um, any year quota pounds. So then um, the quota share owners meeting the gear switching participation criteria will have their eligible quota shares converted to any gear quota share, uh, quota share and amounts up to the control date holdings. And then the quota share owned by those meeting the gear switching participation criteria, but in excess of what they own on the control date will be converted to trawl only quota share. And the next is the quota share owners that do not meet the gear switching criteria will have 100% of their quota share converted to trawl only quota share. And finally, the uh, AMP quota pounds will be distributed to each account as any gear and trawl only quota pounds in proportion to any gear and trawl only quota pounds. So that just means that we're gonna continue to put those AMP pounds in the mix. Um, so uh, in general, these criteria will be applied to individuals. Um, and I wanna stress here that I'm, uh, the, the collective versus individual approach, I think needs some further dialogue, but for the purposes of putting this out there, um, I, I use the individual taking into account their ownership interests and quota share accounts as reported to NIMPS. And you can read the rest of that relative to the trusts and non-governmental entities. And then finally, the accumulation limits, the existing ones, quota share control limit of 3% annual vessel use of 4.5 will continue to be applied. Um, so that's the, that's the um, uh, blend, if, if I can call it that, uh, built, primarily building off the structure of, of alternative one. Um, and I would, I think I would just uh, maybe close by saying that um, the reason I focused on alternative one was in, in was in in large part because of the implementation steps and costs, and the fact that most of those costs were one time, um, and so uh, while I think NIMPS characterized that there was a medium to high cost for initial implementation that once those steps are, are taken, <clears throat> that maintaining the program on an annualized basis uh, uh, was, uh, I can't remember what they called it, a reasonable cost or um, most of it would be automated, if you will. Um, so that was, that was of course, a, an additional uh, consideration. So the result of all this just, and we can look at the, look at the um, analysis, but it, it lands you at with 11 permits that would have um, any gear uh, quota share. Um, and I think it results in about 12.6% 12, 12 of the trawl quota share would be available to be used in a, in a uh, any gear um, application. So it's, if you look at the result of alternative three with option two, in terms of the results, um, that, that kind of gives you where this would end up. So appreciate the time that you've given me to walk through this and 
allow me to give you a little bit of the background that how I got here. Um, so I'll stop there. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks for uh, setting that before the council before public comments. So folks uh, who will be commenting will be able to take this into consideration. Um, Sandra, can we get this posted so that folks can 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 uh, look at it on their computers or their phones or wherever they're viewing documents from the council. So um, let's just see if there are any questions on what Phil Anderson has put forward, uh, keeping in mind that uh, after public comment, we'll have a chance to discuss. Corey Niles. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair, and th thank you, Phil, for that explanation. Um, and this question can wait it just came to me when you were when you were reading it, um, and I, I I think I'm grasping your combining of the approaches of uh, between alternative one and alternative three, and I'm guess I'm just wondering I don't know if anyone would be in this situation or not, but the emphasis on the owner the ownership of the permit is my it was what my question is about. For example, if you had a a, a vessel that was owned by a business, but happened to, um, you know, come in after the program or, and, and it switched out permits, you know, they would have the same level of fishing, but they, they leased the permit, um, in, instead of buying it, they would, they would have the same level of fishing, but just not that permit ownership. Um, so if, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that now. Um, but that's one, that's one question, um, that popped to mind when you're reading that and, um, can definitely, you know, if, if you had immediate thoughts, it would be great to hear them. If not, we'll have time to, uh, to think about that, of course. Thank you. Phil. Well, to the extent that I understand the question, um, this does not, this, this is a permit based approach, not a vessel based approach. It, it does not recognize um, fish that were caught with leased fish. It recognizes fish that were in a, in a gear, in a gear switching application. It recognizes fish that were owned. The quota shares were owned by the permit holder that to build, uh, to qualify under the, uh, under the criteria that's listed here. I'm not sure that got at your question, but that's, that was the basis of the, and the thought behind um, bringing this forward. Corey? Just a quick, quick elaboration. And, and yeah, just to, to put the thought out there, you can buy quota share without having a, owning a permit. Um, so you, someone could buy quota share and then lease their permit to do the fishing, but that, that was where the question was coming from, but just, yeah, putting it out there for um, uh, further thought later. Thank you. All right, let's see if there are any other questions here. Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Phil, for that proposal. It's pretty, pretty clean. Um, <clears throat> I noticed you didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, address overages nor did you address expiration? And I, did you intend to leave those out intentionally? I left expiration out intentionally. Um, the overage business just came to light here with the EC's report and stuff. And so yeah. I would need to consult with people that are smarter than me to understand whether a provision needs to be built in this proposal to accommodate that or not. So I didn't purposely um, leave it out, but um, before I would get to a point where I thought it needed to be included, I would need to consult with people that are smarter than me on that topic. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Oh, Jesse, please. I'm sorry. No worries, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to respond. So, um, no, there, there's no need to discuss overages or anything related in this alternative. And that's because the, um, 
that is only if we are using an endorsement, right? That's an endorsement. So there's no endorsements related to this. We're only using the qualification criteria from alternative three, but the mechanism to control any gear or to control gear switching would be the any gear quota share. So there's no need to discuss overages or endorsement limits or anything like that. If you're referring to like gear switching limit endorsement overages, does that clear things up? <laughs> All right. I think really we can take up any Sorry. further discussion on this at, at the time of council discussion. The main purpose here is to get this in front of the public. So the public uh, has a notion uh, so um, and can address it during their public comment. We'll, we'll have, we as a council will have an opportunity to further flesh this out when it comes time for council discussion. And, and with that, um, it's just about noon. So we will take our uh, lunch break here. We'll be back at one o'clock. Oh, Marcy, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe you started this discussion uh, prefaced by an offer to the council to provide uh, input to the public that might help them in shaping their testimony about uh, comments we might want to hear from them on the alternatives that have been presented. Am I, am I correct? That's correct. And you're welcome to do that now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, one thing that I am very uh, interested in and concerned with is the proposed alternatives as they affect California and the more southerly ports, particularly south of 4010. Um, this is not a new situation that we've identified. CDFW has raised this a number of times. Um, now with uh, the uh, gap, the trial sector recommendation, as well as the new alternative that's uh, just been proposed now, I'm very interested in testimony from our more southerly uh, participants in the IQ program. Um, we've seen a considerable contraction um, in trawl uh, effort and participation uh, in the more southerly reaches of our state. And so I'm very interested in knowing how uh, the proposal uh, would affect our um, few remaining IFQ participants in California uh, noting that many of them rely on gear switching uh, significantly for their activities and recognizing that uh, the IQ program spans all the way to the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, at least my understanding to date, uh, or at least in the discussions uh, this week, um, yes, there's been California participation in the discussions, but it's um, primarily been limited to uh, the 4010 North area surrounding Eureka. So um, the situation with the IQ fishery is dramatically different as you work further south. So I am um, very interested in, in hearing their input um, as well as acknowledging the gap uh, trawl sectors uh, identified um, rationale that um, processor capacity is important from all three states in order to better utilize our sable fish ACL. So I'm interested in hearing how the proposals would affect processor capacity, uh, acknowledging that the existing processing capacity that we have to the south isn't relying so heavily on the trawl component today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Marcy. Uh, are there any other comments that council members wish to make directed to the public to help for you know, things we wanna hear from the public? Not, not a discussion on anything that we raised here. Corey. Th thanks, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I'll try to keep it concise. Um, and to me, this uh, and, and not too dissimilar from what Marcy is um, asking about, but you know more broadly than just California, of course. But uh, as Mr. Anderson said, we've we've setting up here with a, a continuum. I think is the word he used between changing the pro restricting the program more versus less. Um, the way I read our national standard guidelines, four, five, seven, more are that the more restrictive um the changes are the more disruption it causes to to user groups the higher the benefit you know the more certain the benefit should be 
to justify that. And so I think as we've been clear, we, we, we see the, the justification for uh, freezing the footprint as you know, a possible justification there, and it becomes more questionable the more restrictive you get. So what I think we're most interested in hearing is this is an allocation decision, but it's, it's also got to be rational and, and based on analysis and facts and a theory of, of cause and effect. And so what we're hearing, what we'd like to hear is how would the council's action taken today under these um, under these alternatives first, how would they disrupt people's way of doing business now? But then what, what is the chain of cause and effect that would lead to, to the benefits that are sought? So um, I think that's the essence. Um, I think we've spoken to a lot of people about this and we're in, in the gap statement was getting to it and really appreciate that. So I think to me that that is one of the key factors and the public has information that we don't have in analysis and from their own experiences and judgment. And that, that's what I think would be very valuable to hear. So thank you. All right, thank you, Corey. Corey, writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of information that I think the public could share with the council that would be useful is that in all of the documentation provided as thorough and as well provided as we have heard it, I, I feel that there is a lack of information about the impact on communities. And to the extent that our public commenters um, are willing and wanting to provide information on how they see that, I would appreciate it. All right, thank you. All right, I think that we have posed the number of questions to the public. I wanna give them a chance to consider it. So as I said earlier, after break, we're gonna to come to um, H4 and then we'll come back to public comment. Um, I will again repeat that we have um, a lot of folks signed up for public comment, so the time will be reduced. And so don't count on 10 minutes for groups or five minutes for individuals. Unfortunately, we just have to get through this agenda item and when we have this many folks signed up for public comment, that's just something we have to do. All right, so um, it is now a few minutes past uh, noon. Uh, I would still like to be back at one o'clock. Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, met, <clears throat> you mentioned about reducing public comment. Do you have an idea of how much it will be reduced so people can uh, adjust their testimony to get to the points they want to? Uh, I don't because it's the portal is still open, so I don't know how many public comments we will have. I will say in the past, we have gone to six for groups and three for individuals, but I'm not saying that's what it's going to be this time. I need to see what we have signed up. Oh, I, I assumed it was closed after the, the reports. Oh, usually, well, we can close it. Um, I think we, we talked about leaving it open until we started public comment. Um, Merrick? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my advice, just as we move forward, since we have just asked the public to consider several new uh, ideas as well as a new alternative, that we leave this public comment portal open until we actually start public comment. It's usually our practice to keep it open until comment starts. So that's what I would suggest we continue to do here. And that would allow us to go through the next agenda item and come back in case there are any other additional folks that want to provide comment that have been motivated by the comments of the council here for the last few minutes. All right, and just to give you an idea, we're nearly four hours into a four hour agenda item. And um, while it will continue on Monday, uh, the point today was to get through public comment. So um, that's the reason. <laughs> All right, we'll see everyone back here at one o'clock.
This is a microphone check-in. Mr. Check, all right. Thank you.
All right, if we could uh, find our seats. We'll move on. <clears throat> All right, welcome back from lunch. Hope people didn't eat so quickly they got indigestion. We'll move on now to agenda H4. I'll pass the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Grolick. And uh, John, I'll look to you to get us started here on H4. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. Agenda item H4 concerns uh, methodology review, uh, specifically ground fish methodology review, um, with a decision to um, consider final uh, impact model um, methodology review topics for uh, formal review next year, and to adopt uh, those methodologies that have undergone review this year um, and are recommended by the SSC. So to um, support your decision on those two tasks, we have um, beyond what was in the advanced briefing book, we've got a, a, a few supplemental uh, reports. Um, the first one is the supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 1 which uh, basically just provides a little bit of uh, information on uh, the aging and data coordination meeting uh, that was held uh, via webinar uh, in August of this year to prepare for next year's assessments. There's no action associated with that, but it's an FYI uh, type of uh, report. Um, the second supplemental report is uh, Supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 2, which um, provides uh, a lot of information on the review of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife Video Hydroacoustic Survey uh, methodology review. And uh, also at that meeting, uh, we had a, a workshop to um, look at the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife hook and line surveys that they have um, and uh, the uh, SSC report, which I'll mention in a minute, um, provides their recommendations based on that review. Um, additionally, we have a supplemental GMT report one, which provides um, a, a, a lot of the information um, regarding uh, groundfish discard mortality rates. Uh, the council tasked the GMT to um, consider some uh, new discard mortality rates going forward. And um, uh, we've scheduled actually a couple of reviews uh, to get to this point. Um, this SSC and GMT um, work through uh, this methodology in September. And, um, and the SSC at that time requested some uh, further analysis. So uh, the GMT responded with supplemental GMT report uh, two, which really answers some of the outstanding questions from the September review. So uh, both of these supplemental GMT reports were used uh, to um, complete the review at this meeting of the disc, uh, groundfish discard mortality rates. Uh, the methodologies to um, inform those rates uh, that the GMT produced and uh, both the SSC and GMT provide uh, feedback on, on that review. Um, the, and then we have uh, a supplemental uh, SSC report which has uh, their observations and recommendations on all of these methodology review topics, um, including um, the 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 um, civil fish trip limit model, which uh, was under consideration for a formal review uh, next year, and the GMT supplemental GMT report three uh, also um, provides uh, their their uh, comments on that. So um, specifically um, beyond the um, civil fish trip limit model uh, review next year that uh, was recommended in September and you'll see recommendations for that review in both the SSC and GMT reports. Um, we have the, um, uh, the 
the ODF and W visual acoustic survey uh, methodology for you to consider adopting uh, based on the SSC recommendations and uh, the ground fish discard mortality rate uh, methodologies that uh, the GMT produced. And you'll see uh, specific recommendations on their use uh, by both those bodies. That uh, completes my agenda item overview. If there are any questions to me on the process, um, I'm happy to take them. If not, I recommend uh, that you take up the SSC report next. Very good, John. Uh, questions for John on his overview? Okay, seeing that, with that, we'll do Dr. Dan Holland. Dan? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC. And I will read uh, into the record agenda item H4A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, uh, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on methodology review, final fishery impact model topics, and final assessment methodologies. <clears throat> Dr. John Brudrick, CDFW, briefed the Scientific and Statistical Committee on the ground fish subcommittee reports from two subcommittee meetings conducted during summer of 2022 for aging coordination and for the methodology review of the Oregon Department of Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, ODFW video hydroacoustic survey for semi-pelagic rockfish. Dr. Owen Hamel, Northwest Fishery Science Center, spoke to the ground fish subcommittee report on the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, WDFW's hook and line surveys. And Dr. Chantel Wetzel, Northwest Fishery Science Center, briefed the SSC on the updated analysis for estimating discard mortality when descending devices are used and the ground fish management team, GMT's associated responses to the SSC's request from the, uh, from the September meeting as well. On aging coordination, to inform the 2023 ground fish stock assessments, the SSC ground fish subcommittee met to coordinate aging tasks and identify data sources among the state and federal agencies that conduct biological sampling along the US West Coast. The SSD finds the meeting productive and commends the collaborative efforts. On the ODFD, ODFW video hydroacoustic survey review, ODFW's video hydroacoustic sur survey has three components, a hydroacoustic survey, a stereo camera video survey, and a hook and line survey. The video survey components provide information on species composition and link frequency dis distributions. The ODFW hook and line survey complements these efforts by collecting biological samples for length weight relationships and growth curves. And biomass estimates were derived by combining information collected from these three components. Oceanographic data were also collected during the survey and were used as covariates in the model-based estimation method. The SSC agrees with the issues identified by the review panel and supports the research and data needs highlighted in the Groundfish Subcommittee report. The two main concerns raised during the review were the relationship between acoustic target strength and fish density and the large discrepancy, discrepancy between the design and the model-based estimates of biomass. The target strength models used in the ODFW report were from studies conducted in other regions and on various rockfish species. More research is needed to estimate species-specific target strengths for rockfish and other species of interest. There is a need for in-situ calibration of acoustic systems in deep semi-protected waters such as Puget Sound and Monterey Bay. Large discrepancies in the biomass estimate, estimates between the design and model-based approaches were observed. The design-based estimates of population size in numbers and biomass were derived using acoustic data on schools and single targets, along with video counts and length estimates by species. Model-based estimates were derived from each species by fitting spatiotemporal hurdle models. Model-based estimates were almost double the design-based estimates for black and blue and blue deacon rockfish, but the CVs were substantially lower. Further <clears throat> exploration is needed to understand these differences before the model-based estimates can be used in assessments. 
Despite the unresolved issues and further development needed, the SSE commends the ODFW staff for their hard work and finds the first year survey a good start. The design-based biomass estimate can be used in the 2023 black rockfish assessment with caution, for example, by providing a prior unstock size or as an absolute biomass estimate in a sensitivity analysis. This survey can be valuable in generating an index of relative abundance in the future, regardless of its uncertainty as an absolute ab abundance estimate. On the WDFW hook and line survey workshop, WDFW conducts two types of hook and line surveys, the rod and reel survey for nearshore ground fish species and the set line survey for yellow eye rockfish. The rod and reel survey is conducted in spring for semi-pelagic species and in fall for demersal species. The yellow eye set line survey expands the IEPHC set line survey for, by adding eight fixed stations and high yellow eye catch locations. The goal of the set line survey was to construct a Washington specific yellow eye abundance index. The SSE agrees with the subcommittee's recommendation to reduce the number of drifts per site and eliminate two sites in Marine Area 1 in the Rod and Reel Nearshore Survey, and to increase the number of sites elsewhere as feasible. The SSE also agrees that the WDFW yellow eye stations to supplement the IPHC set line survey are not informative for yellow eye rockfish abundance given their high CV. An exploration of other ways to obtain information for yellow eye rockfish such as exploring deeper depths greater than 40 fathoms in the demersal rod and reel survey may be warranted. On the generalized discard mortality rates reflecting the use of descending devices for rock fishes. Revisions were made in the updated report in response to SSC feedback in September. The SSC endorses the updated analysis for developing discard mortality rates reflecting the use of descending devices. The SSC recommends using species specific estimates when there, when there are adequate sample sizes and using guild specific estimates when observations are lacking or sparse. The SSC notes that the selection of upper quantiles from mortality estimates is a policy decision. The SSC thanks the methodology review panels and workshop participants for their time and thoughtful inf input. The SSC thanks the GMT for their work on the discard mortality rate analysis. And the SSE also endorses a methodology review for the revised Sablefish trip limit model in 2023. That concludes the SSE report, and I'd be happy to take questions. And I'll also note that uh, Dr. John Budrick is also, I think, on the line. So if you have really hard questions uh, that are on the specifics, hopefully he can answer those. Fantastic. Okay. Um, questions on the uh, SSE report? RC Repco. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Holland. I was wondering if um, your you reference the aging coordination meeting in your report, and then we also have in the materials um, the supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report One. Um, are you um, are you presenting that report separately or? Are you taking questions on that report? Um, well, we're not presenting that report separately. Um, can take questions on that. Um, I think I would try and defer um, defer that to uh, um, Dr. Budrick, if possible. Yeah. Thank, thank John, you John, are you there? Hello. Yes, I am here. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, my question pertains to, uh, so this, this report um, describes a meeting that was held um, two months ago with regard to plans for uh, aging prioritization and conducting the aging work that would be used to inform the 2023 mm. stock assessments. <clears throat> Um, the information presented here is dated, and I was looking to receive some sort of update on the plans that are outlined um, in the report, uh, specifically if um, NOAA Fisheries is on track with um, the plan outlined at the bottom of page one, uh, particularly for the aging work that is slated to be conducted uh, 
by um, the Northwest Center's uh, aging lab. Um, there's a kind of a laundry list of, of um, species and tasks on the plate. And I'm just looking for some assurance that we're on track with those um, as they're incredibly significant to the quantity and quality of data that um, is expected to be included in the assessment. So I was just hoping for an update. I don't know if Dr. Budrick is the right person to confirm that we're on track or not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank oh. you, Mr. Mironko, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, the best person to respond to that would be Jim Hasty, who's the, the current keeper of the list of um, master list of all the otoliths that are available and they're they're processing. Um, if he is available, I would defer to him. Okay, I don't think he's online right now. Mm. So maybe we get him back on later here during this session. Marcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. That's fine and, and happy to connect with him offline. Um, I just bring it to your attention because uh, this meeting was a source of discussion actually during our September council meeting. CDFW submitted a supplemental report back in September in response to this meeting. Um, so we're just getting the minutes from this meeting now and um, we did not receive you know, a presentation or had much discussion on the topic of aging uh, around the council table. And I just want to highlight that there are a number of plans uh, and expectations in the works and just looking for an update on the progress. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Okay, further questions for the SSC? Okay, well, thank you. Um, we'll move on next to the uh, GMT report. Thank you. And Lynn Mattis. Thank you. Oh, good job. Okay. And I'm sure Craig approves that I don't have my mask on for the audio. <laughs> Um, so we have two supplemental reports that have been in the briefing book for, uh, they didn't quite make the original briefing book deadline, but they have been available online for about 10 days or so. To save all of you and me, I was not planning on reading them. Um, the first one is 48 pages and it is set up like a, more like a scientific article um, describing the methods, the results, and the discussion about what, what we did. If you have specific questions on those, I may have to defer to Dr. Wetzel, who unfortunately is on an airplane headed home right now, so we may not be able to address the specific questions, but we, I'll do my best. The second supplemental report is, as uh, Mr. DeVore said, our response, um, similar to like what a star panel does, response to the specific request from the SSC, how we, how we address those. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions on either of those two. I don't know that if I will be able to answer them, but I wanted to pause there to see if there were. Okay, questions for Lynn on the, those reports? Thank you. I, thank you, good. <laughs> the supplemental report three uh, became available yesterday afternoon. Um, so over the course of the last several months, members of the GMT have been working on developing mortality rates for additional species when descending devices are used. Additionally, the council is tasked at this meeting with considering final selection of any impact projection methodologies to be reviewed in 2023. This report summarizes our discussion and recommendations on those two topics. On the mortality rates for additional species when descending devices are used. Since June, members of the GMT, led by Dr. Wetzel from the NIMS Northwest Science Center, have been working to develop depth-dependent discard mortality rates for rockfish species. And I would be remiss if I did not also acknowledge Dr. John Budrick from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, who helped, helped combine all the information we had from when we previously looked at this in 2014 and got us started so we didn't have to start from a reinvent the wheel. So special thanks to Dr. Budrick. Currently, based on a similar analysis conducted by the GMT in 2014, four, there's an error there that should say four instead of three, species-specific cumulative discard mortality 
I'm sorry, let me start over. Currently based on a similar analysis conducted in by the GMT in 2014, three species specific cumulative discard mortality rates for canary yellow eye and cow cod are currently used to modify discard mortality based on the use of descending devices for recreational fish, no fisheries. The work we've been doing updates and expands the 2015 approach to provide updated estimates for canary rockfish, yellow eye rockfish and cow cod rockfish, along with estimates for other rockfish species within the groundfish FMP. Dr. Wessel provided a draft report with a proposed methodology and model estimates to the SSC back in September. And as I mentioned, our supplemental report one is the updated analysis and report two is our response to the SSC. The team as a whole reviewed and discussed the methodology and estimates presented uh, in that in report one. The expanded data set used in this new analysis includes observations from 22 rockfish species. However, there was not sufficient observations for all 22 species to support the development of species specific discard rates across a range of depth bins. Given this, the analysis outlined two possible applications for the estimated discard mortality rates. One, apply yield based mortality estimates for demersal, pelagic, and dwarf rockfish species, and apply species specific rates for select species identified to have sample sizes sufficient to inform the mortality rates by depth bin. The analysis provides summarizes the estimated discard mortality distribution based on, based on five pre-specified percentiles for consideration, the 50th, 60th, 70th, 80th, and 90th, combined with the following guidance on how these percentiles should be used. The general interpretation of selected percentile is the percentage of values that would be expected to be less than the given value. For example, 80% of outcomes or observations would be expected to be less than the 80th percentile value. In the context of this analysis, the discard mortality associated with the 80th percentile for the posterior prediction would be that 80% of discard mortality values would actually fall below the given value based on available data. The selection of a percentile is in considered a management or policy decision. In 2014, the council selected the 90th percentile for canary, cow cod, and yellow eye for all depth bins. However, the 2014 analysis incorrectly referred to the percentiles as upper confidence intervals. We would like to note that the upper confidence intervals and pre percentiles present, represent different levels of uncertainty. For an example, an upper confidence interval of 90% would align with the 80th percentile rather than the 90th percentile. And I please hope you don't ask me any questions about that, what, that piece. The selected percentile from the, the estimated discard mortality is then used to determine the final cumulative mortality rate, which will be the value applied to determine discard mortality with the use of descending devices for the recreational fishery. The updated analysis provides a simplified approach relative to the methodology applied in 2014, which was driven by the additional data available. The updated analysis, given the additional data, suggests that the specification of the cumulative mortality can be set either set equal to a selected percentile alone or combined with an additional mortality component if the selection of a percentile is considered not sufficiently precautionary for a gilder species. After considering all of this, the GMT recommends adopting updated species specific rates for canary rockfish, cow cod, and yellow eye rockfish and new species specific rates for black rockfish. For all other species, the GMT recommends adopting guild based rates for demersal, pelagic, and dwarf rockfishes. Finally, we recommend setting a cumulative mortality rate equal to the 80th percentile. The current estimates are based on a much larger data set, including a wider range of species compared to the data available in 2014 and therefore are likely more representative of the discard mortality across a larger suite of rockfish species compared to the previous estimates. Given this, the GMT thinks the 80th percentile represents a reasonable level of precaution. Additionally, selecting the 90th percentile resulted in some instances where the discard mortality using a descending device were actually higher than the surface rates, which seemed implausible. This behavior often, was often the result of a distribution with a longer upper tail that resulted in estimates of the 90th percentiles that were considerably higher than other estimated percentiles. We note that the selection of 
any percentile greater than 50% provides an additional buffer to account for uncertainty around discard rates. And therefore, the 80th percentile provides a reasonable, reasonable level of precaution. Based on the above, we recommend the following species-specific depth-based cumulative mortality rates when descending devices are used. That's in table one. And table two has the guild-based rates for all other species. And the species that would be subject to the guild-based rates are in table three. The values in table one within the 10, zero to 10 fathom bin were set equal to the surface release discard mortality rate if it was less than the cumulative discard mortality rate in the 10 to 30 fathom bin. However, if the cumulative discard mortality rate with the use of a descending device from the 10 to 30 fathom bin was less than the estimated surface release mortality rate for the zero to 10 fathom bin, the rate was based on the estimated discard rate with the descending devices. Additionally, if a species-specific discard mortality rate when using a descending device was not available for a specific depth bin, or the species-specific rate was identified to have a minimal effect size relative to the corresponding guild-based estimates, the value is based on the corresponding guild-based estimate. An example of this is CalCOD in the 10 to 30 and 50 to 100 fathom bins. Finally, the cumulative discard mortality rate for the 100 plus fathom bin was set equal to 100% based on surface mortality rates. And just for your reference, we have a table of the surface rates as, a, as Appendix A. And this is since the updated analysis did not include this depth bin given the lack of data there. Special consideration was given when determining the rate for use of black rockfish in the 50 to 100 fathom depth bin. Black rockfish is a pelagic species and was only observed between 10 and 50 fathoms in the new analysis. In lieu of a species-specific rate, the pelagic guild-based estimate of 92% mortality for the 50 to 100 fathom depth bin was, was considered. However, this value exceeded the blackfish surface mortality rate for this depth range. Based on the same logic applied in the zero to 10 fathom bin, the cumulative rate was set in the 50 to 100 fathom bin was set equal to the surface mortality rate of 63 fathom, or 63%. Then we've got tables one, two, and three. Uh, and again, for reference, the adopted surface mortality rates are provided in Appendix A to highlight the potential differences between the new estimated rates and the use of descending devices. On to updating the Sablefish trip limit model. In September 2022, the Council preliminarily chose to conduct a methodology review of the Sablefish trip limit model in 2023 due to unrealistic output projections identified by the GMT, the suspected, suspected cause of which is described in a September report. For reference, issues with the model and associated adjustments made in September are described in more detail in Appendix B, along with the other model revisions to potentially investigate during this model review. We recommend making a final selection of the STL model for full methodology review in 2023. And again, Appendix A has the surface rates, and then Appendix B has some additional information on potential future revisions to the Sablefish trip limit model. And with that, um, I will try to answer any questions on the discard mortality rates. And if there's questions on the Sablefish model, um, my cohort here will try to help with that. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Questions on the GMT report for Lynn or Whitney? Hey, they're all. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you, uh, Lynn, and thank you, Whitney. I just want to, I don't have a specific question. I just want to um, offer my appreciation for the work that the GMT did uh, with Dr. Wetzel. And I know this was kind of a side project that a lot of you worked on, or maybe just a few of you worked on uh, to bring these um, updated mortality rates uh, back to the council to look at and, and approve. So it's, thanks for that. Vice Chair, Ms. Hall, thank you. Uh, and, and again, I can't stress enough how vital Dr. Wetzel was to this process. And I, hopefully her supervisors have heard this and are listening. Um, <laughs> I, I can't thank Chantel enough for all the work she did on this. Okay, thank you, Heather. Questions for the GMT? Okay. I don't see any hands, so thanks for all your good, good work there. Okay, and I think that takes care of the management teams and um, advisory bodies. 
So it takes the public comment. I think there's six cards in place, I believe. And there they are. Very good. And so uh, with that, we will start off with uh, Captain William Smith, followed by Ken Frankie. So is, uh, is William Smith online or is he in the room? If not, we'll go with uh, Mr. Frankie. And it'll be followed by Jamie Diamond. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair Penninger and uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Ken Frankie speaking on behalf of the Sport Fishing Association of California, reference agenda item H4. Our membership includes the majority of the commercial passenger fishing vessels in Southern California. In this season, 2022, California recreational anglers and charter operators have endeavored to both release copper and quillback rockfish using descending devices and avoid them in general. In fact, our charter fleet has released almost all coppers caught aboard our vessels, except those set aside for sampling efforts. This is an effort to voluntarily hold our recreational catches below their 2023 total allowable catch within our existing 2022 season structure. We're very pleased to uh, preliminary results have already shown the effectiveness of this effort. I'm serious, it was a huge effort by the recreational and the commercial passenger fishing vessel uh, folks. The, the current uh, trajectory holds our 2022 catches under the 2023 tack. In addition, we'd like to express our appreciation for the efforts of the GMT in general, and in particular, Dr. Chantel Wetzel in their work on updated mortality tables. We are hopeful these results will support the use of descending devices as a powerful conservation measure, illuminating higher levels of post-release survivorship, and lower fishing, uh, fishing mortality. We support the use of the 80th percentile as presented in the figures within the September 2022 PFMC meeting briefing book, agenda item H4A, supplemental GMT report one. It offers excellent precaution that the actual level of survivorship estimated by the 50th percentile will lie below the modeled 80th percentile. We think using a higher level would be excessively pessimistic. Our overarching objective is to have in-season management measures established, which would return public access to other important ground fish species lost in the 2023-2024 specs package. We desire this to occur as early as possible in the biennium. Our goal is to add additional time on the water to our currently restricted all depth season, extend it into the fall of 2023, when otherwise the inshore waters would be closed. Thank you and I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you, Ken. Um, questions uh, on his testimony? Okay, thank you. Okay, next up will be um, Jamie Diamond, followed by uh, Wayne Coto. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Penninger, Chair Grelnick, Council and staff. I am Jamie Diamond, owner of Stardust Sport Fishing in Santa Barbara, California. With respect to the updated table of mortality rates with the use of descending devices, I ask you adopt the GMT recommendations outlined in GMT Report H4A, Supplemental GMT Report 3. Specifically, adopt updated species-specific rates for canary rockfish, cow cod, and yellow eye rockfish, and new species-specific rates for black rockfish. For all their other species, adopting the guild base rates for demersal, pelagic, and dwarf rockfishes, as outlined in Table 1 and 2. Finally, setting the cumulative mortality rate equal to the 80th percentile. I would like to offer my sincerest gratitude to the GMT, especially Dr. Chantal Wetzel, for the huge undertaking and workload that was associated with this project and offer any assistance the sport fishing fleet can to continue filling in any ongoing data needs in the science team. In regards to aging and data prep for upcoming stock assessments, I would like to quote um, Melissa Monk from NIMS, who's doing copper rockfish assessment currently. She sent a summary of the current sampling project status and next steps. Um, project goals to collect information on copper rockfish and quillback in cooperation with 
the sport fishing fleet to inform stock assessments and management. Ages have not been available in recent history from the California Recreational Fleet for inclusion in fishery stock assessments. Key information collected, uh, vessel crew measures whole fish length, records species and date of capture, fish are frozen and overnighted to Santa Cruz where staff extract otoliths for at late age at length, take fin clips for genetic research, record sex and maturity stage. The, product, the project launched in late 22 and has already sampled and processed over 602 fish. Uh, project funding has come from the Southwest Fisheries Cooperative Research Funds and NIMPS Headquarters Recfish Initiative, and we're very appreciative of that. Next steps, the copper otoliths will be aged in early 2023 for the 23 full stock assessment. The ages will inform both at age at length and the age structure of fish caught in the recreational CPFV fleet. They will be able to look at growth by sex and latitude, meaning north and south of Point Conception. This winter, early spring, in collaboration with SAC, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, will charter vessels to collect data on copper rockfish maturity and fecundity along the entire California coast. Other winter spawning rockfish will also be collected. Quillback rockfish spawn during the summer months, and they will focus their effort on maturity and fecundity research during the summers of 23 and 24. Depending on available funding, the program will expand to include additional vessels and species for the 2023 California sport fishing season. Um, I'm honored to be part of this program myself and my vessels um, and my passengers. And I spoke to that before getting the public buy-in on what we do. So I just want to say thank you for your time and I will take any questions. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, questions for Jamie on her testimony? Oh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, thanks, Ken, for your testimony. Um, this is just... Um, a model of how we can have partnerships between professional fishery managers, science centers, and the industry. Um, and um, I'm just, I'm really, really impressed by the coordination and collaboration and the strategic thinking about how to attack this very real problem. Um, so just um, wanted to say that, wanted to express my appreciation to you and Ken and, and everybody involved in the sport fishing industry uh, in Southern California who really stepped up to the plate here, um, despite uh, probably some of the um, um, apprehensions that you may have had as to how well it would work and how well a partnership like this would work. But um, uh, it, it, uh, it's very impressive, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we definitely wanted to be part of the solution, not just somebody bringing a problem to the table and telling you to figure it out. Um, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with Melissa Monk, who unfortunately was ill and couldn't make it here. I had sick kids and all that. So she was planning on coming. But um, so, yeah, it's it's been a, a, a really great time working with them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Further uh, questions? Jamie, it's really outstanding work. I mean, like Phil speaks for all of us, just crazy good. It really is. Thank you. Thank you. Wayne Goto. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger, Chair Gorelnik, and uh, council members and staff. Wayne Cotto with the uh, Coastal Conservation Association of California, representing the recreational angling community. We, again, have been on a campaign to have our anglers avoid copper and quillbacks this year, and so far, the estimates prove that we can and are willing to be the conservationists that we claim we, we can be. We take our fisheries management seriously for our future anglers, even when we may not agree on how we got here. We can't thank Dr. Chantel Wetzel, the GMT, and the SSC enough for their efforts to update the mortality tables and believe the 80% is correct, uh, the correct action at this time. Use of de descending devices are a must and an honest reflection of the results need to be rewarded. We are leading the nation in these efforts and need to continue to do so. We are working hard along with all of our fishing partners to get the missing data collected and hopefully analyzed quickly so we can have a potentially regain our mid-season access for our anglers. 
Thank you for your continued support and our, uh, for our actions and look forward to positive results and other areas that the recreational angling community can help with future studies regarding descending devices, aging data, and stock assessments. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Questions for Wayne? Okay, very good. Next up is uh, Merritt McRae, followed by uh, Tim Clausen. Merritt. Good afternoon, Vice Chair Pettinger, Council members and staff. I'm Merritt McRae and I'm uh, the GAP res uh, representative for the Southern California, Southern California Charter Fleet. I appreciate and thank the GMT for their effort in developing a broadly applicable guild-based set of rockfish mortality tables in the context of descending device use. In particular, I think, uh, wish to thank Chantel Wetzel for her uh, work on this, and she really took the ball and ran with it and, and did so early. It's very, very much appreciated. I strongly encourage the council to adapt, adopt these um, ascending device-based mortality tables for use in management. Importantly, I support the use of the 80th percentile as a conserv conservative marker. It assumes the actual discard mortality will fall below 80% of the estimated mortality values um, obtained in the modeling of uh, mortality data. It is well above the median value obtained providing a substantial buffer considering the observed uncertainty. I and stakeholders in the audience at the GAP further support uh, moving forward and applying the resultant mortality estimates to the catch in 2022 as soon as the information is available. We thank and encourage the GMT and others for their prioritizing the availability of this information to the council and managers. California recreational constituents are hopeful these results will continue to reflect the success of the ongoing voluntary efforts to avoid both copper and quillback rockfish and successfully release to depth nearly all copper and quillback rockfish caught in, the, in this year, 2022, under the current season structure. Their objective is to hold fishing mortality of these fish below their TAC within the 2023-2024 specs. We hope to have in-season action to extend our all-depth access in 2023 beyond the currently that currently specified in 2023-2024 management measures on the basis that the TAC will not be exceeded. Thus, this action would need to be completed no later than the June 2023 meeting. Further, I was impressed with the efforts of the ODFNW and WDFNW um, and encourage staff to investigate what similar data, this is the hook, their hook and line data and their um, underwater video data, what similar data is available in California with an eye to potential use in forming stock assessment efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Merritt. Questions for Merritt on his testimony? Okay, thanks, Thank Merritt. Thank you. Be back. Next up is Tim, Tim Clausen. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger, uh, Council. Uh, my name is Tim Clausen. I'm representing the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association out of San Francisco. Uh, the GGFA has long supported the use of descending devices by the charter fleet and has, in fact, distributed descending devices for the use of their membership. We support the use of guild specific depth dependent mortality rates based on the 80th percentile for the GMT supplemental report three, when species specific data is insufficient or does not exist. And we're also hoping we get more species specific data at some point. Um, the GGFA also supports the use of the charter fleet to collect data to provide age structures for growth estimates and future stock assessments. We believe that this collaborative approach helps to educate fishermen while collecting valuable data. That's all I have. Thanks, Tim. Uh, questions for Tim? I'm not seeing any hands, so okay. thank you. All right, well, let's go back to, uh, see if Will, uh, Will Smith is there. I don't see him on the, 
Nope, he's not there. Okay, we gave an honest effort there. So, all right, well, that'll take us to uh, council action, which is before you. So uh, I'll open the floor up for discussion. Heather Hall. Sure, thank you, Vice Chair. I'll just um, get the discussion started here and, and maybe uh, uh, restate my appreciation for the work on the discard mortality rates. I, I think um, the GMT with uh, Dr. Wetzel's help did a really good job and I think we have a uh, good options to look at here. Um, appreciate the public comment on the citizen science and cooperative effort to get good data to support our stock assessments. Um, appreciate the work that was done um, on the model reviews here for the ODFW hydroacoustic survey and just wanted to mention here a little bit on the WDFW hook and line survey workshop. I think there was some really good um, feedback that WDFW learned through that workshop and improving our hook and line surveys. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Marcy Rivko. Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. I go ahead and um, offer discussion here, noting that I, we will have some motions at the end to, to wrap this up. But um, just wanted to speak to the work of the uh, depth dependent mortality rates for and the new species that are being added um, through the guilds. Um, we've had a lot of discussion and uh, copious reports in the record about the uh, new information that uh, now is incorporated into the recommended rates um, that will update the information that's been in use uh, since 2014. Um, there were four new barotrauma studies that helped inform this updated analysis, and those studies covered 22 species, which is far more than um, what was used back in the 2014 analysis. Um, I think we can, um, while this, this, uh, the outcome, you know, makes some, some improvements, certainly, um, we need to keep in mind that this is not a, uh, a solution in, to completely eliminating our um, release mortality, but it certainly makes us feel better that the efforts um, to release fish are quantified appropriately in our calculations um, of our recreational catch estimates. Um, on that point, just want to note that the uh, the states have been talking in sidebar about our plans for how we will incorporate the council's recommendations to modify the um, the mortality rates in use today. It's it's a complicated process. I know on our end in California, we when we produce our recreational catch estimates each month, um, the basically it's a series of programs and the mortality rates are kind of baked into how we do those calculations each month. And so um, once we receive, um, or once we take action here today, we'll be bringing um, these revisions back into our state arena and working with our uh, data folks and our um, database uh, managers to incorporate the rates and apply uh, the three new guilds um, into the estimates that we make each month. So there's still some work on the, the back end to get this done, but uh, we're hopeful that uh, we'll be able to incorporate all of the, um, all of the database changes um, in time to when we finalize our 2022 catch estimates that will have gone back and, and revised our estimates for the month of January 2022 forward so that in fact this this new information will apply uh, to the year in total in 2022 and then of course we'll also be applying the new rates forward into 2023. Um, I also want to acknowledge that it you know at the base of this is the information that our uh, recreational um, fish samplers collect at the docks when they're conducting interviews of anglers and whether a descending device was used. 
Um, that information is, you know, part of our ongoing uh, survey. And we, you know, certainly appreciate anglers taking the time to uh, report those occurrences of descending device use to us. Um, so uh, that's, you know, that's an important element. We're talking about the citizen science piece, but I didn't want to overlook that really critical element that's involved in how we calculate the savings that should accrue from the use of descending devices. It's, it's by uh, folks cooperating with the surveys and taking the time to participate in them. Um, the methods, uh, again, I appreciate the SSC's work and the time that they spent uh, in their discussion and their review of the methods. Um, and I think this is a, a, a great improvement and just want to thank everyone again. Thank you, Marty. Jessica, was it? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I just want to expand a bit from an organ perspective on Marcy's comments, as well as echo my appreciation to the GMT members and Dr. Chantal Wetzel on, on the work here on these descending device mortality rates. At ODFW, we will be, after this action, we will be working on coordinating with our ORBS dockside sampling program as well um, to gain the information needed on these species and guilds so that that can be used in the management uh, for 2023 and incorporate them into our estimates on the back end, like Marcy mentioned, of incorporating those into how we do our projections and estimates for the season. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Further discussion? Motion. Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sandra, I believe you have a motion. Thank you. I move the council adopt the following mortality rates when descending devices are used as recommended by the GMT in agenda item H4A supplemental GMT report three, November, 2022. Number one, the updated species specific rates for canary rockfish, cow cod, and yellow eye rockfish, and new species specific rates for black rockfish. Number two, for all other species, adopt the GMT recommended guild based rates for demersal, pelagic, and dwarf rockfishes. Number three, the GMT recommended cumulative mortality rate equal to the 80th percentile. Additionally, adopt the 2023 Sablefish Trip Limit Model Review as described by the GMT in Agenda Item H4A Supplemental GMT Report 3, November 2022. Thank you, Marcy. Is the language on the screen accurate? Yes, it is. For a second. Seconded by Chair Gorelnik. Please speak to your motion. Well, I think I already did. Um, but just to refresh, uh, we have been using species-specific rates for canary, cow cod, and yellow eye um, since 2014, and now we're adding black rockfish as a species for which we have specific information. Um, the other species will be included in one of three guilds. Uh, I appreciate the hard look at what species belong in what guilds. I know there were some changes made um, to some of the previous determinations of, of species that were um, in the pelagic guild and moved to demersal and what have you. So I know that um, that was a focus of uh, the SSCs and the subgroup working on the analysis. So appreciate that so that the guilds are appropriate for the species. Um, and then regarding the cumulative mortality rate equal to the 80th percentile, um, I asked this morning in delegation, well, what's the reason for the change from the, the 90th to the, the 80th? And um, I, I thought, um, the response was uh, I'm, that we have new information. This is our second go at it. We have more to draw upon. And so there's all the all, all good reason to be more confident in the outcome this time around, especially noting they're, they're using the same methodologies. Um, so this is just a second look at it, and now we're more confident because we have more data added. Um, regarding the limit model review that's described, um, this is something that the uh, 
the council and the GMT um, and all of us rely on at every meeting in our in-season actions. Um, sable fish is a highly attained species in most sectors and improving that model is certainly in the best interest of all sectors and um, will aid us in our decisions under in season so that we achieve harvest limits without exceeding exceeding them. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. For the discussion or questions for the motion maker? Not see any, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those nay. Aye. Abstentions? Okay, motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Marcy. Good job. So, Jessica? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I also have a motion. I move the council adopt the SSC recommendation in supplemental SSC report one to use the ODFW video hydroacoustic survey design based biomass estimate in the 2023 Black Rockfish assessment. Thank you, Jessica. Is the language on the screen accurate? It is. For a second. Second by Heather Hall. Thank you, Heather. Um, please speak to your motion. Yeah, I want to echo the SSC's commendations to our ODFW staff on their hard work to not only conduct, analyze, but synthesize this information included for this methodological review. It was no small task given the extent of this statewide survey. Um, in general, the lack of fishery independent survey data on nearshore rockfish species continues to be a problem for their sustainable management, and that's what we continue to hear during some of these discussions. Um, even though some of these species are, are cornerstones to the fisheries and are both ecologically and economically important, um, specifically for Oregon, this is the case for the semi-pelagic species like black, blue, and deacon rockfish. Uh, and are, they're so vitally important, not only for our recreational, but our um, nearshore commercial fisheries as well. This project really provides a fishery independent population estimate for black rockfish in the state of Oregon. and fills in some vital information to help inform the gaps in the knowledge that were identified in the last assessment. And we hope that with future funding, we can continue this survey and help refine the model-based approach in the future. Very good. Thank you, Jessica. Um, questions for Jessica on our motion? I'll see a hand. We'll call for the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Abstentions? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Jessica. Okay. Any further discussion here for you? Marcy? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Reister. Before we leave this one, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, but um, we will work uh, sometime over winter to try to update our CDFW web pages with information on barotrauma. One of the key um, needs that we have is to keep our information current on the rates. And we, we get questions from constituents quite frequently about how, um, how they can help and how they can minimize uh, discard mortality. And we have, we have a barotrauma webpage, um, but in response to this, uh, this new recommendation today, we'll be working to update that over winter um, so that we can get the word out and, and do a little better to actually show folks numerically how the new rates are incorporated and how their efforts uh, as individuals uh, to release fish on the water, how that plays out in terms of the, the mortality estimates that um, drive our, our fishery management. So that is a priority for us. Um, it's, it's on our list. We're, uh, we're, we're making progress, but we're uh, got some, some work ahead of us. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Marcy. And with that, I'll turn to John to see how we're doing here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, Council Members. You've done a very good job here and completed your tasks at this meeting. You've uh, adopted uh, the review of the proposed sable fish trip limit model as recommended by the GMT and SSC, and you adopted those met methodologies that were recommended by the SSC and how, how they're applied um, to inform future decision making. So 
And uh, my personal observation on that whole process is um, I really admired the professionalism of uh, everyone that was involved um, in all of these endeavors. Uh, very good work indeed. Well said, Doug. Okay, with that, uh, good job everyone. We finished within the, a lot of that word. And uh, with that, I will pass our, the gavel back to our chairman. All right, thank you very much. Vice Chair Pettinger, we've got a few seats to change, but we'll start in a second with public comment so we can close that portal. Um, we have uh, 20 signups. And um, I don't know if that's a record, but it's, it's far, far more than we usually see. So uh, I will limit public comment to six minutes for groups and three minutes to individuals. And I guess we're a couple of minutes from starting here as folks uh, grab some refreshment. All right, so if you have signed up for public comment and you are remote, please raise your hand to make it uh, easier for our staff to enable your microphone. And if you are here, um, step on up to the table and make sure the microphone is on. So we'll start with Paul Clampett, followed by Lisa Demrosh. Welcome, Paul. Yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Can you hear me? You bet. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and members of the Council. I own the uh, Fishing Vessel Augustine along with my sons. We have been involved in the West Coast fisheries for 40 years. We purchased a trawl permit along with quota that came with it to grow our, fishery, our fishing business. In the early 90s, this Council reallocated sale of fish quota from 49% fixed gear to 51% trawl to 48% trawl to 42% fixed gear. We felt that this was unfair at the time. When trawl rationalization was developed, we saw it as an opportunity to recoup our previous losses by purchasing the quota from the trawl fleet. Nothing could be fairer than a willing buyer and a willing seller. This council has never explained why trawlers are constrained by gear switching when the sailfish quota has only been caught once since gear switching was allowed. As of now, there is still 1.3 million pounds available in the north and 1.4 million pounds available in the south. Next year, the sailfish quota is going up 28%, and recent surveys indicate that there are strong year classes going all the way back to 2014. By all indication, this fishery is booming, and the quota will be going up further. It is, it's also hard to understand how trawlers will achieve full utilization when the processors place price point limits on their deliveries of flatfish. These limits act to curtail deliveries. The trawl represent representatives have predicted that new markets are opening for Dover sole and other flatfish. And this is why we need to curtail gear, gear switching. I find it hard to understand how this council could consider harming the fixed gear fishermen over a prediction. Even if this becomes true, the sablefish quota going up 28% is not a prediction. And we will still and we are still underutilizing the stablefish quota south of 36 degrees. There is nothing biologically significant about this 30 degree line. And if more sablefish is needed north of 36 in the future, we should utilize the fish south of 36 degrees by moving some of it north. We are not even achieving maximum sustainable yield, yet we are considering moving, uh, removing a user group from the fishery. We purchased trawl permit with the attached quota, never expecting the council would consider removing our ability to harvest this with fixed gear. All the options being discussed will economically harm people who invested into this fishery except status quo option. If you're going to limit gear switching, the only fair thing to do is to make all the past participants whole, and yet there is no option on the table that does this other than status quo. All other options are overly complicated and unnecessary. It seems to us that removing gear switching is a blatant attempt by processors to control the sable fish market on the West Coast in order to buy cheap trawl caught sable fish to increase profits. This only 
benefits of processors and large trawlers connected to them. Small independent trawlers and fixed gear participants will be harmed. Also, if you can tear gear switching and the leasing of quota to fixed gear, you will make it more difficult for new entrants. It is much easier to equip fixed gear boat and lease fish than to get capital together to purchase quota and purchase a trawl vessel. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Paul. Are there any questions for Paul? Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Damrosh, followed by Jeff Lackey. Welcome, Lisa. Oh, and let me make an announcement here, which I neglected to do earlier. Um, the only way you can be enabled to speak is if you are connected through the Ring Central app, whether from your uh, from your home uh, or even on your phone. Of course, that is refers to remote participants. So, if you've called in on a phone but you plan to comment, make sure you reconnect using the Ring Central app. All right, I'm sorry, Lisa. Please go ahead. That's okay. Can you hear me okay? You bet. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. My name is Lisa Damrosh. Um, my 20-year-old son is the fifth generation of my family to commercially fish full-time out of Half Moon Bay, California. He works with my brother, Jeff Betancourt, who owns Trawl Quota, Trawl Permits, and the fishing vessel, Miss Mariah. Our family has participated in the trawl fishery since long before it became the IFQ fishery, and we've been gear switching since 2010. We are one of very few operations to ever use both bottom trawl and fixed gear and switch back and forth through gear types. And we have harvested with both gear types this year. We appreciate that historical participation is being considered in all alternatives. However, as trawlers, we recognize that sablefish is an important species needed to access other species in the trawl fishery. We need only to look to this year to see the challenges associated with less sablefish quota pounds available to the trawl fleet. We also recognize the importance of trawl landings, and I would like to thank Council Member Yaramenko for specifically asking about California south of 4010. I know I have personally spoken to this council uh, several times in the past about the unique challenges facing California trawlers south of 4010, but I do not believe that is the case here. I believe the Southern Management Line at 36 addresses concerns for our Southern fishermen and ports. Below 36, there is no proposed restriction on gear switching and no trawl fleet there active that needs southern sablefish to execute their fishery. So that can continue. However, here between the 36 line and the 4010 line, where there are only a few of us remaining, trawl landings are still incredibly important to our port community. We have been working for years to maintain and grow the trawl fishery, which supports our shore-based businesses and our community. And while smaller than those up in the northern states, significant investments into shoreside infrastructure and processing have been and continue to be made in this area. And these are completely dependent on a healthy and robust trawl fishery. It's for these reasons that we stand with trawlers that are supportive of alternative three with sub options three and three. And while we haven't had a lot of time, um, the new blended proposal for Mr. Anderson also seems worth exploring. Uh, this is Finally, this has been a long process, and we would ask that the council keep this item on track for final action as soon as possible. Um, I'm available for questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Are there questions for Lisa? Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, Jeff Lackey, followed by Greg Shaughnessy. Yes, hello. Thank you, council members, for your time. My name is Jeff Lackey, and I'll be speaking on behalf of Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. And I'm going to do something today I really don't like to do, or I don't think I do very well, and that's speak off the cuff. Uh, I usually like to write my testimony out. Um, but there was a change up here, and with the alternative and some thoughts about testimony and also the time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wing it. I'm going to start with you know, there's some talk of communities. So I just wanted to quickly work my way down the coast. Um, and maybe some processors and others will speak to it later. Westport, um, what would capacity for, for, for sable mean to DTS and other species? Year-round employment, which would help the whiting fishery and other fisheries. Um, and, and have the year-round employment would mean a lot to the community. You work your way down uh, Warrington again, the flatfish fillet machine. Uh, Year-round employment uh, would help with the community, with the other fisheries, 
Same thing in the river, uh, the glue that, that fits the ground fish between other fisheries. Uh, working way down to Newport, my community, um, I, I married into a fishing family that's, you know, 80, 90 years plus. Um, and it's amazing that there is very little uh, bottom trawl ground fish cutting uh, in, in Newport at this time. Uh, in the consolidation <clears throat> that happened as uh, ground fish uh, started going down, we Newport lost out. And so what this would mean to me for, and to a lot of uh, people in Newport is we want to see revitalization of, of ground fish in Newport. It would mean a lot to us. Um, it, you know, you can say you, you, you have your fish truck somewhere else, but it's not the same. It's just not the same. Moving away down the, down the coast to Coos Bay, Charleston, again, a historic port that is a, a shell of its former self. Um, and there again, as a new port, ground fish helps with the capacity for other fisheries and just maintaining that, uh, you know, looking at long-term first survival for Charleston Coos Bay. Um, and the capacity could mean a lot to them. Um, and, and also, again, fitting in the gaps with other fisheries in, in that area. Move away down to Eureka, um, the same thing. We're looking at long-term survival and, and hopefully thriving because there's a lot of fish down off California and there's a lot of people in the Bay Area. There's a lot of good markets. The potential in the ocean and on the land for that nexus is something. And we know from... Um, we know from the history of California, when trawling leaves an area, uh, a lot of other fisheries suffer. We know that. We know that. That's how we know how much trawl means to an area. Move on down to Fort Bragg. Uh, I met Jim Cotto at the first cab meeting. And the first words I heard out of his mouth was, what fish does, what species does Sable help get out of the water? He said, all of them. All of them. Now, I spoke with him a couple days ago, and we were, or no, I'm sorry, a couple weeks ago, and we were talking about this very thing, about how, yes, uh, the, the sable absolutely impacts the dover, and having a healthy trawl fishery does help the other fisheries, like a, he, he takes in a lot of uh, fixed gear sable. Uh, not, I don't know if it's any gear switching, I don't know, but a lot of, a lot of tear. And so you work your way down the coast, and you start adding up if, if you, if, and I would encourage council members between now and the FPA to go to these ports, to talk to, talk to the processors and the fishermen and ask about their, their other fisheries, their year round employment, uh, secondary economic impacts in the, in the, uh, community. Um, because once you start adding up what these communities have been and how they're under capacity and what the ocean could really do for us, you started adding up what we could do in each community, there's not going to be enough stable to do everything we want to do. Like the capacity isn't, OY isn't just sort of an acronym or something we talk about in a legal standpoint, but it, it really is at the community level, it means year-round employment, helping other fisheries. You know, we've talked about, you know, hear about new entrants. And well, you know, the best way to, to have a fishery be uh, uh, um, viable for new entrants is to increase the capacity of that fishery and sable equals capacity. And if you have healthy trawl fisheries, we know from history that then that can, lead, that can help have the capacity and the infrastructure that trawl affords then to take in non-trawl uh, delivery as well. And especially in times where markets are tough, and the brick and mortar processors have to be there year after year and year round. They have to, because that's a business model. They can't just shut it down and then, you know, three years later, the market's good and come back. They have to be there. So sometimes when the markets are tough, it's the brick and mortar processors that trawl affords that's taken deliveries. And so there may be some processors that speak to that. I don't know after me, but uh, just based on the conversation we had uh, or in the, in the alternative and sort of the discussion, I just wanted to address communities and what that means for OY. So you, so that is a sort of a element that maybe wasn't in the GAP report, but it really speaks to communities and it's a, a nexus for the trawl portion of the GAP report that, that, um, that is why it should be a very high bar to not have 100% of the trawl allocation go to trawl. And that's why the combination of the 
owning a vessel permit and quote and having the participation is Im important. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that comment. Are there any questions of Jeff? Corey Writings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Lackey. Um, I just had a couple questions about your comments there. Um, you said that due to consolidation and Newport lost out and you know, you're looking for the revitalization of ground fish in Newport. Um, what do you mean by consolidation and Newport lost out? Just looking for a little more nuance to that. Thank you. So ground fish was on a little bit of a downswing in the 2000s. Um, there was a, a few different things happened. There was the, the Japanese sable market. There was, we had small fish in the whiting market. We had, there was just one thing after another. There were some things on the, there were some, there, there were some other, other things as well. And so there was already sort of a, a strain, uh, but once COVID hit, they stopped cutting. Um, when, you, when, you, when a bottom trawl boat bought in their, their, their fish, all the flats, almost everything went to, to Warrington. We got, they consolidated into Eureka and Warrington and Newport got, got left out. Uh, Bornstein's has, they've had uh, cutting in Newport off and on. And during that sort of rough time, they had, they had, they had quit as well. Um, they have since in the past year, I believe, had just a very small uh, fillet crew, like a one boat market. And so they're trying to make it work again. So we're pretty, <clears throat> we're in, there, there is some, they do cut sable fish in Newport, uh, just to you know, be totally uh, accurate. And so um, that, 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 I guess that explains it. Thanks for that. Um, second thing you talked about um, how this action could potentially increase the capacity of the fishery for new entrants. Um, most of the action alternatives look to me like they reduce flexibility and would actually reduce the option for new entrants. So if you could speak a little bit more to that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Yes. Um, I, the only vessel I currently know of who will use fixed gear on their vessel and then use trawl on their vessel, um, Lisa Damros just spoke. I don't know of anybody else on the coast who, who is using that gear flexibility. The, the gear switchers are that I know of, I, you know, it could be somebody I don't know of, but the ones I know of, they're, they're fixed gear vessels. They, they don't trawl. They don't switch back and forth based on conditions. And so um, if we have a larger capacity fishery, if we have uh, uh, the, the ground fish comes back to Newport, you have greater capacity not only for ground fish, but for other fisheries. So our best shot at new entrance is to have geographic distribution of processors, more capacity in these plants and ports that are going to facilitate, okay, we've got squid coming in, or okay, we've got, uh, you know, what, whatever it is, you know, Dover, uh, different fisheries. Any further questions? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Jeff, very much for your um, testimony and, and your work on this issue. Um, the, the, um, we've had a significant increase in trawl landings of rockfish with the, with the rebuilding of a number of those key species. I'm wondering if boats from Newport have been able to take advantage of that increase in, in rockfish um, catch by trawlers. Yes, several boats in Newport have. Um, our family vessel has, um, and it's been a very good fishery. It was interesting to see it develop and how it developed. Um, yes, it's a, a, several in Newport and it's been very good. And just one follow up quickly is uh, in, in terms of processing, when those, are those fish being landed and processed in Newport by those vessels that are based there? Uh, for the most part, Although for a while they, for a while they had not been. When, when we got consolidated out, uh, then the 
At that point, the rockfish fillet machine that was in the plant we delivered to went to Warrington. So for a while, they said, can you deliver in Warrington? But then they've since brought it back and are trying to develop rockfish in both ports. Great. Thank you very much. Any further questions? Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hey, thanks, Jeff, for your testimony today. I know <clears throat> since this issue came before us, way before that even, <clears throat> you've been a, a, constant, a constant source of, of uh, information. And I really you know, appreciate all the work you do to get out good data, good facts, and bring issues to light. Um, I know because you shared a lot of data with me. Could you speak to availability overall of unharvested sable fish coastwide and what you, what you see? In 2022, um, it's probably the worst I've seen it since the early 2010s, 2011 through 15 sort of time frame from my recollection was, was very tight and it got bid up. Um, this year, two, th two things happened. One was just the sablefish population exploded. You hear from everybody on the coast, different fisheries, shallow deep, um, and then the whiting fishery. And so, you know, I just tried to do an estimation on whiting for 2022, and it's, it's by no means, um, I take this number to the bank, but I, I tried to estimate, look at different boats and figure if you figured what whiting boats caught and probably what they're keeping in reserve up into the, into the fall, I think we were getting close to a million pounds. And so that's, so not only did we have, have we had the, the, the hits are unbelievable. Um, got a boat fishing rockfish and another boat fishing ground fish and the the species that I'm communicating with both of them about is sable. The whiting boat, I said, or the boats fishing rockfish, said, well, you know, we're fine on everything. I said, but if you get 3,000 pounds of sable, text me. I want to know. You know, I want to know if we start getting hits. And 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 I had to, normally when anybody calls me for quota, I try to at least give them a little bit, but I, I, I turn somebody down for sable because I'm, I'm concerned about getting our petroleum out of the water because they're seeing sable on the petroleum grounds. Uh, or they did earlier this last trip, you know, not it, not as much, but still, you know, where we in previous years we just didn't. And so, 2022 has been like um, it, it's been something. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. Anything further for Mr. Lackey? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Greg Shaughnessy, uh, followed by Michelle Conrad. Greg, are you with us? Yes. Go ahead. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Council members, for this opportunity to speak. My name is Greg Shaughnessy, and I represent Ocean Gold Seafoods. I am testifying today on gear switching and the importance to our company, our employees, and our fleet to keep trawl allocated sable fish in the trawl sector. Sable fish is a value generator in the traditional bottom trawl fishery. This species increases the overall value of each bottom fish trip. But more importantly, sable fish is a necessary link to harvest a DTS complex. Sable fish is a primary choke species in the whiting fishery. Trawl allocated sable fish switched to a single species fixed gear fishery reduces the capacity of the trawl fisheries to attain optimal yield for the entire ground fish resource. This creates a cloud of uncertainty for our investments, plan operations, employees, and our markets. Ocean Gold Seafood has made significant investment revitalizing the trawl DTS fishery and is providing more delivery opportunity to our fleet as we grow the business. We are placing quality products consistently into the market, marketplace and taking action based on our customer feedback. By modest but steady steps, we are expanding the market for IFQ DTS products, both domestically and internationally. Upgrades at Ocean Gold over the last couple of years include a mechanical flatfish fillet machine, in-feed hoppers, belts, trim lines, 
in a custom freezer that enhances the appearance of the frozen fillets. In addition, we have upgraded our offloading equipment dockside. We strive to maximize utilization of our investments while building out our capacity and increasing the opportunity for our trawl fleet, our Ocean Gold Seafoods crew, and our customers. Sablefish is a limiting factor to the attainment of this goal. Our objective is to produce quality products from Dover, Rex, Thornyhead, Petrolli, Rockfish, Sablefish, Lingcod, Skate, Arrowtooth, and on. The goal is to offer a complete menu of options for our current customers and additional clients. An illustration of the importance of sable fish in the bottom trawl fishery, what we're seeing is Dover to sable fish ratios range from three to one off the Washington coast and four to one off Oregon. We now see sable fish in shallow waters and in targeted petroleum trips. Sable fish abundance and catch has increased in the whiting fishery. We need to keep trawl IFQ sable fish in the trawl fishery. And finally, I wanna thank members of the council for taking the time to visit our facility to see the investments and improvements we are making to attain our goal of year round employment. Our crew is essential to our mission and we cannot perform without their contribution. They are appreciated and highly valued. We are one of the largest employers in Grace Harbor County and the goal is to create 250 year round jobs for community members, not just transient or seasonal workers. Your commitment in the recent field trip to our plant and your tough questions reinforce our faith in the council process. We need your help to expand this business opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Are there any questions for Greg? Phil Anderson followed by Chris Svensson. Hi, Greg. Um, hope everything's good at home. Um, I wanted to just ask you about your ex the Ocean Gold's experience with finding um, customers, in particular for uh, Dover Soul. I've, of course, been one of the people who's been privileged to have a first look at your plant and uh, observe the product that you're producing there, uh, but I, on the marketing side, I'm just wondering if you could just give us a sense of the receptivity of, of the market to the Dover sole product that you're producing. Howdy, Phil. It's been quite blustery here at home. Um, uh, the marketplace is very dynamic and it, and it just is constantly changing as we expand into newer markets. We have high hope for Australia. We have high hope domestically. It's not a straight line, unfortunately, Phil. It's a two steps forward, one step back kind of a proposition. But I believe you'll see the same, the same action in some of the other fisheries that have been developed over the years. I'll, I'll point out whiting was kind of an underused resource and looking at now. Rockfish, it wasn't a straight line up. Uh, it's only through doing it that we're going to discover the true depth of the market, Phil. It's a, it's a really hard question to answer. Just one quick follow-up, if I may. Thanks, Greg. Of course. Uh, just, could you just briefly describe the efforts that Ocean Gold is making to introduce Dover into the market and look for higher volume um, uh, um, uh, customers? Sure. So domestically, we're working with um, uh, a company, I'm, I'm going to leave names out of it, that represents some of the largest retailers in America. And, and they like our product. They like the story. They, there were some appearance issues. I mean, these have to be trimmed out perfectly. They have to be frozen perfectly. But we have interest domestically in Dover. And, and it's going to take us a little time but we feel confident that we can develop that market. And then internationally, we're gonna lever our, our client list that we sell products to internationally. And, and we are now pushing some samples out to these customers, our current customers, and, and try to lever that relationship up uh, to get them interested in frozen Dover fillets. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. 
Krista. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Mr. Shaughnessy, for your testimony today. Um, I'd also like to thank you for making the investment in the Dover and Rockfish equipment in advance and, and being actively working on this now. Um, I think that says a lot about the commitment of your company um, to the ground fish uh, category as a whole. Um, we heard you speak today about both the DTS complex um, and developing that, along with the needs for sable fish with regard to whiting. Um, in this process, we've heard a fair amount uh, about people's ability to pay differing amounts, um, whether you came from say shoreside bottom trawler DTS versus the whiting fleet. And I'm just wondering how that is going to impact your organization um, in terms of Dover attainment if they cannot afford to pay as much as the whiting fleet um, and those operations. Thanks for the question. I, I think it's gonna impact it a lot. Um, Trying to access the Dover that we need, or the black cod that we need to execute Dover. I have some good friends that fish Dover for us, and and they were running out of black cod this spring and having a hard time trying to find it. And and now you look at the marketplace today; it's gotten quite expensive. Um, it it's, it makes it really challenging for us to access the black cod that we need to execute. The DTS complex, and, and I'm not just talking about Dover. I'm talking about the trolley and, and and all the other species we'd like to be able to offer our customers. I thank you, and and again, I really appreciate you being here today and and the investments you've made. Bush Smith, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Greg, how are you doing today? Very well, Butch. Um, so I was one that took one of the tours of, of the facility and, and um, amazed at, at the investment and the strive to uh, keep people employed in boats and, and people in your plant employed all, all year round. Um, and I being a Port Commissioner in El Waco know how important that is to keep the boats coming in and, and somewhere to, to process their fish. Um, as was impressed with the commitment, uh, not only at the plant, Greg, but your commitment for how much housing you guys have invested in to, to you know, make that, make that 250 people plan all year long come to fruition could you go into a little bit of how much not not how much you invested exactly but but how many motels and old campgrounds you guys have bought and refurbished to to make that also um a reality so you have people that that uh you know have a place i don't know if you know but trying to find a place to rent on the coast is, you know went from five hundred dollars just a few years ago to about twelve thirteen hundred dollars a month so um, anyway, could you enlighten us a little bit on that, sir? Well, thanks a lot for that question. I, I, I held that back out of my written testimony. Um, that's a big part of what we saw three, four years ago. Our crew would come to town and they couldn't find a place to live. And so they would uh, have to go to South Bend or Raymond or into Aberdeen, which is fine. You know, that's all within... 60 miles but you know it's a it's a bit of a commute so we we wanted to ease that burden on our crew um and so we started buying kind of old hotels five years ago that um you know their value was a lot less than they were kind of run down so we'd go in and we would remodel them into nice apartments and uh right now we have five of them uh we'd like to expand some more but hotels all the properties kind of gotten expensive in the last couple of years so we're going to hold back but we've got five now that have been fully renovated provides great apartments for our crew um we we charge a nominal fee for them to to stay there it's just basically to cover the maintenance of power and water and, and we do this for our crew because they're the most important asset we have around us without our crew 
we're not going to produce anything. So we, we want these to be full-time manufacturing jobs that, that people are into it as a career, uh, not just, you know, go, go work this crop right now and move on to the next. We, we, we want to develop community members, and that's really important to us. Thank, thank you, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Greg. Uh, Michelle Conrad, followed by Bob Alverson. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and council members. I'm Michelle Conrad with Ocean Beat Consulting, and I'm presenting comments on behalf of Fishing Vessel Owners Association, the All Gear Group, Ocean Ballad, and uh, Bessiger Company. We thank the GMT and the GAP for their hard work on this issue and support the GMT's uh, recommendations and the GAP fixed gear recommendations. We believe that the council had good intentions when it considered the provisions of the IFQ program, but there were oversights relative to ownership and control accumulation limits, and we recommend these issues be rectified as soon as possible. While the council adopted a northern sable fish uh, quota share limit of 3% and a vessel use cap quota pound limit on an annual basis of 4.5%, the council did not adopt a quota pound limit at the entity level and did not limit the number of permits or vessels an entity can own or control. These issues need to be addressed to avoid excessive ownership or control of IFQ QP and excessive control through the ownership or use of multiple permits and vessels. Unless and until these ownership and control issues are addressed, any alternatives that restrict a subset of quota share owners or permit owners through limitations on gear switching would be unfair and, an inequ and inequitable and in violation of national standard four and would exacerbate the excessive ownership and control issue that you have not yet addressed. Many gear switchers acquired quota share and trawl permits for the purpose of gear switching. Some earned their quota share through trawl operations prior to the IFQ program and others bought it from willing sellers through market-driven business transactions, which is how the program was designed to work. While we acknowledge the belief that future harm could result from unlimited gear switching, we emphasize that any remedy needs to be fair and equitable. To be clear, we are not asking for special privileges. We are asking to be treated the same as every other IFQ quota share or permit owner who made investments in this fishery. We would also like to point out that table nine and attachment three on page 33 describes the amounts of IFQ Northern Sablefish that has been harvested annually by all sectors. We note that fixed gear harvest has ranged from 24 to 35% over the qualifying period of 2011 to 2017. And in the more recent years with higher sablefish ACLs, gear switching has declined to 25% in 2020 and 19% in 2021. These amounts are less than the IFQ fishery left unharvested. While some argue that the current northern sablefish biomass may not have been fully accounted for in the last stock assessment, the IFQ fishery left 29.7% unharvested in 2020 and 27.1% unharvested in 2021. This underscores the conclusion that gear switching is not impeding attainment of northern IFQ allocations 
with strong gear. While the Council's adoption of similar sablefish harvest specifications for 2023 and 2024 earlier this year, the trawl sector will have had a five-year opportunity to harvest 27% more of the sablefish IFQ allocation each year from 2020 through 2024 with the continuation of gear switching. As such, we believe it would be good to see what new trawl markets for underattained species such as Dover sole will have been initiated, if not realized during this five-year period to better assess the trade-offs associated with limitations on gear switching. As the GMT pointed out in their statement, quote, for any action the council takes, there should be strong rationale indicating why potential costs to some user groups would be outweighed by uncertain benefits, end quote. We believe that is sound advice and we thank you for the opportunity to provide our comments. Thank you. Are there any questions for Michelle? Thank you very much. Bob Alverson, followed by Jonathan Gonzalez. Welcome, Bob. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Bob Alverson. I'm representing Fishing Vessel Owners Association, which is a trade association of uh, quota shareholders and vessel owners that use uh, pot and hook and line gear. Um, with regards to this uh, uh, argument that the gear switching is restraining the, de um, the delivery of other ground fish for the trawl fleet, um, I'd like to expand on uh, Paul Clampett's testimony that um, I'm looking at Pacific States information here for this year, 2022, there's 1.3 million pounds still remaining. Um, and that's with a lot of activity from the whiting fleet. I would su suggest that gear switching has declined this year. Uh, a lot of my vessels, at least a couple of them anyway, that were gear switching have got uh, quite a bit of quota up in Alaska. And um, I think uh, a number of boats are, have got more quota than they can uh, divert time now to, to gear switching. So I think some of the pressure on gear switching is, is abating. In uh, 2021, uh, with no carryover, there was, uh, as Michelle indicated, 27.15% or 1.8 million pounds that were still remaining. 2020, there was 2 million pounds remaining. Um, 2019, it got a little tighter, but the quotas here had not been increased, and it was 5.1% uh, that was uh, still remaining. So the constraining argument we would question uh, in terms of driving the justification for these different alternatives to restrict gear switching, I was given the opportunity to explain um, concerns relative to alternative one and the vessel limbs requirement and also alternative three, a need to establish uh, owner, uh, a, a limit on ownership of permits um, on the last page of uh, the, the fixed gear gap comments, there's a, a comment regarding um, adopting the individual or collective approach to these different alternatives you have. We've been told by Jesse and, and Jim that leaving that undecided at this time does not add any more um, analysis for the, um, the staff. Um, I was surprised to find out that under alternative one, that there are, this could affect seven entities. Uh, under alternative three, I think there's only one entity that might be affected. I thought I knew everybody in the fixed gear business, but uh, this indicated that some of these entities had four or five participants in. I don't know who those are, and I wouldn't want to see someone get uh, arbitrarily axed. <laughs> 
at this at, at this meeting, and if it doesn't uh, affect um, the council's staff time to develop anything, I would recommend not taking action if you choose a preliminary preferred action, leaving the individual and collective issue to be decided when you make a final decision. With regards to the, the new proposal that uh, we heard from Phil, um, this alternative would cap uh, gear switching, I think, at about 12.5%. And um, in our discussion in the gap following uh, presentation of that, uh, since 6.5% under alternative three has already been analyzed, I think that that would be also available to the council. Um, we would frankly like to see another alternative in there that uh, is somewhere between 12.5 and the 26% in alt, alt one, but that would require probably going back a, a, a year or two and looking at uh, some of the alternatives under alternative three where maybe there was 15 permits that drive a uh, 15% uh, or, or 20% um, allotment there. But uh, it seems that uh, that restraining it to 12.5 may be uh, also unjustified with these surpluses that seem to be driving every year in terms of the amount of sable fish not caught by the, the trawl fleet. And this year, as, as Mr. Clampett pointed out, there's a 28% uh, increase in the coastwide uh, sable fish for 2023. And in the Pacific Council, if you're interested in that, or in the North Pacific Council, they're looking at probably a 15% uh, increase on top of a 25% increase this year. So um, I, I frankly see from our organization, our boats are probably putting in 14 trips in Alaska and, you know, 14 five-day, seven uh, a week apiece, dodging weather, that's taken them from March to September. Our, our fleet doesn't want to be fishing after October with the size vessels we have. So I see a lot of our boats not participating in, in gear switching that haven't invested already hard money into it. So that concludes my comments, Mr. Chairman. Is there any questions? Well, yeah, let's see if there are any questions. It looks like Brad Pettinger has a question for you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, you mentioned about a patrol, lack of patrol attainment down here in the last couple of years. I know Michelle mentioned that earlier. Could you tell me what the attainment of black cod was in the Alaska hook and line fishery, pot fishery over in 2021? How much, how much fish did you leave on the table up there during those years? In Alaska, in Alaska, through the chair. I'm gonna guess <clears throat> it's, it's, if you're looking at the Gulf of Alaska, Mr. Prettinger, it's probably in the 85 to 90%. There's a lot of quota that is assigned to the Aleutian, Western Aleutians that is never caught. For the last 20 years, it's never been caught. Um, and it amounts to a, this year, 2022, about 8 million pounds out of, out of 40 million pounds, something like that. I'm going to guess this year um, overall we'll land about 70% of all the black cod in Alaska, but there's probably like 20% of that that is assigned to the Western Aleutians that is just kind of skews all the numbers on it if you look at the totals. Any further questions for Bob? All right, thank you, Bob. Oh, wait, Corey Niles, I'm sorry. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I couldn't get my hand up very high there. Um, Bob, I guess, uh, and, and, and you, you took, you had a, um, took, you were able to take a look at the, the idea Phil put out there. It sounds like, in, in, and we're all, we're all still digesting it. To me, it sounds a lot like alternative one, except that no one else gets any, any, any gear quota share, except the people that, 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 that um, bought it. But there's also the aspect of, um, you, the person, the people would have to own the permit as an, as of, and since the control date, I think the phrase is, um, and I don't know if there's anyone in that situation, but I know you've, you've spoke, um, 
about the way people view these different fishing privileges now that you know we have quota share we have um the limited entry permit which we we saw there's um a surplus of and i think we've seen on on dock street brokers you can get them for less than ten thousand leasing for a year um so any any thoughts about the how, how your folks would view the um need to to buy if they wanted to participate in this fishery you know prior to the control date the need to purchase a limited entry permit versus purchase quota share and um and then just lease a permit hopefully that's clear enough i can uh, i can restate sure. more concisely i hope if not uh, through the chair i'll i'll try to focus in on that um uh, corey the the people that I know of that participated um, and bought quota and had their own boat and had a permit, so they had their boat, they had their, the, the, they bought their quota. Um, I don't know how many of those had just leased a permit. Some of them owned those permits or they had been get, granted those permits when trawl limited entry came in and when the ITQ came in, such as Bernie Burkhalter, he actually qualified for all of his trawl black cod, but then he went and invested in, and, and built a, a long line boat. So he's always participated with his own permit, his own boat, and his own quota. But I'm sure there's someone that just leased a permit in there that might fall through the cracks, but I, I don't know who that might be. Further questions for Bob? Thank you, Bob. You know, Jonathan, we're just gonna take a break right now. We're gonna take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and finish our public comment. So we'll be back, well, we'll call it uh, 3.05.
right, everybody. Please return to your assigned seat. And we will continue with public comment. And that will be Jonathan Gonzalez, followed by Juan Delgado. So. All right, and uh, make sure the microphone is on. All right, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Uh, for the record, my name is John Gonzalez. I'm the fisheries policy manager at Pacific Seafood. I'd like to start by thanking the council and council staff for all of your hard work on this very important issue to date and for following through with the commitment you made in September of 2020. Um, as far as continuing continuing to work on and, and eventually complete deliberation on this issue. Uh, with respect to the introduction of new the new alternative at this meeting, we are still in support of alternative three with bold, bold sub option threes with no more than 6.5% of trawl sable going to gear switching. We feel this alternative will give this fishery the best fighting chance to turn things around as far as comporting to the purpose and need of this action. And what I'm talking about specifically is having the certainty of increased trawl access to sable fish, thereby affecting the further development of markets and further investments into infrastructure, such as additional cold storage and processing automation to maximize the value of ground fish, the ground fish resource as a whole and to achieve the maximum biological yield of the overall ground fish fishery. While a 12.5% alternative, such as the new alternative introduced at this meeting, or alternative three with sub-option two, is a step in the right direction, again, we feel the 6.5 alternative will only give this fishery an even better chance at turning things around. Our preference of 6.5% rather than 12.5% acknowledges the year class of baby sable fish that fishermen are trying to avoid like a pest this year that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Simply put, the trawl fishery needs all the sable it can get. And since this program was created, the trawl fishery has never had the chance to realize its full potential as a significant percent of trawl sable has exited the trawl fishery every year that the program has been in place. If the new alternative was modified to add additional qualifying criteria that requires vessel ownership that would bring it down to a 6.5% alternative, then we'd be happy to support it. Our preferred alternative also considers impacts on current operations and investments by allowing folks that invested in a permit and quota share plus the ownership of a vessel that landed 30,000 pounds in three years prior to 2017 to fish the quota share that they own with fixed gear. Alternatives one and two are less fair and equitable as they allow the folks I mentioned above to only fish a fraction of the sable quota share or quota pounds that they own with fixed gear while providing gear switching opportunities to folks that may never use it. Our preferred alternative would also strengthen the year round performance of the fishery as increased trawl access to sable combined with increased processing automation will allow for increased throughput of fish going through our plants and into markets that demand larger quantities of a larger mix of species on a more consistent basis throughout the year. A strong year round ground fish fishery is needed to develop and retain year round employment and thriving coastal communities and inherently gives us the ability to purchase and process non trawl caught species such as crab, albacore and salmon. It's worth noting that on a good salmon year such as 2019, our Eureka plant purchased nearly 240,000 pounds of troll caught king salmon and we paid the boats nearly or over 1.4 million for it. In addition to myself, I'm happy to announce that we will have Juan Delgado, our general manager of our Warrington facility testifying today, as well as Joe Sincata, who's the GM of our Eureka plant. I'm excited for you all to get to hear firsthand about the current investments we have made into automation, infrastructure, and worker housing. They will also get to share some insight into how our preferred council action on this issue will impact future operations and investments into our coastal communities and our nation by working towards maximizing the value of the ground fish resource as a whole and to achieve the maximum biological yield of the overall ground fish fishery. In closing, again, I wanna thank the council for your continued work on this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your public comment. Are there any questions of Jonathan? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Jonathan, for your testimony. You mentioned um, purchasing salmon from the troll fleet this year in Eureka. Um, can you tell me, was that a summertime activity? Were you handling overflow? What was the situation there? Through the chair, uh, thanks for the question, Marcy. Um, I 
what I have in front of me is just the numbers of, of how many pounds we bought and what we paid for it each year. But your question, I think, would be um, better um, answered by Joe Sincata, our Eureka GM, who will be testifying after one. Thank you. Further questions? Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your testimony, John. I'm not sure if this is best directed at you or someone coming up, um, but kind of feeding off of Marcy's question, can you please speak to the percent of ground fish that is processed on average per month or by area at the processing plants? Through the chair, uh, thanks for the question, um, Jessica. Uh, can you please clarify um, a little further as far as what you mean by percent of ground fish? Just overall of what you are processing, about what percent of what you're processing kind of throughout the year is ground fish? Uh, again, um, I'm wondering, we do uh, many species, and so are you talking percent of pounds or percent of X vessel, like the value that we paid for it? It's, it's a bit difficult to answer because those are... Through the chair, uh, let's say pounds. pounds. Okay, uh, definitely uh, ground fish is the most important there as far as pounds through our plant. I mean, we, we really specialize mostly in ground fish, shrimp, and crab. Um, each of our facilities is different as far as the percentages that they process at each one. Um, for example, Eureka, ground fish is actually um, a little bit more important since we don't have any shrimp processing through there anymore. Um, so it's literally down to ground fish and crab and like I said, also salmon. But um, uh, as you work your way up the coast, it's it, it's also poundage wise, ground fish reigns supreme as far as in Newport and, and Warrington. Um, Westport, um, it's, it's more so crab. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's just different for each plant. So I'd have to kind of give a, an, an answer for each one. <laughs> but ground fish is the most important overall. It's, it's the glue, like you've heard before, it's the glue that keeps our plants operating year round instead of seasonally like some of the plants that we have up in Alaska. All right, any further questions of Jonathan? Pete Hussamer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John, for the testimony. I, I hope this question isn't too crazy or strange, but uh, throughout this, uh, I think this whole project we have, and especially today, I've heard terms or phrases like surplus fish and, and maximizing and full utilization. And in your testimony, uh, you mentioned um, Pacific, I think, needing all the sable fish they can get, maximizing biological catch, and then you talked about the, you know, multi-species of ground fish as a whole. If, if Pacific were able to get all they could get, and some of the numbers we have, whether we, we cap gear switching at 26% or 12% or 6%, thinking about that, um, it, is the idea there that maximizing is catching all the fish or are there gonna be some fish left there? You know, how would you use all the fish you can get? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Pete. Um, I'll, I'll first clarify that um, I, I'm not talking about this from just a Pacific issue. When I say that this fishery can, can use all the sable it, it can get or the trawl fishery needs all the sable it can get, I was specifically trying not to say Pacific seafood because that's not at all what I mean. I'm talking about for the boats and and also for the plants and also kind of inherently for the coastal communities that depend on this fishery performing well. And so now as far as you know why we would prefer to see the, the maximum amount of trawl sable staying in the trawl sector, um, first for not only sector integrity, but more so what I was saying too, as far as it gives us the a better chance at moving towards comporting to the purpose and need of this action to to get more fish out of the water to move towards um, more throughput through our plants and inherently um, being able to satisfy some of the markets that demand higher volumes at times that we're not able to to maybe fillet it or, or process it 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 by having more certainty that there's gonna be more sable there in the future, not only is it gonna help the boats to where they hopefully they can start to fish again rather than avoiding so much and bringing a bigger mix and a better mix of species in more consistently. But um, again, it'll help us to be able to have the certainty that we can 
invest more into automation. We've already invested a lot, but to invest more into automation, more into worker housing, more into cold storage, so we can really, again, just, just try to realize the full potential of this fishery. Like I also noted, um, since the program started, um, over 20% on average um, of trawl sable has exited the fishery. So by us supporting the lowest percent as possible, Again, it's no one has the crystal ball of, of what's going to happen or how long it's going to take. It would be foolish to me making promises. But one thing I do know is that 6.5% is going to allow more trawl sable to be available to trawlers than a 12.5% alternative would. Thank you. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess the question I have related to housing, because we've heard a lot about that today, um, in industry news, uh, <laughs> it's tied quite often to H-2B visa requirements, um, meaning if we bring people into the United States, they're required to provide housing. So I'm just wondering how much of this housing, um, particularly knowing that you do have H-2B visa workers in Warrington, uh, I can't speak for other areas, how much of this housing is going for H-2B visas versus actually going to the communities? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Krista. Um, yeah, this 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 gets to be where I think that'd be a, a better question for Juan specifically because I, I try to pick their brains as much as possible. I try to spend as much time, you know, at our plants and visiting and and again asking questions, learning about things as much as possible. That specific question, I don't have an answer to because I've never asked it. Thank you, Corey Niles. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and hello, Jonathan. Good to see you in person. Um, I guess I think it was this time last year, this council, we were talking 29%. Uh, you all were arguing for 10%. Somehow we've got to 6.5% um, versus 12.5%, and based on what information, I don't know. Um, but I guess, as we've heard earlier, why I'm, I'm kind of wondering about the percentage versus the pounds, and has been pointed out, um, you know, this is not going to last forever, of course, but we're seeing some really good recruitments in the sable fish and we're, it's going up. I forget someone said about 30% next year, which, which I can't do the math for you. And that's a lot more pounds, but why is the percentage so important for you all versus there's just more sable fish out there for everyone. The pie has, is growing. So what, what's this? Yes. Yeah, 6.5 is less competition from than than 12.5, but What's the significance between between that? Through the chair, thank you for the question, Corey. Um, it's it's a lot, a lot to do with kind of what I was explaining to Pete as far as it, it's a lower number. To, to be quite honest, we, um, uh, you know, us and some others would prefer that gear switching was completely eliminated. Um, that's not an option on the table right now. Um, uh, Jeff kind of mentioned an uh, uh, alternative four that could bring it to a 3.7% there. But again, um, we didn't think that it was as fair or equitable as a 6.5% because the, the qualifying criteria that brings things down to a 6.5%, um, we feel um, acknowledges the investments that those, those folks made into the fishery. And again, while we'd prefer 6.5 over 10 or, or 12 and a half, again, it just comes back to trying to keep as much trawl sable in the trawl fishery in the trawl sector as we can. And to, we kind of consider this almost a trial period. No council action is permanent. You can never again, have a crystal ball to see what the outcome is gonna be. Um, it's, it would be difficult right now to forecast that the benefits from this action will outweigh any potential injury to folks that you know, wanna continue leasing trawl quota. None of us know that, but one thing that we do know is that this fishery is reviewed every so often. And that if there were to be an action taken, the council always has the opportunity in the subsequent review to see whether or not this action is meeting those those indicators of success, whether that be comporting to the purpose of need or whatever whatever other indicators are defined in between now and April. But again, we, we just want the best fighting chance possible, the most fit, uh, stable as possible staying in the sector to give us the, the best chance over this trial period, we'll call it. Um, if it was to be 12.5 or 10, again, if there's some indicators that are met, after that review, well, then perhaps it would warrant council action to further reduce gear switching opportunities. Well, then 
we would have again preferred that that took place earlier so we could start realizing some of these potential benefits sooner than later. All right, anything else? Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you. Juan Delgado, followed by Joe Sincora. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, welcome, Juan. Well, please go uh, ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the Council. My name is Juan Delgado. I am the General Manager for Pacific Seafoods in Warrington, Oregon. I have been working in the Pacific Northwest for the last 12 years. I live in Astoria and really love the community that received me and my family. This summer, I saw how not having enough stable towns affected our operations and our fishing partners. Whiting boats were catching unusual volumes of sable with their fish. So the boats that had quota were making six hour turns while the boats that did not have quota or very little were making 26 to 30 hour trips. This threw out our production out of balance and for our fishing partners, it meant a higher cost to operate especially with the high cost of fuel right now. Sometimes our ground fish boats had to come in with short trips or with unwanted bycatch because of avoiding grounds high on sale. Other draggers had to find quota first and then get on our schedule to go fishing. And this is quite the task with higher prices on sable pounds at the beginning of the year, then lack of sable pounds in the market in the summer, and then all of the above towards the end of the year is very difficult for them. We would like to increase our capacity in our plants right now. We're working on setting up a flat fish filleting machine. As we all know, filleting by hand is an art that is going away. And training our crew to get recoveries and efficiencies that make sense with this new machinery takes time. Working with our fleet is something that takes financial investment and commitment. And I believe a robust frozen fillet program will help processors get our ground fish into new markets in different parts of the U.S. and the world. This will generate demand for our products with the consistency of year-round supply, as well as working to get Dover on programs like USDA or Farm to School. Workforce has been an issue before the pandemic. And now our intention is not to bring workers, but to bring members of the community where we can offer year-round work, offer options for housing beyond a hotel room, so our team members and their families can be received and prosper in our communities, just as it happened to me. If alternative three with both sub-options three goes through, I believe we will feel confident to invest time and resources to increase plant capacity, boat limits, and bigger market share for our fish over imports. Also, we will feel free to invest in housing for our team members. I wanna thank this council for your work on this issue and for allowing me to testify remotely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan, for your testimony. Let's see if there are any questions. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you. Mr. Delgado, and congratulations on being the GM um, in Warrington. I um, have a question on the housing. You probably heard me ask the same question to um, Jonathan Gonzalez. Uh, in terms of, of your workforce um, and knowing that, that housing is a requirement for H2B visas, just wondering, can you tell us approximately what the percentage is um, in terms of housing that's going to members of our community versus uh, members of the workforce that are coming over for a period of time and then returning home? Um, and I, no matter what, I am thankful for the commitment to provide housing in Clatsop County. That is something we struggled with when I was at Bornstein's in processing. Uh, and it's a, something that people struggle with just in general in Clatsop County in terms of housing. So thank you for providing that service, but still wondering what the mix is. Uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Benson, and thank you for the congratulations too. <laughs> uh, the answer is that 
This year, in particular, 2022, we had zero H-2B visa workers in warrant. Uh, through strong recruiting with our company and uh, the use of several temp agencies, we were able to bring people from the U.S., you know, all over the place, from Carolina to Wyoming to Washington, Eastern Oregon, all over the place. And uh, also the design that we have this year is that we rented for them. So by not Pacific Seafoods Warrington taking over a building of apartments in Warrington, we were able to supply that housing to our workers and then they feel confident to bring their families. Right now, after the season, we have about 30% of the workers that are gonna stay and work year round with us. And I wish I could give more. We just don't have the hours to give them, meaning the work to give them. But we do have the housing. And in winter, as you know, other housing becomes available so they can get out of, out of our housing and then rent by themselves. That's when they bring in, um, in, the, in the winter break, some of our workers have told us that they're gonna bring their partners, their family, their kids, and they're gonna begin joining our school systems in the Warrington Astoria area. And I think that's a win for our community. You know, we have diversity, we have other people that is willing to work in other things other than seafood. Um, we, we, we just uh, hope to, to be, that this industry seafood uh, becomes also a, a, a prime choice for people that wants to start. And whether it's in Oregon, Washington, or all over the US, like I was saying, we have people from Louisiana, from Florida, people from Ohio, Nebraska, and now they are uh, setting root in our community. But that's our plan. Thank you. Christopher. <clears throat> I do, thank you. and. And thank you for uh, expanding on this. I um, think it's actually exciting to have people moving into our community and 30% retention for temps is phenomenal. So congratulations on that too. But just wondering, um, can you speak to the percentage of temps versus permanent hires? I mean, is, are you looking at half of your workforce? Is it just kind of what that number is for people coming in and staying versus people actually staying in Clatsop County and, and really helping to build up what we've got going on there. I, I think that of the workforce and our peak is before the whiting season and the first couple of months of that season of our workforce, um, ab about 70% were seasonal, meaning people that do not live in this area permanently. And now we're keeping 30% of them uh, we wish we could keep more, really we wish. Um, in Warrington, we do certain processes like, you know, with the whiting, with the bottom fish and other processes, but we do not do other processes like crab or shrimp. And uh, I believe that if we were able to have a steady supply of bottom fish, uh, we could increase uh, probably by about 60 people more, day shift and night shift that would have year-round offerings from us. Thank you. Uh, Bush Smith. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hey, Juan, Butch Smith, uh, nice talking to you again. Um, could you elaborate a little bit um, on the investment that you're, you're making um, or have been making or going to be making on, the, on your flatfish line and and uh what it would would do to stabilize your workforce you know to be there all year round just just you know you don't have to go into business detail but but um the investment you you're also making at warrington lake ocean well not quite the scale ocean gold but but potentially what ocean gold is doing up in westport yes and thank you for asking sir so what we're doing is that we bought the mechanical filet machine. <clears throat> right now, we are designing and uh, that finishing up on the CapEx4, the conveying systems, the skinner, the end of the line solutions that we're going to do portions, skin on, skin off, vacuum packing, fresh packing on ice, kind of, the kind of packaging that we're going to be offering to customers. 
our main target is going to the frozen fillet program. So we are focusing on all of our efforts there. But also our hand fillet line right now is working day shift. Uh, can we start a night shift? Uh, our mechanical fillet line, we used it yesterday, in fact, and uh, we worked it for about six hours net. We were stopping and going with trainings, recoveries, and all that good stuff. And also finding solutions to go into the tunnel, the freezer tunnel that we have in the house. Uh, it has to make sense for efficiency. It has to make sense to for, for the length of training for our crew. And also, I know that with our sales team, if we invest in the planning, in, in making a good quality product, they're going to be investing on the sales sites, on education of customers, education of groceries. And I can tell you, for example, that um, on the sales side, sometimes our fish is not a present is very attractive. So that it that's an opportunity for end of the line packaging for us. So it goes in the way that we want the public public to see our products right off the bat from our plant, not being manipulated by other ones. This is gonna be about a about a six, seven month uh, process for investing due to uh, supply chain and lead times and all that good stuff. But we're hoping we're ready in, in about six, seven months to go full force with uh, our designs and to begin with, I don't know, uh, figuring out our return of investment um, based on our sales and the penetration on the market with our products. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Juan. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Butch kind of asked the question I was, but I didn't get the answer I was looking for, so I'll, I'll ask it again. Juan, thanks for being here. Uh, appreciate the, all the information you shared. I, I would, along the lines with Butch, Butch asked you, what, what's the magnitude of that total investment? I mean, I don't want your exact, you know, your business stuff, but I mean, I think I'd get a sense of how much it costs to, to take on an endeavor like that and, and add that that capacity to your plant, what is a, uh, do you have a ballpark of how, many, how much that actually costs to do that? Um, yes, and, and, and I can break it a little bit so it's easier to understand. So in, in order to achieve what we're looking for, we have to start at the dock. How do we offload the product? How we keep the, the cold chain going? At the dock probably is an investment of about $150,000 to accomplish what we're trying to do. Once the product is inside the room where it's gonna be processed, right now uh, we already own the filleting machine. We don't have the conveying systems or the skinner. I can share with you that the skinner, you're looking at about $120,000. The conveying systems, um, disposal of by of byproduct and uh, that's probably about $180,000. And then depending on the end of the line solutions that you want to do, right now we're looking at maybe doing portions, skin on and skin off portions, vacuum packing, and uh, maybe um, smaller packaging, more retail oriented packaging. Uh, all that equipment probably we're looking at about 300,000. Uh, something that I want to add as well is that it's not only the equipment. If I'm able to do what I'm planning to do, I'm going to need um, about 60 workers. So I have to find out the housing for them. So it is, you know, I used to joke and saying who, who has the housing, who gets the workers. Money is important for the workers, but housing is more. What's the point of making more money in this location that it, with a competitor if I have no place to stay? So it, it, it is very important for us uh, and it goes hand in hand with the investment in equipment. We need to provide the workers a place to stay. And that means a commitment. I'm gonna rent for three years, uh, you know, 20 apartments, 30 apartments where I can put uh, our team members. So that's, um, 
I can tell you it's about twenty-seven to thirty thousand um, dollars, depending on the amount of units uh, that on rentals that we would have to cover. So it is um, it, it it is something to think about, you know. And uh, if we're going to assume that risk, we just want to know that it's going to make sense for everybody involved, including the box. Thank you, Juan, for painting that picture. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll now hear from Joe Sincota, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, followed by Michelle Longo Edir. Perfect pronunciation, unless you were in Italy and you be Cincota. But uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the council. My name is Joe Sincata, and I am the general manager for Pacific Seafood Eureka. I've been in the seafood processing industry for 50 years, and my family since they came from Sicily in 1896. Current ground fish operations and fishing plans are being disrupted as our vessels continue to shorten toes and move to other areas in order to avoid sable fish, which is being found from the beaches to the deep in very large schools. Sales have slowed as the mix of bottom fish is limited that our plant is producing. Currently, we are looking to the future and we are already in a phase one of the redesign of the Eureka plant to improve capacity on our dock and in our processing rooms, and which alone this year has cost almost three quarters of a million dollars. Phase two, once all the permits are in place, will be the next step and we'll add rock cotton sole machines and packaging machines to increase the production capacity of the plant and increase the catches of the ground fish vessels. Overall, we're looking at a phase two will be an investment of seven, several million dollars. As we look to the future over the next five to seven years, we are changing how we handle ground, ground fish from the catch to unloading to processing. We now have ways to extend shelf life of all ground fish products and which will allow us to compete against swai, bassa, and tilapia. We need consistent supply to compete against the farm products. This will allow us to increase limits and increase sales. In closing, I actually ask support to alternate three with both sub option threes with no more than 65.5% of trawl stable being caught with fixed gear. At this time, I want to thank the council for their work on this issue and the opportunity to testify remotely today. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Sincata. Let's see if there are any questions. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Joe, for your testimony. You may have heard uh, earlier Jonathan Gonzalez uh, mention uh, the purchase of salmon and payment of uh, salmon revenue and I'm hoping you in, in Eureka and I'm hoping you might elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so I can. So basically we have unloading stations in Fort Bragg, Bodega Bay and San Francisco. So the product is unloaded in those three ports uh, due to the, due to the um, limits that are placed and then brought all the way back to Eureka to be packed and processed and shipped out. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Um, now we have Michelle Longo Eater, and of course I probably butchered that name as well, and followed by Bob. So I don't know if you're together or separate, but please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Longo Etter. My husband is Bob Etter. We own Timmy Boy out of Newport and have participated in trawl IQ and gear switching since its inception. I'm only going to address alternatives one and three today. Please note, I'm not part of the fixed gear gap group or their statement, except as follows. One, preference is that you take no action. Or secondly, that if you do go forward, um, analyze alternative one and three. 
This is an allocation decision. Magnuson requires you to consider current and historical harvesters, employment and harvesting and processing sectors, and investments made in and dependence upon the fishery. Magnuson specifically mandates that when creating a limited access privilege, that the opportunity goes to those persons who substantially participate in a certain sector of the fishery. We oppose alternative one, whether it's in current form or if I understand it correctly, as proposed by Mr. Anderson. The reason, even though we qualify uh, to receive an any gear endorsement as currently proposed. Alternative one will take the balance of quota share from quota share owners and allocate any gear designation to quota share, quota share owners who have never participated in gear switching. They would have no history, they have no previous participation, and yet they would have the opportunity to use any gear. And we submit that that is absolutely not consistent with Magnuson. Alternative one also creates havoc in a marketplace that has been operating smoothly and efficiently. We've leased quota share from other trawl fishermen. Under alternative one, and those same quota share owners will have but 29% of um, their quota available as any gear to lease. We support alternative three um, as a preliminary preferred alternative. Under alternative three, we're asked to recommend options that exclude fellow participants from gear switching, although some may not have invested as completely as we have. That's an awful feeling, but to qualify for an endorsement, we recommend the option that is most restrictive. And as to poundage allowance, we recommend options one or two. Option three, which only allows 6.5%, is just too low given our historic participation, dependence, and the stated council policy. Finally, regarding a concern about endorsed permits being fished or multiple permits being fished, the vessel limit of 4.5% is still applicable and individual loaner, ownership limits of 3% um, would also still apply. So um, there are currently uh, constraints against excessive accumulation that would exist under alternative three. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you very much, Michelle. Questions for Michelle, Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Michelle, for your testimony. Uh, I just wanna clarify, uh, you said in your statement that you support Alt-3 as PPA, but 6.5 is much too low, which would be the six permits under um, Alt-3 sub-options, three for both. Can you please elaborate on which sub-options you're in support of? Um, sub-option one is an option that provides, I think for the um, average uh, between 2011 um, to 2016 of the years fished. And so that um, takes into consideration and recognizes the historic level of participation of gear switching as well as the investment. The second option is um, um, option two is one that looks at the, I believe the highest amount of poundage landed during that control period of 2011 to 2016. And then also then takes um, subtracts that from 29% and distributes that to those qualifying quota share owners. So again, that recognizes um, the council's stated policy of, of um, reflecting the historic participation of 29%. Thank you. Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Michelle, for uh, being here. Something you said, I'm, I just want to make sure I, I, I understood because I think I, I have a different understanding, but you thought on, on alternative one, in, in comparing that to the idea, Mr. Anderson, the, 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 the mixture between alternative one and alternative three, yeah, I think we're still absorbing a bit. Alternative, that, the new one, new, the Phil's idea would only create 12.5% of any gear quota share. Alternative one would, would create 29% of any gear quota share. 
and it, the the people who um, qualify as the fixed gear or gear switching criteria get to keep 100% of their quota share as any if it complies with the control date with uh, any gear. So you said something about it going to um, folks that didn't have a connection to gear switching and, and why wouldn't you prefer there be more any gear quota in the fishery? Alternative one has the highest, which was with the council last November, identified as 29%. Um, and now we're again talking about less than half that for some reason. But yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm understanding that you are um, probably fish more quota than you than you own. And so yeah, I hope I'm making sense here and to see if you had some responses. Through the chair, I'll be frank, um, Mr. Niles. It's a little bit difficult for me to um, unpack the question, and and that's not because of you, um, but because of me. Um, alternative one, in terms of it qualifies what we we would qualify that which. Um, we currently own under um, the current proposal. Um, but what our practice has been is to lease um, fish. We have leased 60% um, uh, of our total um, trawl IQ landings. So we have been very dependent um, on leasing. And what alternative one does is takes those quota share owners that we've been able to lease, you know, say if they had 50,000 pounds, um, now, even if we have access to that, they would only have 29% available as any gear type. And so it, it, it does two things. It reduces quota share owners' ability to lease quota share to fixed gear operations. And then it also gives the balance of the quota share that doesn't auto, you know, come off the top to those who qualify. It gives all quota share owners an opportunity to use any gear. And, and to me, that's enormously um, uh, redistrib redistributive in that um, you're opening up the opportunity and expanding the possibility for gear switching to people who've never uh, done so. And so um, I don't think from a policy standpoint that that's really what the council wants to do. Um, um, we, we lose um, our access to fishing while creating opportunity for others that you know, they're not going to use or opens it to new entrants. Corey. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for running and sorry for the confusing question. I think you unpacked it quite well and I'll just leave, but I, th I think if I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but alternative one, well, I, in hearing that you prefer no action, alternative one um, makes the most any gear quota available and, and what people are talking about alternative three there would be much less and, and the folks you're talking about would, wouldn't have any, any gear quota, but it could be my misunderstanding. And, and thank you for, for the response. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands. So um, thank you very much. Is uh, Bob Etter going to testify as well or did your testimony cover his uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will. Oh, welcome, Bob. Okay, Mr. Mr. Chairman, council members, good afternoon. I'm Bob Adder. For reasons already presented to the council, we support status quo, no action on this issue. In 2011, when we moved into the trial IQ program, we moved all in. Our family bought an active trawler, its trawl permit, full portfolio of quota shares, and all the gear, $1.3 million. 
From the get-go, our intention was to focus on trapping sablefish through the gear switching feature built into the Trawl IQ program. Gear switching is not some kind of loophole in the program. It was presented as an encouraged opportunity. We rebuilt the boat, now 54 years old, to make it the safest, most effective platform for the job. Another $1.2 million. Aside from the rebuild year 2012, we have participated every season to the greatest extent possible, including purchase of more quota share, another $0.6 million, while leasing every year the majority of our catch. Gear switching under this program is not an augmentation to our business model, it is primary. It is bread and butter. We are just as committed, committed to this program as any other trawl permit holder. As such, we should not be demoted to second class citizenship. If the council decides to adopt a preliminary preferred alternative, we agree with the GMT and GAP recommendations to drop alts two and four and with their rationale for doing so. As someone who checks all the boxes, meets all the criteria for investment, involvement, and production, the only alternative that makes sense to us is alternative three. If the council sees gear switching as a problem that needs to be addressed and controlled, I can't see how it would be appropriate to choose an alternative such as number one, which opens a restricted version of gear switching to an increased number of participants, thereby diluting any remaining opportunity for established participants such as ourselves. Please recall the elements from Magnuson quoted by my wife, Michelle Enner, regarding reallocation of the resource. To summarize, our first choice is no action. Second choice, alternative three. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob, for your comments. Questions, Corey Niles? Thanks, Bob, for um, being here. I guess on your last statement, how would um, alternative one allow more new entrance to to fix gear fishing than no action i'm not i'm not following you there and maybe i misunderstood i think corey that michelle answered that question a, a few minutes ago but um with with 29 percent of going going to any gear uh, is uh, maybe I don't understand this correctly, but I thought that anyone with a permit is free to enter into gear switching if they can round up some of that 29%, you know, whether they had history or not. Correct? Corey? Okay, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, but I think I get what you're saying. But the only difference I would see is under no action they can go after all of it 100%. So there's more quota for fixed gear folks to go after than 29%. Is that, is that basically it? I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, under, under no action, uh, a person could lease what, whatever, uh, as we have, whatever a, a willing lessor wants to lease to, to a gear switcher or, or to a trawler. Um, what am I missing, Corey? It must be me, Bob, but the, uh, no, cause the, the only difference between this alternative one, um, well, is, is the least, uh, alternative one is the least restrictive of the action alternatives on the table right now. And it's the pool of any gear quota open would be definitely smaller than no action. And if that's what you're saying, I agree. But yeah, thank you for, thank you for the response. 
All right, uh, Jessica under, Watson. Under, uh, under alternative three, um, the first two options, not the not the not the third option. I I think we have an opportunity to remain pretty much whole. And as as traditional participants, and that's where our support lies. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Bob, for your testimony. If I'm understanding correctly, based on the conversation you've had with Mr. Niles, is the issue you're having with Alternative One that when you after those with historical participation um, receive their quota share that then all IFQ participants then get a percentage of what's remaining? Is that the issue you're having, that those participants may not have had the same amount of historical participation that you are talking about here? Am I understanding yeah. that's your viewpoint? Yes, that's correct. And, and, and for, for a long-term participant like ourselves, rather than leasing the majority of our fish from two or three different parties, uh, I think in, in Dr. Seeger's uh, presentation, he, he said we may have, people may have to round up through 60 or more um, to buy a little chunk here and a little chunk there. And uh, that will be, uh, that would be a chaotic and competitive market compared to the status quo, which, which, which to our mind has worked very smoothly with willing lessors and lessees. Thank you. Further questions of Bob? Thank you, Bob. Uh, Mark Cooper, followed by Paul Kujala. Excuse me, Mark Cooper, followed by Paul Quila. Mark, are you with us? I don't see Mark Cooper on the attendee list. So, Paul Quila, are you with us? Oh, you're here. Better still. Yes. I, uh, good afternoon, council, or chair, council, staff. Um, so my name is Paul Quila. I'm a year-round bottom trawler from Warrington, Oregon. Um, I'm one of the people prosecuting the very fishery we are trying to help here. I've put everything into this, just like other people. I've had to adapt and reinvent myself in many times. Um, just to stay fishing in the business. So when people tell me that I have to give up control of my fish because they can do better at managing it, I'm supposed to be okay with it. And I'm not. Uh, I'm not okay with it. I've given, up, I've given up enough and continue to every year. I don't make money on leasing and trading quota. I use the quota I have that I have bought and am buying to acquire the quota I need to continue fishing every year, year after year. Um, nobody has convinced me that they can manage, manage this quota better than, I, than myself. The first two things uh, boats will want to know when delivering more Dover is the price and the volume. And I think this is something that we haven't talked that much about or analyzed that much. As far as I know, uh, the price elasticity of the Dover hasn't been studied to the degree that we would like. And correct me if I'm wrong, because I know I saw some of this today and I didn't see the backstory to it. Um, so I could be wrong, but you know, when you make assumptions on, obviously you have to make assumptions, but if you, if you deliver more volume, the price is gonna go down somewhat. I'm curious where those price points would be given different volumes. So we basically know it's gonna go down some, but I don't know where. And so like as a boat, the first thing I would say is, okay, well, how much can I deliver and at what price? Okay, so now if we can figure out some kind of price for in the volume, well then the next thing a boat's gonna do is say, okay, I'm gonna weigh that and the profitability of that versus my other fisheries that I can go do. And so I think the comparison 
should be made between, okay, the profitability in the trawl fishery or after these changes are made in where is that boat going to, uh, if he doesn't skip a different fishery, if it's not more profitable for him to be trawling than crabbing, shrimping, whiting, pollock, you name it, then he's not going to be in that trawl fishery delivering that, that product. So it'd be interesting for me to see how those play out. Um, because, well, because it's, uh, I think it's something that we haven't talked very much about. Um, and so what I would be afraid of is, uh, you know, and also the other thing is there still is an avenue for people to get fish, to get quota to the trawl sector. So is any change you're going to make enough of a factor for that boat to forego his other fisheries to come in and deliver it? And so I would be skeptical whether it is. And, uh, well, okay, so my time's up. So anyway, well, thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Let's see if there are any questions of Paul. Uh, Jessica Watson has her hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Paul, for your testimony. Can you, you talked about owning and investing in quota share. Can you elaborate a bit on your business model for bartering with that strategy and making that investment? So... Okay, when the whole IQ thing comes in, everything's now it's market driven. Now I have to go. I have X amount of quota that I was buying already. And I have to try to prosecute a fishery year round. So I have to use whatever I got to fish, either fish exactly what I have, or I want to focus on something where I make money. Okay, so I focus on Petroli for the most part in the last handful of years. I take my black cod since I can make more money fishing Petroli. I trade that, I need to lease a bunch of Petroli in. So I try to trade the black cod for Petroli quota. Um, sometimes you can't do that because somebody has to be willing to let go of it. So it may not, might not be the same person. So sometimes you pay cash for the, for the Petroli quota and then you hope to get cash back to backfill or whatever. The difference when you just pluck out the, uh, in my case, when you pluck out the black cod and say, we're gonna drive down the value of that, drive down the lease rate on that, now, when I go lease Petroli, I'm still paying full tilt. I'm still paying just as much as anybody. Everybody's charging me full tilt for that. But then my black cod's not worth anything because you've limited the pool and you've restricted it to the point where you've limited my pool I can lease to. So it hurts me. I mean, you know, and, and it costs a lot of money to lease fish all, you know, every year. And so that hurts my bottom line. So anyway, and I just do it to keep fishing. That's, I, I guess, I don't know. Did I answer it good enough? Okay. You did. Thank you. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for your testimony today. I um, thought it was interesting to hear that question about wanting to see what different price points would look like based upon volume. Um, that's certainly something which I would and have been asking for in terms of economic analysis of what this really is going to mean to all of our fishermen on the West Coast. Um, but you mentioned, hey, depending on what those price points look like, I might end up moving into other fisheries. And I guess I'm just wondering how feasible that is for you or for other shoreside bottom trawl fishermen um, in terms of moving into other fisheries, is is that really feasible or is that a, what does that look like? And kind of coupled with that, we, you've, you spoke to it in terms of pricing, but if this for some unknown reason works out, uh, not the way any of us intended, if we make a decision for one of the alternatives, do you still have that ability to move into other fisheries? Uh, Chair, so, I guess what I was actually uh, more referring not so much for myself because I went ahead and completely invested in the trawl side, the bottom trawl side of things. But, you know, if other people are going to come in and catch more Dover, um, they're going to have to forego shrimping and crabbing and fisheries that they already do currently. I guess that's where I was meaning more so is that currently there's, you know, there's an influx of, uh, fish like starting about now till the end of the year in between shrimp and crab or after whiting and then before crab and and then in the springtime when people are switching back well if you want a year-round supply which is what the cannery is always saying and everything 
um, which is why I stayed dragging, then people are going to have to give up their shrimp season, their hake season to fish Dover and whatever to supply that because they need the time to do it. And uh, so it's going to have to be more profitable than those other fisheries. And that's, that's where I, <laughs> I question whether it's going to be to the extent that, um, that it makes a significant difference, that this makes a significant difference in that equation. Um, the, the little, the cheaper lease rate on the black hod, whether it all really hinges on that or not, or whether that's going to be enough to, to make the profitability good enough. And, and like I say, I'm going to be one giving it up. So I kind of want to see what <laughs> I'd like to see more, more info on that, whether it's really going to play out the way we think. Krista. Thank you. So I, I have a follow-up question on that and thank you for that clarification. Um, so for guys such as yourself, who've made the decision to be 12 month a year bottom trawl. Do you see the opportunity for them to be able to diversify if we make a decision that does not work for their style of fishing? Meaning gear switching wasn't the problem? Uh, Chair, I, I'm gonna need you to repeat that one more time. So, um, so for shoreside bottom trawlers such as yourself, um, if the numbers don't pencil out uh, or we, it turns out that gear, gear switching was not the constraining factor, um, but your lease price is now not great, uh, and you don't have the market to, to no. go out and source things like Petrole that are higher value, do you have the opportunity um, to get into other fisheries um, to support your business, your family, your crew, all of these other folks that will be impacted by this decision? Um, Chair, uh, you know, I, I don't know the answer to that. I I just don't, it depends on what, how it plays out. I'd have to, so I, I, I can't give you a clear, I mean, it's gonna hurt, but who knows how much, I don't, I, so I, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't predict what, what I would have to do or might do. Corey Niles. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, and thanks, Paul. I think, yeah, I th I'm, I'm glad people ask questions because I heard your words at the beginning <laughs> that, were, that were, weren't sinking in what you meant. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, the magic, so to speak, of the IFQ program is leasing and transferring um, around to, to people who, who need it. Um, and it's superior to, you know, us sitting up here trying to direct it to folks. But I, so I guess what I'm not understanding you, um, yeah, I, underst I understand um, if the council were to change this program, so you had you had all your quota was trawl only sable fish, you'd have fewer people to deal with in terms of um, you know bargaining with. But we're also hearing that people are everyone is having trouble finding sable fish, so, you know, from the whiting folks to the to bottom trawlers. So you said you would you would it would. I don't think you said it would be worthless. Um, but why, why wouldn't you be able to um, trade your, your sable fish with, a, with another trawler or, or someone who does midwater or, you know, whiting, rockfish, et cetera? Um, chair. Uh, oh, I think you, you would, or maybe it would be the point where I'd just catch it, but you don't make much money on it. So, um, but what it would more often do, anytime you take, you know, potential leasers or leasees <laughs> of my fish away the market for those goes away you're constricting that market the price is going to go down some it's you know i i don't know how much um but it's also it's going to hurt my ratio when i go to trade it for petrole so i'm going to get less petrole so now i'm going to have to scrounge up more money or to get more petrole or or make a decision just to well, I, well do something else so yes, you can, you'd still be able to trade it. I, I would imagine if you wanted to, it just would, uh, it would totally change the economics behind it for me. Yeah. All right, any further questions? All right, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gonna go back to uh, Mark Cooper. I see him online. Mark, are you with us? 
Um, we need to unmute. You're, you appear to be muted, but. <clears throat> Mark, I'll, I'll ask you to reach out to Chris Kleinschmidt at the council office. His contact information is on the website to try to straighten out your audio, but in the interest of time, we'll come back to you. I'll go to uh, Bernie Burkholder. All right. I know Lori Steele is in the house. So Lori, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Lori Steele. I am the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. Uh, we represent um, shoreside processing companies along the West Coast, including the vast majority of process shoreside processors uh, in the ground fish fishery. Um, and I'm testifying in support of alternative three sub options, three and three. Uh, next slide. So, and I'm going to move as quickly as I can. Um, this map uh, displays most of the ports and fishing communities that have been historically important in the ground fish fishery and continue to be important. Um, many of the communities shown in this map support, did support a year-round ground fish fishery in the past and want to do so again in the future. I need to reiterate and emphasize that the ground fish fishery is the only fishery on the West Coast that has the potential to operate in high volume on a year round basis. Every other fishery is seasonal. Dungeness crab, shrimp, whiting, salmon and tuna. Ground fish is the only chance we have to keep our workforce employed year round and keep our processing plants operating year round. The take home message here is that year round ground fish processing provides year round jobs which increases coastal infrastructure stability and enhances our opportunities in all other fisheries. There's a multiplier effect here and year round ground fish processing provides widespread community benefits. Next slide. Um, Access to, the, uh, to sable fish for the trawl sector affects our entire ground fish fishery. This is not about one company and it's not about one port or one community. Uh, since my time here, WCSPA, the West Coast Seafood Processors Association, has expanded from five member companies in 2015 to eight member companies now in 2022. To me, this is a clear sign of the investment that our shoreside processing sector is making in our fishing communities. These companies are here to stay. It's exciting for me, it should be exciting for all of us, especially after the pandemic, because there's so much potential on the horizon in our fishing communities. All of these eight member companies own brick and mortar processing facilities on the West Coast. All want to stri survive, thrive, and support all of our fisheries. All of them are striving for year round production and year round employment all represent critical infrastructure for our fishing communities and all of them have the capacity to process ground fish. Next slide. A lot has changed in recent years. We've been asking the council for more than five years now to take action and during that time we've seen major changes, but our message is the same. Sablefish is more critical than ever now for the ground fish trawl sector. Dover to sablefish catch ratios on targeted trips are much closer to four to one now. We heard they're three to one in some areas. And the bottom line is that vessels that are targeting Dover sole cannot access enough sablefish to fish year round. Maximizing the availability of sablefish to the trawl fishery is critical for increasing attainment of all of our ground fish species, meeting the FMP goals and objectives and achieving OY. Next slide, thank you. Yeah, in recent years, major investments have been made by shoreside processors. You've heard a lot of it today in terms of ground, ground fish processing equipment, market research and development, workforce and team training, and workforce housing. Uh, millions and millions of dollars have been invested and continue to be invested, especially just in the last two to three years. 
There are major efforts underway to reestablish and grow domestic and international markets for all of our groundfish species. We are doing the hard work to reestablish our groundfish markets. We're doing the research. We're working with buyers. We're working hard to get our products in the USDA markets. We're doing everything we can to get this fishery uh, redeveloped, and uh, we're asking for the council's help in doing that. Redeveloping the markets, again, as you've heard, not only takes significant time and money, but it requires a consistent volume of product to be reliable. I, I mean, uh, predict on a predictable basis. I'm sorry, I'm trying to go really fast. Um, next slide. Um, increasing Dover sole attainment increases overall ground fish attainment. Sablefish is an important component of the multi-species trawl fishery, and it is a value contributor and multiplier for ground fish trips. One pound of trawl caught sablefish equals a lot more than one pound of trawl caught sablefish. There's no uncertainty about this. This is not a single species fishery, it's multi-species, and we are trying to catch and process all of them. So that's what I'm gonna illustrate through the next three slides, which I'm just going to run through very quickly. Everybody has copies of these um, in the briefing book materials. These are just some graphics of uh, fish tickets from, from trips that occurred this year, targeting bottom fish. And really, um, you know, the take home point here is that we process a wide variety of multi-species and we need the sable fish in order to be able to do that. Um, you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, this one is showing uh, about a three and a half to one catch ratio of Dover sole to sablefish. So um, you can also see a lot of quantities of other ground fish that are being caught on that trip. And then the last slide, uh, like this one, and again, uh, the point here is that sablefish is critical to catch Dover sole in quantity, but it's also an important component of the trawl fishery, and it's a multiplier for ground fish catch. Ah, I'm running out of time. Um, okay, next slide. Trawl, I, I prepared a 10-minute presentation. Um, and the next slide shows you uh, trawl caught sablefish, and the point here is that Sablefish is not just about catching other fish. It is a very valuable product to the trawl fishery. Next slide. Um, this is a high quality product. Trawl caught sablefish is not a cheap product. If fishing isn't like it used to be, and that's a good thing. I think the days when fixed gear sablefish was valued much higher than trawl caught sablefish are ending. Trawl caught sablefish can compete in any market. It's valuable for the boats and it's critical for our sector. Last slide, um, I will just, I'll just leave it up there. Um, we, we support uh, alternative three and sub options three. Regarding the hybrid alternative, um, I can totally appreciate the simplicity of it. And uh, assuming uh, other alternatives are eliminated, I would like to see al the hybrid alternative move forward with both qualification options two and three. Uh, most importantly, I don't want the addition of this alternative to preclude the council from selecting a PPA at this meeting. Um, I would love to see the council select PPA and move this issue forward. Thank you. Lori, great job. Thanks very much. And thank you for the slides. They're helpful. Any questions of Lori? Jessica. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Lori just because it was quick and this and the slide was there can you um, please clarify with the fish ticket summaries is that a single fish ticket that you're showing summary for or is that a larger summary uh yes thank you for the question um these are single fish ticket uh uh slides so uh for example on this trip that's on the screen right now which was taken on april 25th um this trip landed uh, 90,889 pounds in total, um, 66,000 Dover sole, 12,000 sable fish, along with Rex sole, Petrali sole, long nose skate, and a number of other species. Thank you. Further questions? I'm looking very carefully. Vice Chair Pettinger. Thank you, Chair Gronick. Um, Lori, I saw you in Astoria and we had a discussion about the kind of the where we're at as far as the processors, um, see more processors involved in the fish, in the, in the ground fish. 
uh, and you're much more upbeat, you just kind of maybe expand on your on uh, your insights as a director of the West Coast Seafood Process Association, as far as you where you think we're at, as far as our our trajectory. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, this is um, it's. I think that we are really on the cusp here of being able to redevelop this fishery on a high volume year round basis and really reinvigorate and grow and support our fishing communities up and down the coast. Um, and that's why I mentioned it. I mean, this was, uh, you know, post pandemic, we had our annual meeting and dinner. Um, I had eight companies there. You know, when I started here, we only had five companies in the association. The companies that have been have come into the association now are excited to be part of the communities. They're excited to be part of the fisheries, part of the association. And it's really um it's really exciting for me because it really does feel like we're at the doorstep here of of having all of the components to make this fishery work. Um, I view the increase in the number of processors in my association as a clear sign that that shoreside processing is making investments into their community and that we're here to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Corey Niles. Thanks, Lori. I know it's looking at the time, but also feeling feeling bad about making people rush through their their, their testimony. Um, and you, so you didn't able you weren't able to explain this slide here. I'm sure as as, as much as you had planned. Um, and trying to ask this the right way, but on your second bullet there, you're asking us to maximize flexibility. Yeah, I think as many you point out and many would view it, we, we are reducing this, any, any action alternative would reduce the flexibility, which you just heard Paul um, explain to us. So not to sound too, uh, I, I really enjoyed the exchange with the Gap and, 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 and Bob and Jeff Lackey, and I, I said they should get their podcast together and, and debate the issues, and I would, I would listen. But so what would your pitch to, to Paul be about, you know, reducing his flexibility? What's in it? What's in it for him? Um, well, thank you for the question. Um, you know, not, I, I don't know if I want to specifically, um, respond to Paul, um, or, you know, his particular situation. Um, what I mean by this bullet in terms of maximizing flexibility, um, is within the trawl sector, um, for the boats that need sable fish in order to prosecute, a year round fishery and in order to be able to make their fishing operations work year round, keeping trawl allocated sable fish in the trawl sector gives them more flexibility to plan their to plan their fishing operations for the year with some certainty that they're going to be able to get the fish out of the water. Um, so my my point on that is that keeping trawl fish in the trawl sector will maximize the opportunities for trawlers to plan to get more fish out of the water, which will increase attainment for many ground fish species. Um, opportunities change. Um, you know, no opportunities are permanent. Um, and this is really, uh, this would provide different opportunities, which in my opinion, increase flexibility. Hey, thank you. And I, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, put the question like that, or I did, but I be, didn't mean to put you on the spot, but I appreciate the answer. Thank you. All right. Any uh, further questions for Lori? Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much. All right. I, we, we skipped over Bernie Burkholder because there was no response. I don't see Bernie, um, connected through ring central although i do see one call in listener um bernie is is your number well if you're there we don't see your name so it's hard to uh, open your microphone if we don't see your name so i'm going to give you a minute to work that out or to work with chris kleinschmidt and I'm going to go on to Rex Leach. Rex. 
Thank you. Can you hear me? You bet. Thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. I, for the record, am Rex Leach. I have two trawl vessels in Charleston, Oregon, and have been relying on ground fish trawling since 1980. I, too, have invested many dollars in my businesses to make them profitable. I support Alternative 3 with a 6.5% maximum for fixed gear attainment. This alternative will provide my trawl vessels access to more stable which in turn allow us to catch more ground fish as a whole. The end result will be more fish coming out of the water. This in turn will help my processor and processors up and down the coast sustain year round employment and capacity for non trawl fishery. This also gives our local fishing communities the best long term chance of survival. Four months harvesting just short of 400,000 pounds of mixed ground fish. It's not a great volume of fish, but it's the start of a ground fish comeback. With more stable available, we can harvest much, much more ground fish, keeping processors and vessels busy year round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rex. Are there questions for Rex? All right, thank you very much, Rex. Thank you. I, I don't know if Mark Cooper is ready yet, uh, if we're connected. Apparently not. We'll come back to Mark Cooper. So Mike Rutherford, welcome, Mike. I don't see Mike on my list, although I do know that he submitted some written comments, so we have that. Uh, I will come back to... Mike, Tim Hobbs, there you are. You see your hand up, we'll unmute you and go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, can you hear me? You bet. Great, thank you and members of the council. I am Tim Hobbs, I'm an attorney with the law firm of KNL Gates. I represent Jim Sievers and Jeff Lackey, individuals engaged in the trawl sector of the fishery. My clients have long supported limits on gear switching in order to improve the trawl fishery, maximize yields from our ground fish stocks, and benefit fishing communities along the entire coast. My clients continue to support alternative three with sub options three and three for the endorsement limit and qualification. I'd like to address national standard four. As we all know, allocations will produce winners and losers. That is why allocation decisions are difficult. But from a legal perspective, the fact that some participants who have gear switched in the past may lose that opportunity going forward does not render the action unfair or inequitable under National Standard 4. Numerous court decisions have affirmed that principle. NIMS's guidelines say that to be fair and equitable, an allocation should be rationally connected to the achievement of optimum yield or with the furtherance of a legitimate FMP objective. We are not achieving optimum yield for several ground fish species. We are stranding a lot of fish and a lot of dollars that could be flowing into our coastal communities. The objective here is to improve the trawl sector's attainment of its allocations and better achieve optimum yield over the long term, as National Standard 1 mandates. The objective is also achieve, to achieve FMP Goals 2 and 3, to maximize value and yields in the trawl fishery, and also to achieve the fundamental purpose of Amendment 20, which is full utilization of the trawl sector's allocations. To do this, a change to the status quo or a restructuring of fishing privileges is necessary. And the National Standard 4 guidelines on fairness and equity expressly allow for that. We are concerned that diverting a significant portion of Northern Sablefish trawl allocation to be used by fixed gear will effectively lower the ceiling on overall trawl attainment and the ability 
to maximize yields and value in the trawl fishery in the future. In other words, doing that could operate as a de facto reduction of optimum yield, which would not comport with National Standard 1. And it would also impede FMP objectives 2 and 3 to maximize value and yields in the trawl fishery. The wording of those objectives is important. They require maximization of yields and value. And Amendment 20 sought full utilization of the trawl sector's allocations. Diverting a significant portion of the allocation for a potentially constraining species will not allow for maximization, but will dictate something less. That's the concern. And that is why we continue to support alternative three with sub options three and three. It allows those who have met a participation threshold and made long-term investments the ability to gear switch, but it reserves the vast majority of the trawl sector's sablefish allocation for trawlers to use that quota to get other species out of the water too. We've heard comments that the council must be more certain of the benefits of an action where negative impacts to some are expected to occur. And the council can certainly consider that, but we do not think that that is how a court would examine the question. The legal question is whether there is some evidence in the record to support the council's determination, evidence suggesting that putting limits on gear switching now will improve trawl sector attainment in the future and that the potential rewards outweigh the potential downsides. And there is plenty of evidence for that. Tim, I need to ask you to wrap up. Sure. We've heard much of that evidence today, um, and that evidence provides the council with a rational basis to act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Tim? Corey Niles. Yeah. yeah um, thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank Tim. And you have um, feeling bad again about you getting cut short there. I don't know if you heard me speak up prior to the uh, we broke for lunch, but I, I appreciate your look at National Standard Four and, and the rational connection and optimum yield. I guess in 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 my fisheries experience, education, et cetera, that, um, the way I see it is we set up an IFQ program that that puts um, the choice of, of of where the highest and best use of fish into the into the industry's hands. Um, so what we're being asked now is to to reduce that and basically to lower the price, to lower the competition and and, and give people less choice of where the fish should go. You know, that we don't, you know, if I, I'm sure you reviewed the litigation around Amendment 20 and, and decisions on whether to provide um, quota to processors. And I think, you know, you know, the short of it is we don't regulate processors. We don't, competition in the processing sector is a good thing. Um, I think as Brad pointed out um, last time we were up here, Brad Penninger, we, we, the, the thing we'd really like is more entrance into the processing sector. So what is your chain of cause and event effect here, your rational connection, connection between reducing competition in the fishery and, and if, uh, if, if yield goes up, if landings go up, but the value goes down and efficiency goes down, what is your, what is your response to that? Well, I, I guess I don't see it as a matter of reducing competition. I, what I see it as is, is removing a potential constraint. And I think if you listen to the testimony that we've heard today from those in the, in the trawl sector, I mean, what, what is being envisioned here is a revitalization of the fishery up and down the entire coast. You know, and that's, that's the ultimate benefit, the ultimate goal. Um, to have thriving fishing communities with healthy trawl and other sectors involved. And we're having some trouble getting there. And the thinking is that one of the reasons for that is gear switching and that there is uncertainty that's created by allowing a large amount of the trawl sector's sablefish allocation to be essentially taken out and, and used by fixed gear. That is, as we've heard from processors, that uncertainty is inhibiting their investments and long-term business planning. And so the goal here, it's not about reducing competition for that quota. I think it's making sure that it's available 
so that you can take that one pound of sable fish and turn it into five or six pounds of other fish along with it and thereby increase yields overall. Corey, do you have a follow-up? Um, just for sake of time, and I'll, I think I, I think I got your. You, it is the uncertainty in the in in the chilling effect on investment is is your main theory on the cause and effect of what what would change here. And um, I you, think yeah. that's certainly a part of it. I mean, I think we've even heard testimony today, though, that I mean, as of right now, it's constraining. All right. Thank you very much, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, few times in your testimony, uh, you seem to indicate that an allocation to fixed gear um, would be a de facto reduction in the OI for trawl. Um, you mentioned that fish would be taken out and used by fixed gear um, at the detriment uh, of the trawl uh, sector. But I'm wondering if uh, you considered what the proposal suggest, which is that um, depending on what alternative we're talking about, that uh, shares would be reissued as all gear shares and trawl shares. And my understanding of the all gear shares would allow the use of those shares by trawl gear users if they wish. So maybe you can speak to that. Sure. I, I certainly that that could be the outcome, but I think that doesn't solve the uncertainty that's present. Right. And I think that's that's one of the issues. And so by allowing any gear to be used, you know, you know fixed gear could be one of those gears. Right. And so that the fish caught by fixed gear would then not be available to the trawl sector, thereby potentially stranding you know, more other species that could be co-caught along with it. I, I think it doesn't solve the uncertainty issue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You, you answered my question. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right. Any Thank further you. questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to uh, Bernie Burkholder, who I believe uh, is is with us and unmuted. So please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, my name is Bernie Burkholder, and I represent the Buck Buckingham Fisheries, Fishing Vessel Buckingham, and Fishing Vessel Southeast. Uh, we have si invested significant capital and time in the West Coast Crawl Program. We have attended countless pre and post program meetings, and we followed the guidelines and rules established. Our fishing has been extraordinarily clean, 100% observer coverage or EM coverage. There has never been a fishery that I felt better about participating in, although there's been a lot of fisheries that I've made significantly more money in. The West Coast Crawl Program has realized only limited success to date primarily because the promise of higher X vessel prices for fish were never real, realized. Uh, the real problem is the excessive bureaucracy and the program costs, and they mount on smaller business and smaller vessels, more so than on the larger. At first, this problem was expressed by the processing and some trawlers in the sector as there was not enough black cod quota available to them and the quota that was available was too high priced. This, I do not believe is really a reality. You've got, again, you've got 1.3 million pounds in the north, 1.4 million pounds in the south. And if they really needed that fish to get some more Dover out, it's there. There's all kinds of Dover in the south. Why don't you go, you know, go down there and, and do something about it. Uh, maybe there could be a problem someday. I don't see it now. Uh, I, I think that, you know, what I'm hearing and it really concerns me here is that, you know, if you only take this fish from a traditional user who has paid, who has participated, who has invested in their local and the community, 
and give it to somebody else, not not have them pay for it, but just reallocate it to somebody else. You know, everything's going to be fine. My neighbor's cow can jump over the moon. Well, what happens if the cow doesn't jump over the moon? And I can tell you, I don't think it will. You know, we've seen Dover fisheries. There's been a lot of fisheries that have come and gone. Right now, you can go farm tilapia and make more, more than Dover. It is not a better fish. I agree that Dover should be out there, but the consumer is not seeing it that way. And I think it's wrong to, and again, I'm, I'm one that I owned all my permits. I owned my, uh, my uh, fishing. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm done here with time. So I just feel like I waited all day here to try to, and, I, and I'm going to be okay, I think, with what whatever happens. But Michelle and Bob Adder, there's a lot of other people that aren't going to be okay. And I just don't feel good about sitting there and looking at, and watching this. So anyway, that's that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Bernie. Are there any questions for Bernie? Thank you very much, Bernie. Uh, Kurt Cochran, followed by Travis Hunter. And then we'll come back and see if we have a couple of folks who didn't respond. So, Kurt? Yeah, can you get me? You bet. Yeah, thank you, Chairman and members of the council for a chance to talk. I may drop out since my battery and all my devices is running out listening today. But uh, and I appreciate everybody that's testified today. You guys are finally getting to see the importance of this issue to all sides and what it means. And I don't um, envy your job, but it's a job before you. And it's time to stop chopping bait and go fishing. This has been a long time in the pipeline, and you have a decision to make today. So I'm asking you to uh, make a PPA today of alternative three, option three, and the other three, and no more than 6.5%. Um, I don't, well, let me back up a little bit. We've already allocated Black God. We have a tiered group and, and fixed gear allocation. This is troll. I don't agree with some of what I've read about the way and, and it was meant to go, go this way. Um, we had had a fishery that had never seen Black Cod, or, I mean, excuse me, halibut. PSC before I fished in my whole life. And then when the rationalization came in, all of a sudden, it was a limiting factor. Nobody knew what it was going to be. And at a council meeting, we decided maybe this was a good option. So if you got shut down on halibut, you could maybe get something out of the water. And that's, as a fisherman's point of view, what really happened. And now we've had people seem to um, figure another way to make a different business plan. And I don't have a problem with that to a certain extent. So I'm not asking that some of the people have done that be eliminated, but I am asking you to stop any more of that type of um, access. Um, I do think that it's limiting. It's limiting a lot of things. I can bring up the elephant in the room um, that hasn't been brought up today, but you know, I fished over the spring started out at a lease rate. I needed black cost at a lease rate around 20 cents, then it went to 25 cents, then it went to 30 cents. I couldn't even get it after that. There was none on the auction block, nowhere to get it. And yes, there is probably a million pounds left in the water right now. But where you've made an uh, um, IFQ that has all these little boxes, people can't access it. And so it, it, they hold on to it and, and it just makes it hard to get out until, until that. Maybe there's some other things that should also be looked at um, down the road um, to fix some of these issues, but the council moves really slow. So I, I, I feel that that's the way to go. Um, lease rates and lease is the, the, probably the elephant in the room that's not being talked about. Um, the, the trawl fisheries already burden with buybacks and um, management fees and everything else, but the lease, lease rates um, for new entrants is hard. I know a guy that just bought a boat and he's trying to get into the trawl 
he's looking at having to lease a whole trough uh, package. If you're looking at Alaska, you look at halibut. Yeah, you know, they do everything they can to try to figure out how to limit lease and and bring down costs, whether it's owners on boards or whether it's this or that or next thing. You look at crab in Alaska when Duncan Fields was on the council. He tried to get the co-ops to, to put a, a, a set amount on lease rates. Lease rates have always been the problem. So, um, so that's that's what's driving a, a lot of that, and that's why the trawl industry is asking you to take these actions. Black cod has driven the, the trawl fishery 50 years ago when I was doing it. Today, it's it's important, and. Uh, Anyway, my time's up, but I could go on a lot more um, and, and tell you. But that's what I'd like you to pick that PPA. The uh, new option that Mr. Anderson put on the table, 12.5% um, 12, 12 is too high. And then I think uh, the editors explained pretty good where, you know, if uh, the history goes back to the original permit on the boat that they leased it from, you, know, you get more people involved and more things. and that hasn't been fleshed out very well either. So I think uh, what's in front of you is um, alternative three, option three with three and move it forward for PPA. So thank you. All right, Kurt, thanks very much. Let me see if there are any questions. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Kurt. Um, I think I heard you mention that people are holding on to their fish um, through the summer and not uh, just for their own purposes or and maybe unwilling to uh, lease it until later in the year. Um, and then you mentioned something about other ways to fix that problem, but um, we're here considering um, the gear switching proposals in front of us today. So maybe you can explain how um, the PPA alternative that you identified or that you're recommending, how that would um, mitigate for people that are holding on to their fish uh, until later in the year. Well, I think, I think in reality, it will actually, just what everybody said, um, bring down the lease rate and it will uh, have more access probably to stable fish through, throughout the year. Um, so you have, you have a lot of different groups, a lot of different boxes. Some of the groups are people that fish ground fish year round and they're trying to figure out how to get more access to, to black cod. Some groups are guys that fish whiting and they go, well, man, I'm at whiting. Um, incidental catch of black cod and some years as big some years and not so i can't really lease it out so they kind of they're holding on to it um you and you have guys that aren't really fishing that they're, they're leasing fish and they're going well if i hold on till later in the year or a different time when the fixed gear guys come on they get more value for their fish than a trawl guy does they can pay more and so They'll hold on to it till later. They'll hold on to it till the whiting needs it and the price goes up like this year. And they hold on to it until fixed year guys come out of Alaska and start process or start fixed um, fishing or or even the the local guys here and uh, and that goes up and they start putting it on the auction block. And so depending on what groups and what time of year you put your fish out there for access to it or what you're going to get for a lease rate or, or price. And, and so I believe that this option would actually lower the lease rate. That's like the one that gentleman that fishes, um, Petroli says, and it would kind of level that playing field and probably have access to people throughout the year more evenly to be able to lease fish to. Um, that doesn't mean you know, if I'm the other gentleman, I can't leverage what I need with a different species or, or uh, you know, even fished over or fish, fish something else also. But uh, but I do believe that that's how that's going to probably um, level that playing field. We still are going to have a, some other isu issues um, and they'll come up and down. And like you say, those are time for another uh, in front of us a later date. But I believe that's how these alternatives get 
get to it. I uh, I don't want to reallocate this fishery. It's not that's not wasn't the tent. It is a troll fishery. I am. You guys have a choice ahead of you. What this going to look like in twenty years, forty years, sixty years from now? Are we going to be all fish and black god and get them like I did um, as a kid on the back deck or coming to town and getting them and then selling them directly and leaving all the other fish in the water? Or are we going to have a healthy waterfront and trawl on ground fish has always been the glue that supported the infrastructure and the processing of the communities from the time I was a little kid to, to now. It's in off season. You've heard that. It's, it's not when the Pulse are going on. It's a year round. I also believe that the Dover, if we're going to get access to it, and I fish quite a bit of it, is going to have to rethink its deal. It's a, it's a high protein, a really good fish. It can t- compete with tilapia and anything else in the marketplace. But it's going to have to rethink. It's not going to be all be able to go straight on a fresh market. You're going to have, um, well, Mr. Shaughnessy probably told you the most about it. It's going to be, have to be a frozen pro- product along with your fresh product is going to go to um, the retailers and different things. So I, I think that anyway, I'm probably getting off base on your question a little bit, but the, that's how I do think it's going to bring the lease rate down. And that's, I believe a good thing. The lease is a negative part of any rationalization program for the, for the future of anybody. Thank you. All right. Any further questions for Kurt? All right, thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you for your guys' this time. Sure. Travis Hunter. Almost good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the council. Uh, Appreciate the time to speak here. I'll keep it brief. Um, My name is Travis Hunter. I'm a third generation trawler out of Eureka. Um, Up until just prior to lunch, I thought I had a pretty good idea where I was heading um, with wanting to go forward with a PPA. Um, At that time, uh, Mr. Anderson gave us something else to think about. Uh, I wished I would have had a little more time to, you know, kind of really wrap my head around it, but I think at this time, I, uh, I am ready, would be ready to uh, encourage the council to move uh, Councilman Anderson's proposal one um, with one stipulation, and that would be with using the gear switching alternative uh, for, or gear switching qualification option three from alternative three to keep it at the 6.5%. Um, I don't know if that is, is an option to do now. I, I believe that it would be within the range of alternatives. It's already been, that number's already been analyzed. Um, but that would be, that would be what I would encourage the, uh, encourage the council to do. Um, and at the same time, uh, remove, uh, alternatives two and four from any further consideration. Um, like I said, I, I like uh, a lot of people in the trawl industry, um, some of them probably had their, their testimonies written out, you know, days, weeks ahead of time. Um, I guess that gave me a little flexibility waiting until the last minute, like I often do, to figure out what I want to say up here. Um, but I, I think that maybe if people had a little bit of time to um, to figure it out that, that, that alternative, uh, the new alternative, um, with the, um, alternative three option three qualifications might make sense. Um, just a couple quick things. I really appreciate, uh, Lori Steele's comments on flexibility. You know, uh, most people, or a lot of people are thinking of flexibility as just the, option to be able to gear switch. I look at flexibility as being able to prosecute prosecute my fishery um, year round 
and and maximize my you know business plan and that's flexibility uh, means having the opportunity um, to have access to more stable fish and uh, attain more of my quota and uh, that will complete my comments thank you thank you so much travis questions for travis I'm not seeing any hands, but I have a couple of questions, mostly because I'm not familiar. So or are you an original participant in the IFQ program? Yes. Okay. Um, and are you're constrained by the lack of stable fish? Yes. And do you still have your original quota share of stable fish? Yes. We're, we were one of them that, you know, uh, when it went limited entry, the limited entry permit, was the same entity as the vessel, same entity as the quota share account, you know, same same entities up, up and down. So we, we have been able to keep our same, we have uh, in the past tried to um, trade and barter quota pounds, um, but right now, if we had some access to sable fish, um, let, let me rephrase that. At the beginning of the year, we, we have a business plan to fish all the way through the end of the year. And so we make decisions on how much stable fish we're able to, you know, use monthly or by trip by trip. So some trips we have to, you know, cut short, move away if we have to do that, uh, to keep going, um, knowing that, and we do that knowing that it is difficult to get access to sable fish. You know, we've, we're running towards the end of the year. We don't know what's going to happen with crab season. I doubt that it's going to start um, in December, but um, if we, if we had some, uh, a little more certainty, knowing in this industry, nothing is certain, but had a little more certainty that we could get some sable fish quota. And, and I hear that there's, you know, there's some out there, it's not available. People have, you know, there's a lot still left on the table. People have to be willing to, uh, to want to sell it. And at a, at a price that we'd be able to afford, we can't, we can't take a loss and do it. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think it's, I think so. And then who are these people who have this quota who aren't fishing it and aren't willing to sell it? Do you, do you have any idea who those people are? Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I know this year, especially, uh, because there was so many, uh, so much stable fish out there and every sector was running into it. Normally the whiting fleet, um, has, has released it in, you know, much sooner we knew it was going to be available. They're hanging on to it for insurance. And I understand that, but that's kind of an anomaly for this year. You know, that's not normally that doesn't happen. All right, thank you. I figure if we're catching whiting while salmon fishing, it's got to be everywhere. So, all right. Any any other questions, uh, Bush Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another dumb salmon guy. Um, so, so I, I just want to be clear. To catch up here. Um, so, what you're supporting is a little modification of uh, Phil's option or alternative, and then and then also option or alternative three to be analyzed is that is that what we're is that what you uh, through the chair mr smith yes that is correct so to be clear i am encouraging the council to move to a ppa the uh the new hybrid proposal with a modification of using the qualification option three from alternative three. I want that move forward as a PPA, but yes, for, for analysis, um, leaving one and three in and removing from consideration uh, alternatives two and four. Th thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, uh, Corey Niles. 
And, and thanks, Travis. If you can't tell, you wait to the last minute. And so uh, it, that's a good skill. Um, so the reason I'm guessing I'm Sir, I don't think I heard you say why you would support um, Phil's idea with with the six point five percent. Is uh, am I making the assumption that it's because it wouldn't create a permanent endorsement? Like how is how is it different than the um, alternative three option three, given that they both end up at six point five percent? Thanks for the question, Mr. Niles, uh, through the chair. Yes, I. Through this process, I've, you know, as as things have been analyzed, um, trying to figure out the, the best path forward to get to keeping more uh, trawl quota, sablefish quota in the trawl sector. I've flip-flopped many times, um, and I'd, I'd never been a big fan of having a for lack of a better, better term, a golden ticket endorsement, you know, on a trawl permit. Um, but thinking that that was probably the best way to, um, the best way to recognize, um, you know, substantial participation and an investment um, while keeping, retaining more of that in the, uh, more quota in the trawl sector. Um, I believe Mr. Anderson's proposal kind of alleviates some of that for me. And at the same time, I believe that it's probably simpler dealing with it at the quota share and quota pound level. It seems to be simpler and more straightforward. All right, Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Travis, for your testimony. I'm going to go back to a point uh, you were making um, with the chair in regards to um, being constrained by sa sablefish this year due to kind of this overabundance and it being held on as kind of an insurance. And this is a bit of an anomaly. So thinking about how it constrains you in other years, can you please describe those situations in which it's constraining? Um, Ms. Watson through the chair, um, it's, it's just, it's constraining in two ways. There's, there's more, there's a lot of competition for it because it's something that everybody needs. Um, and because there is a gear switching provision and in years past, uh, X vessel prices for, um, pot, caught sable fish within that um, was was much higher the lease rate they were able to pay a much higher lease rate and a lot of times uh, there's an auction and you know they, we, they price this out of it to where you know the sable fish almost becomes a lost leader uh, just to enable us to catch other species where normally I mean Sablefish adds is one of the, you know, one of the few species out there that has high value along with petroleum sole. So we don't want to just, you know, just use our sablefish as, as a uh, uh, as a as a means to catch the other fish. We also want it to add value to our to our portfolio. Thank you. All right. Anything else for Travis? All right. Thank you very much, Travis. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go back and see if we can um, track down a couple of folks. Uh, Mark Cooper. And I'm getting the nod that there's still technical difficulty there. And we also had not heard from Mike Rutherford, but I don't think I'd seen Mike on our attendee list. So, and I think otherwise we've heard from everyone. So that will conclude public comment. Our plan on this agenda item was to end with public comment. We'll return to this agenda item on Monday. Um, if there is a process question here 
from the council, raise your hand, but if any discussion or substance will take up when we return on Monday. All right, great. So um, it's 5.04, we're gonna get started on H5. I don't know that we'll get through it, but uh, we, we can't, it's also a two day agenda item. Um, so we'll get started on that. We'll be back here at 5.15.
All right, it is um, 5.15, and it is my great pleasure to hand the gavel to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger. Okay, well, thank you, Chair Grelnick, and uh, uh, before we start off here, I'd just like to acknowledge that uh, our good friend and staff officer, uh, John DeVore, this is the last, he'll be here with us tomorrow, but this is the the last uh, overview he's going to give on a groundfish item, and just like to acknowledge that and, and all years of service, so all good. So, John, take us away. Well, thank you for that, Mr. Vice Chairman uh, and Council Members. Uh, agenda item H5 uh, concerns stock definitions. Uh, the task before you is to adopt a range of alternatives for detailed analysis um, so that uh, you can consider um, a, a choice for a preliminary preferred alternative in March and a final alternative in June. Um, toward that end, uh, uh, staff prepared uh, at Council's request attachment one, which um, provides a, a proposed range of alternatives, uh, describes the management implications um, associated with those alternatives and, and, a, and a little bit of background on uh, some of the scientific information that is, uh, uh, can be used to help inform your decision. Um, in table one in that attachment provides a, a, a summary of the scientific information and, uh, you know, we acknowledge uh, right up front that that's an incomplete summary. There's more information um, out there and so we expect uh, um, to provide um, more information uh, in that detailed analysis uh, for your consideration in March. Uh, table two on that attachment is the one that folks are really focusing on since that provides the um, uh, proposed range of alternatives. And so I think, um, you know, at least the, the GMT and GAP and SSC all uh, kind of focused on table two. So that might be a, a, a good place to start. Um, we do have... Uh, besides that attachment one, and, and just to spare, cause spare the time, I, I know you've all read it and you understand what's in there. Um, I was going to go and, and, uh, go through it in more detail, but, um, I'm just going to presume that you've read that. And if you have any questions, I can certainly, uh, answer them. Um, you also have a supplemental SSC report, supplemental GMT report, and a supplemental gap report with their recommendations on this. Um, so perhaps it's best to, for me to stop right there and, and see if you do have any questions on attachment one, the task before you or any of that before um, uh, you go on to the advisory body reports. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, questions for John on his overview? Caroline. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, John. Um, I do have a question that is a little bit complicated and bear with me so I can I can walk through it a little bit. In uh, table one, which is the um, information about genetics and um, life history information, the very last page, uh, last row has vermilion and sunset listed. And it has a, a footnote six at the bottom of the page. And that footnote reads that uh, vermilion and sunset is a distinct species, morphologically difficult to distinguish vermilion from sunset. Adult sunset rockfish are mainly distributed at depths greater than 50 fathoms and are predominantly located south of Point Conception. Assessment aggregated population dynamics treated as one stock. Uh, could you uh, just maybe provide some context for that last little blurb. Um, and then I'm going to have a follow up how that relates to footnote seven. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, the, uh, the assessment uh, did um, uh, assess both species in combination because they are cryptic species to each other, not uh, not dissimilar from the blue rockfish, Deacon rockfish assessment, rough eye, black spotted that we've seen in the past. Uh, it, it's a, a, a trait of Sebastes in general that there's a lot of uh, cryptic species and 
uh, evolutionary uh, the differentiation occurring over time. So the assessment basically treated it as, as one stock, although the term stock may be an unfortunate word choice because that gets confused and conflated. So um, maybe that, that could be the confusing part about it. But we, they were not able to, um, in the assessment, um, uh, differentiate the historical catch of those two different species. I know there are attempts in uh, California to do that now, and, and that's good. And the hope is that in the future you could have individual species assessments, but um, for the time being, um, these are, are treated um, together, um, which was the reason that the SSC uh, recommended that be a category two um, south of point conception because it's the combination of both species. Um, so did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. It, it did. So if I if I may just take this a little bit further. Um, so maybe I guess what I'm hearing is that the word treated as one stock, the word stock should have been one assessment or one combined assessment would have been, I think, a, a better descriptor. Is that fair? I think that is fair. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then um, further in that row under assessment stratification, it reads four assessments, four area assessments determined by BSIA, Washington, Oregon, and Northern California, and it's footnoted seven. And seven down below says north of Point Conception to 42 degrees. And I'm having some trouble understanding that footnote and that um, note in that box that says assessment stratification with uh, further in the document with vermilion being listed as one alternative under alternative three at 4010. And it says, um, let's see, uh, in order to adopt alternative three for, or excuse me, alternative three for vermilion and sunset, the council would need to consider full stock assessments as the 2021 assessments did not partition the species in a manner that could be adapted to 4010. So I'm just curious why vermilion, get, given the footnote that said it was from, from conception to 42, why there this this blurb here, like what was the consideration for putting vermilion at 4010? I, I just didn't quite understand that. Okay. Um, so uh, the consideration for a uh, 4010 split there was we didn't get it, we haven't gotten any guidance yet on, you know, uh, an alternative for Vermilion and Sunset that didn't have that in there. And since we have been, uh, status quo management uh, is has managed, uh, we manage Vermilion um, and Sunset within the uh, shelf rockfish complexes north and south of 4010. That's sort of the status quo break and how we manage uh, that those species. So, um, you know, we thought that, you know, there may be some desire to analyze that alternative within the range. However, um, you know, it's a, it's a proposed range of alternatives. And as you'll see in some of the advisory body recommendations, uh, there's a recommendation to remove that alternative because it doesn't really meet the purpose and need to get that stock definition done by June because we wouldn't have the capacity to do new assessments for those species. So, um, you know, depending on how compelling that is, you, you may want to do that. Thank you, John. That's that's very helpful and it provides a little more context that I needed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Caroline. And uh, thank you, John. Okay. Jessica Watson. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks for the attachment one, John, on this. Um, I'm just curious a little bit on some planning and process based on some previous discussions we've had under this uh, agenda item. I know that we've received multiple reports under this outlining potential questions to first be addressed in, in this phase of kind of developing some type of criteria. Um, and with that, thinking about the process for how that criteria would then move into additional phases for a different additional species. And this has been discussed in the forms of potentially some additional meetings that would be open to the public so we could have some additional expertise kind of added to some of our GMT representation. And so I was wondering if you could give an update on kind of your thoughts on that process moving forward or where that's at. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
we we have uh, worked in the background on on planning how to do the analysis, and we we certainly acknowledge that uh, it would be helpful to get expertise outside of you know council staff and the GMT to help on that. And the science centers have um, uh, volunteered um, some of their uh, folks to to help on that analysis, and and they have contributed uh, some already. Um, so you know we are cognizant of the fact that you know more expertise is needed and and uh we have some willingness to um from the folks that we talk to to uh contribute to the analysis so uh we anticipate that that will go forward and, and certainly if um uh you know in the course of doing that analysis and work with the gmt and whatnot there are other folks that you know we just you know people decide would be helpful to contribute to the analysis, I think that would be certainly invited. Um, but we, yeah, we have been planning in the background beyond just staff and GMT to help with this. Sure. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Follow-up question, is part of that process uh, the continued thought of developing a criteria that can be used throughout this process as we move through different species and addressing some of those baseline questions of understanding that have been previously stated in other AB reports from the GMT SSC. If I understand the question um, correctly, um, I'm not sure that there's really bright line criteria that could help inform this decision. It's largely a policy decision, although, you know, science informs that uh, policy decision. And so, you know, we, we are, um, you know, keying up the scientists and the SSC to weigh in on the science and, and, um, and how that might affect management going forward under the different uh, alternatives. And some of the um, feedback we've gotten have been uh, captured in the management implications uh, section of attachment one. Um, however, if, if in the course of doing the analysis or in the discussion this week, um, uh, there are criteria that, that you or others um, might recommend be added to the, to the analysis or to the process, uh, not, that, that would be fine. But I, I, I personally, um, couldn't think of a bright line criteria. If this occurs, then do this and that sort of thing. I, I think it's a little. The lines aren't quite so bright since you know it's largely a policy call on uh, how you want to define stocks. Okay, thank you, Jessica. For the questions of, of John. Well, you don't say John for your last time. It's you've done well so. Okay, with that, we'll go to the SSC and uh, Dr. Dan Holland. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Council, uh, Dan Holland, Chair of the SSC. I'll read agenda item H5A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, Science and Statistical Committee Report on Stock Definitions. The SSC discussed the proposed range of alternatives for council consideration for Amendment 31 to the Pacific Coast Ground Fish Fishery Management Plan, as well as the document prepared for this agenda item, agenda item H5, attachment one. As noted in the SSC's June and September 22 statements on this agenda item, defining stocks through an amendment to the ground fish FMP involves a combination of scientific and policy considerations and the SSC limited discussion to scientific considerations. The SSC discussed the white paper that synthesizes the state of knowledge for priority stocks and the management implications of the different prioritized stock definitions. The SSC supports the proposed alternatives for all species listed in attachment one with the exception of sunset vermilion rockfish. The SSC recommends replacing alternative three for vermilion sunset rockfish in favor of a new alternative four that draws a line at point conception and also allows for state specific breaks. This better aligns with the sunset vermilion rockfish population structure and eliminates the need for new assessments. In the future, a generalized version of alternatives three that allows for latitudinal breaks informed by scientific evidence could be considered. The SSC recommends examining the evidence for stock structure on a species specific basis for nearshore stocks. 
The past SSE recommendations for stock definitions have generally been consistent with the recognition that nearshore rockfish are more likely to have finer scale population structure compared to shelf or slope groundfish species. Typically, management of nearshore stocks is not based on coastwide overfishing limits, acceptable biological catches or status determinations, because the evidence supports population structure at a finer scale than coastwide. In case, cases where there is a lack of data on spatial structure, the SSC recommends stock definitions and stock assessments at finer spatial scales based on scientific evidence for similar species and data availability. That concludes the SSC statement, and I'd be happy to take questions. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, questions on the SSC report? Corey Niles. Thanks, Dan. On your last paragraph there, I was, um, I was able to attend the SSC discussion um, and I, I think the first sentence, leaving it open to fit to the facts, was is, was one message. But what's missing from from your paragraph there, and I, th I think we're present, and so was Mr. Devore. So um, you know, please check my memory and accuracy of what I'm saying here. But I think, as they're explaining there, and I explained elsewhere, and and I think you were before us this last meeting when we talked about this and in copper rockfish and in SSC's decision recommendation last cycle to um, treat the Southern California bite um, as, as more of a, a local depletion issue than than a hard break um, that would, would be a separate stock. Um, so what I asked the SSC is, is what we don't know what this, the, there's obviously some structure of populations in these nearshore stocks, but it could be more like a stepping stone, a, a Klein, it, uh, uh, you know, uh, a continuum um, is, you know, people use different words for these things. Um, and what I heard Andre say in response to, uh, like, what if the question was, What's the best way to manage these if as if the population connectivity was a Klein? He answered something like there there are, well, if it's a Klein, there are no hard breaks between the areas, but but the best thing to do um, is to, you know, err on the side of splitting more than lumping and, and do smaller assessments. So is that is that accurate um, to what you heard during that discussion? And if so. Um, what if we what if we think what if the council wants to know if we want to we, we think these nearshore uh, stocks might be more of a stepping stone uh, continuum type of population connectivity um, how, how do we how do we get that discussion going because it seems like you're concluding here that we, sh we shouldn't even um, consider that option maybe I'm reading too much in that last sentence there but I think you got what I'm after I'll stop there uh, okay, thank you for the question, um, Mr. Niles. Um, I I, th I think you're correct in, in, in the way you described what Andre said and the discussion we had uh, in, the, in that um, we did say you, that if there's some question about stock structure and there's, and, and there's sort of a continuum that you would err on the side um, of, of uh, creating two stocks rather than one, um, choosing some some uh, line in the middle, um, based on you know potentially it's somewhat arbitrary, but it's um, potentially based on where the data is, uh, um, other factors. Uh, I'm not. I guess I'm not following um, w how that is is. In, um, conflict with what we were saying here. Uh, thanks, Dan. Let me, uh, and I've closed the tab with your statement on it. So uh, um, here it is. In cases where there is a lack of data on spatial structure, the SSC recommends stock definitions and stock assessments at a finer spatial scales based on science. So that's the recommend stock definitions at finer spatial scales. I heard that the assessment should be on um, a finer scale, not necessarily the stock definition. And there was some nuance between substock and stock and all that. So that's where I was seeing the conflict. I didn't hear the, the discussion say that it should definitely be defined as a stock at smaller areas, but assessed at, at smaller areas. Does that make, does that help? 
Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Th thank you for the clarification. Um, I guess I'm not, uh, I'm not sure if I remember it that way. Um, I, I think that uh, I do remember some discussion about that and, and that, um, that you, you know, you could make it, you, you could have an assessment at different levels and, and have it once, have it as one stock and you could manage um, those areas differently as well, uh, even if it is one, one stock for the purposes of, of making uh, status determinations. Um, and, you know, I think uh, in, in such cases, it may be a policy decision um, rather than a, you know, than a, than a uh, uh, scientific decision, um, particularly if, there, if the assessment is, is done at the finer scale and you have the ability to, to uh, put in different management measures in different areas. Uh, I think we did. We have made the point in general that that um, the, the, these determinations of of uh, stock structure of the of the geographic structure, I guess, of of the stocks is not purely a scientific uh, consideration. That it's a there's policy considerations as well. Uh, so I don't think we are making a firm determination that you should always uh, always have a. Uh, uh, another break, um, but if there is a clear separation of these, uh, uh, then it may make sense to uh, to do that. Kili <laughs> here. Thanks. Um, thanks for the report, Dr. Holland. Um, I'm also going to ask you about that last paragraph, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to the discussion that led up to that recommendation, specifically thinking about these nearshore stocks and um, thinking about what characterizing them as coastwide stocks would mean and what the assumptions then would be about the mixing, um, and in particular, whether the SSC discussed any biological risks um, to those populations, if, if indeed there is spatial structure and those they're separate stocks or they don't have a sufficient level of mixing, what the risks are of considering them a coastwide stock are. Is that something the SSC got into? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I don't remember that. Well, we may have talked a little about risks, and not exactly in that context. Um, I think the the you know the the reason for this paragraph and the discussion is that that there is um, not a lot known about some of these uh, some of these species, but there is uh, an understanding that they tend to uh, that they don't tend to mix up and you know up and down the coast and, and that they do tend, they are likely to be separate. And so um, there are reasons to manage them separately. Uh, it probably doesn't make sense to do, do it at, at a coast wide level. Um, it, I, there, you know, there are obvious risks there. If you were, particularly if you were assessing it at the coast wide level, or if you had no management controls uh, that, that could control uh, local depletion, uh, it, it does seem conceivable that you can manage those risks in other ways uh, other than having a status determination uh, at a state border, for example. Um, and and uh, you, you could potentially manage manage things at another way. But, um, <clears throat> you know, there are pros and cons of that, um, because once if you have if you have a coastwide determination, there's that also creates some other risks um, in that that uh, if if you do go over the line, um, that means the whole the whole coast has to rebuild. Uh, I think we did talk about that a little bit. Um, so there's a risk there's a risk there as well. Um, on the other hand, uh, if you if you uh, are managing at the at the smaller areas and potentially creates a greater risk that one of those areas is going to 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 need to rebuild. So the risks um, I think both ways there are biological risks there. Their uh, economic social risks, as well, and which is again, I think, part of the reason why this is a policy decision rather than a purely scientific one. Thank you, Keely. Corey Niles. Yeah, thanks. On that same topic, Dan, I think, and John Devore, please, um, your level of comprehension is, is higher than mine on these. But what I what I heard, first of all, I, I was I don't think anyone was arguing that you would ever. Um, 
assess the near shore stocks in one single coast wide assessment. That's where, where Keeley's assumptions, I think you were going Keeley of you assume full mixing of, of all the individuals and larvae coast wide. But you could, what I, what I was hearing is when Mr. DeVore asked a follow up question after that discussion, um, what would happen if, if, if um, a coast wide near shore stock was, was um, declared overfished. And then you all had a discussion about how the rebuilding plan the full coast would be under a building plan, but then the rebuilding measures would be tailored to the individual area assessments. And there you would apply different SPR rates based on the results of each individual area. So you're not assuming full mixing coast wide, you're, you're um, applying the SPR rate based on the area specific abundances. Um, and I pointed out to them, that's exactly what this council did with Quillback, this recommended this last cycle, except for the fact that Quillback was not formally under a building plan. But does that match your memory of the discussion? And again, I would throw the question to John too. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question again. Um, that does match my memory of it. Um, I think the, the point was there under rebuilding analysis, a rebuilding plan, you could have, if you had a, for example, a, a very uh, healthy portion of the uh, of the of the larger stock in some area, um, the rebuilding plan could be tailored to uh, to potentially, I guess, uh, allow a, high, a higher exploitation rate in those areas than might be uh, allowed in other areas in order to achieve the rebuilding plan, um, rather than just having an across the board, uh, you know, same. Uh, the same more fishing mortality rate. I, I, if you have something to add to that, John. Yeah, I, I, I agree that the characterization is, is uh, comports with my memory of the discussion. Um, you know, Andre did go on to talk about, you know, population simulation modeling of, you know, these kinds of things and, and uh, you know, the, the, the um, over, um, if, if you lump things more, you're going to have more often, you're going to have bad outcomes than if you, if you split given that uncertainty when there's stock structure. Um, and we talked a little bit about, you know, I mean, the, the whole thing with stock definitions is that future specification of OFLs will coincide with the stock definition and an OFL is, um, you know, will reduce the risk of, at a finer scale, uh, scale will reduce the risk of localized depletion than, you know, other controls. And so it really comes down to a risk tolerance thing. And, and um, it, it occurs to me that your first question about how would we suss that out, um, I, I would perhaps recommend that you uh, bring both, you know, dispersed and in, in finer scale alternatives into the analysis and, and that would be a good way to really suss that out. Thanks, Corey. For the questions for, for the SSC. Very good. Thank you, Dan. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Okay, next up will be the GMT and uh Mel Madrup. Welcome Mel. Good evening, we'll try it again. Uh, Mel Mander up here with the uh, Groundfish Management team reading the uh, agenda item H5, Supplemental GMT Report 1 on stock definitions. The GMT reviewed the materials for the briefing book and received the overview from John, Mr. John DeVore from the council staff um, during our October 20th, uh, 2022 webinar and had some lengthy discussions about this topic. Below are some additional considerations. Range of alternatives, attachment item H5, agenda item attachment one, it's late, sorry. Uh, provides a draft range of alternatives for consideration at this meeting, as well as some background on how the alternatives were developed. The council may choose to use this range of alternatives or revise as deemed necessary no action. It is the GMT's understanding that the no action alternative is not a viable alternative as it does not meet the purpose and need and would not allow the 
allow the National Marine Fishery Service to make status determinations. Therefore, while no action is needed for the analysis of the range, it should not be included as an alternative going forward. Action alternatives. For any species for which alternative one is chosen, the GMT recommends defining that species as an interrelated single stock instead of coastwide to invite, avoid implying that the species range is coastwide. For example, square spot and California scorpion fish. For the purposes of stock status determination, the groundfish fishery management plan only needs to indicate whether a species is managed off the west coast as a single stock or as multiple stocks with separate OFLs. The GMT believes that the term interrelated single stock would provide management flexibility in the future light in the future in light of potential climate change at impacts on species ranges. The GMT recommends adopting the range of alternatives proposed in agenda item H5, attachment one, with a recommendation uh, recommended revisions in table one below. With those revisions, we believe the ROA would adequately meet the purpose and need for the propriety species, propriety, the species that we think are most important. <laughs> <laughs> being considered for Amendment 30. Again, tired GMT member, sorry. Uh, okay, so table one on the next page. Um, so uh, taking off of the table in attachment one under this agenda item, um, the GMT made a few alterations here and I'll walk you through it. So you can look at this as for black rockfish, the TMT recommends removing alternative one through for the range of alternatives and keeping alternative two for the range of alternatives. And another example uh, for vermilion sunset rockfishes, the GMT recommends removing alternative one from the range of alternatives pending the decision about the new SSC alternative four, and I'll get to that later. Um, include alternative two in the range of alternatives uh, and remove alternative three for the range of alternatives. So that's how you should um, walk through that table. Uh, so justifications for GMT recommended changes uh, for black rockfish, given the history of management as multiple stocks, the GMT recommends removing alternative one from the range of alternatives for black rockfish. Black rockfish has been managed as multiple stocks, such as that is state specific, with specific OFLs since at least 20, 2003, and has been managed in a complex with blue, blue, blue and deacon rockfishes off Oregon since 2019. In the 2015 stock assessment, black rockfish were assessed at a state specific level, and at this time, the GMT is not aware of any genetic information that would support an interrelated single stock off the West Coast. This recommendation is distinctly different from what the team is recommending in the range of alternatives for copper rockfish and quillback rockfish, because black rockfish has extensive, extensive species specific management and area specific management history. It is unlikely that continuation of that approach will appreciably change the harvest and management efficiency compared to recent years. Square spot rockfish. The GMT recommends adding alternative one and removing alternative two for, Calif um, for square spot rockfish. Based on the current knowledge, there is little evidence of multiple distinct populations despite the fact that information for the 2021 assessment was only available off California. If the range of square spot rockfish expands northward across the Oregon California border in the future, it can still be considered as interrelated single stock across geopolitical state boundaries, given the best scientific information available. Vermilion sunset rockfishes. The GMT recommends removing alternative three 
uh, for vermilion rockfishes because the structure of the most recent stock assessment does not inform stock status or OFL stratified at this latitude and therefore this alternative may not meet the purpose and need for Amendment 31. The GMT notes that the SSC's proposal to include a fourth alternative for vermilion rockfishes to have a stock delineation at 3427 and the GMT supports including this alternative in the range of alternatives. The GMT believes that the SSC recommended alternative to have vermilion rockfish, sunset rockfishes defined with a break at point conception, 3427, would essentially eliminate alternative one from further consideration. Therefore, if the SSC recommendation alternative is added to the range of alternatives, the GMT recommends removing both alternative one and three for, for further consideration. Additional species to be considered for Amendment 31. At the September 2022 Council meeting, the GMT provided a list of additional species to be included in Amendment 31 as interrelated single stocks because they have previously they previously have been assessed as a single coastwide stock or unassessed and managed as such. The GMT recommends that the species in Table 2 below be added to Amendment 31 with species-specific range of alternatives that only include Alternative 1 because it would support a larger number of species having stock definitions formalized in the FMP. Furthermore, defining these stocks as interrelated single stocks in the FMP would align with current management, the analytical workload, and the uh, analytical workload to do so is expected to be minimal. In the course of analyzing the alternatives, should any new information warrant consideration of an alternative other than an interrelated single stock, considering those species as part of subsequent amendments would avoid amendment Delay, Amendment 31 delays. The GMT recommends at a minimum adding yellow eye, yellow eye rockfish to Amendment 31 with a, with a range of alternatives that only includes Alternative 1, as the GMT believes it would be prudent to define rebuilding stocks in the FMP with this amendment opposed to waiting until a later phase. So on the next page, page we have Table 2. Uh, so again, a list of the, the same species we put forward uh, in September, but now in a table to kind of match um, the format of table one. GMT requests clarifications and corrections. Agenda item H5 attachment one incorrectly states that the 2021 stock assessment estimated that 0.27% of the square spot rockfish population is north of 4010 North Latitude. The GMT would like to provide clarification on this, on this statement. The 21 stock assessment of square spot did not provide area-based biomass estimates north and south of 4010. However, the stock assessment did provide the percentage of total removals that occurred north of 4010 since 1981, which was 0.27% of total coastwide removals, noting that removals have only been recorded off California. Finally, in Table 1 of Attachment 1, there are statements there are statements provided under e the types of scientific information available to consider by species that lack, pro lack proper citation. For proper consideration during overwinter analysis, these sources should be provided. GMT workload and capacity, because we always have to say something about that. The GMT will be conducting two work sessions between November 20 of this year and March of next year, uh, the, the meetings to work on the analysis to bring the, the council, to bring to the council at the March meeting. The GMT requ requests the council be specific about what the GMT will be expected to produce for the March 23 meeting. The GMT further notes that the timeline of the next phase is likely to align directly with the 25-26 harvest specifications and management measures process 
which will curtail the involvement of the GMT. Further, the concurrent timelines may preclude the council from taking up any new management measures during the harvest specifications and management measures process. Below that is a summary of all our recommendations. Uh, and with that, I will do my best to answer any questions you may have for me. Thank you, Mel. Questions for Mel on the GMT report? Caroline. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mel, for the report. Um, I, I did have one question, surprisingly, on Vermillion and your recommendation to remove alternative three. Um, did the team have the benefit of seeing the SSC's recommendation to add a line at conception and at 42 when you had your discussions and made these recommendations? Um, we got wind of it. And then um, once we had the actual recommendation, the actual uh, report, then um, we cited it, we used it in our, in our report. So we, there was some discussion um, mainly about the south of point conception break, um, not not so much about the 40 north or the 42 break for Vermilion, but we did talk about potentially using a 42 break for some species if that is what science dictates. Um, however, we also think that can kind of also be captured in um, alternative two. Thank you, Mel. And then just following up, I, I, it would be helpful to understand a little bit more why uh, there's the recommendation to remove the 4010 um, if there was a conception line added as well. Um, just, just curious why, if, it, if the discussion was if a line goes in at conception, then nothing else is needed to the north because there was no information to support it, or why was that alternative three removed from Vermilion? Uh, well, there's not enough information to support um, a break at 40 ton at this time, and it would require another stock assessment, which we don't really have time to do in, in order to get this in. Um, so that was most of it. There's, it's it's not slated to do uh, have an assessment anytime soon to provide that new information. Um, so we decided not to go with 40 tons split there, delineation. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Caroline. Jessica? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Mel, for the report. I see that the GMT is recommending defining that species as for alternative one as interrelated single stock instead of coastwide. Did the team have any discussion about potential implications of changing the term? Um, well, we always know when we um, throw in new terms, it's going to confuse some folks for a little bit, trying to uh, acclimate to the new terms. But as far as any legal implications, no. Um, we just thought it would be a, a little more accurate in describing a stock um, if it's not actually coast-wide. There was some discussion about what definition is really needed in order for NIMS to make a declaration that was as long my understanding from that discussion was that as long as it's a clear definition of a stock or if it's a stock or multiple stocks that's mostly what they need to go off of thank you pretty good Corey yeah, thanks, Val, and thanks for being up here and being so being while you're tired um, and making us laugh. Um, yeah, I guess I was a little confused by the new term. What I what I what I think I hear you all saying is that not all um, stocks will range from from the Mexican border to the Canada border. So like there might be square spot. I think you all, there's a species that's just in the Southern California bite, so you wouldn't want to call that coast right coast wide, right? So that's the main meaning you have. Um, when I when I saw that term, I was thinking more about national standard 
Three's language, which says, you know, a stock is an interrelated um, set of individuals. But so it would be interrelated stocks, plural, is where that term comes from. So um, that are so closely related, you can't really separate them on that kind of continuum example I gave. But is that what you're going back to your first? Is, it, is you're just trying to make that point that not all species range full north to full south, or is there more to it there? Uh, that's the most most of it, yes, because um, not of our species take over the entire range from Canada to Mexico within the EEZ, um, but they may cross geopolitical borders. And so um, just giving them a definition of an interrelated single stock just seemed a little more accurate than saying something's coastwide and when it's not really coastwide. Uh, oh, and if I may, and if in the future we do see um, range extensions um, within the EEZ, uh, it kind of just helps with, you know, if, if there's any range extensions due to climate change, it just gives some additional flexibility when defining <laughs> where your stock may be. Okay, thank you, Corey. Any more questions for Mel? Caroline? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thanks, Mel, just one more question. Um, I'm sorry to, to kind of overly focus on this 4010 question, but um, um, I realize that we have some assessments that are at the 42 line while we then also have those species at a complex level at 4010, which is, I think, making it difficult to um, think of these as more broad stock definitions. So some of these may be subject to changing based on science or policy decisions. Um, were any of the GMT discussions surrounded around the complex versus pulling them out at 4010 versus 42 and the implications for say, some of these species being um, in say shelf complex north of 4010 and how that affects allocations or IQ or anything like that. Was there any discussion about that? We try to keep the discussion about complexes to a minimum um, and focus mainly on what stocks should be defined um, to be put into Amendment 21 or 31 um, and save the discussion on how to work with stocks later. Like re if we need to redefine stocks, pool species out of um, complexes rather, um, have that complex, complex discussion later um, once we get through this first amendment. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we, we're trying to save that discussion for later, mostly. Thanks about that. That's fair. And I, I can appreciate that while they're interrelated, they're the, it was focused to just the stock definition right now. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Caroline. No one else? Very good. Thanks, Mel. Next up is Merritt McRae in the uh, GAP report. Merritt. Almost didn't make it. Good evening, Vice Chair Pettinger, uh, council members and staff. I'm Merritt McRae and I'll be reading from agenda item H5A supplemental GAP report one, Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Stock Definitions. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, GAP, met with the Groundfish Management Team, GMT, and discussed potential alternatives under this agenda item. We support the GMT's November 2022 Supplemental GMT Report 1 under this item and the options as outlined within Table 1 there, including their suggestions outlined within it. As highlighted by the GMT and Supplemental GAP, uh, GMT Report 1, the interrelated single stock approach recommended under alternative one would provide management flexibility in the future in light of potential climate change impacts on species ranges. Moreover, as stated by the GMT in September 22 supplemental GMT report one, 
quotes, defining these stocks at a, at a coastwide scale would allow the council to define stocks for stock status and then utilize localized management measures to manage stocks at the spatial scales aligning with the best scientific information available, which also, unquote, which also provides important flexibility in managing these stocks. The GAP thanks the GMT for their thoughtful consideration and analyses of and deliberation on this matter. Thank you. Thank you, Barrett. Questions on the GAP report? I think you're good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our uh, team and uh, AP report and um, public comment. I don't see anything there, but we have zero. It is 6.06. .06. And so um, I think, oh, Corey. Thanks, Mr. Bicher. I'm not. I'm not trying to get back to you all, all for making us start these meetings so early for so many years. And I'm, I'm a night person, but uh, I do hope to um, have a question. A question of John before we break, so just to help think about it over the over the evening, if that's okay. Yep. Very good. Please. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'll try to get this one out, um, but might need your help. But thinking about the. Um, the structure of the alternatives here. And like you said, the, the goal here is how do we suss this stuff out? And we're mixing th these questions of um, how to uh, do the assessments by area, how to define the stocks by area. Um, and so I'm gonna use Canary Rockfish as the example I have in mind. And, and the GMT also brought Yellow Eye up and, and rec both of those you have, oh, the GMT recommended and you have in your, your um, your proposal to have canary just coast wide but um so the question here how what if you know we um both yellow eye and canary we you know as you as you well know um went from just coast wide pure coast wide assessments to having some kind of spatial um aspects to them and i think i think they were the at least the yellow eye was state by state um but like linked together by a, a common recruitment um Canary was some fancy thing that I don't, I don't few people understand, I guess. But the uh, so how do what, what what if we wanted to um, how what, I I would to explore to help suss that out. I would almost just want to propose canary rockfish be um, on the on the the state bound whatever the alternative is. I can't think of the name right now, and I'm not going to derail myself by looking at the document so I think you know so what if I want we wanted to we want to explore how we get finer scale area estimates of of um, abundance um, even for species that we think do mix to a greater degree like canary I'll stop there to see if I'm making sense and um, would just including that um, statewide or state boundary option be enough do you think to explore that yep, John well, I have a couple of uh, reactions to the question, if I'm understanding it correctly. Um, first off, uh, a state-by-state -state alternative uh, for Canary wouldn't really, well, I guess it could be possible under um, Amendment 31, but then you would have to direct the stock assessment team to provide state-specific assessments, or at least have assessments that would break at state borders to be able to do that. And I, I don't anticipate that that was, th that's their plan going forward. But, um, if that were, if you wanted to have that alternative really be considered in amendment 31, that would be one of the, we'd have to do that, right. To make that alternative viable for amendment 31. But I can't imagine that that would be advised by the science centers. They, um, I guess they could do it that way, but there's no evidence of stock, stock structure within our, uh, our coastline for canary rockfish. So I guess I would really, um, push back a little bit and, and ask, get explicitly uh, get an explicit understanding of why that alternative should be considered for canary 
Thanks. So the, well, what I'm saying is that I don't think the, the structure you have here fits the, the request. So I'm trying to try to fit it into your structure here. And I don't, I don't, I think what I've read from in the stuff you cited is there are differences um, coast wide, maybe not at this, not the state boundaries, but how do we signal that we would like um, the assessment to pr provide um, more spatially fine scale estimates of, um, of relative abundance, you know, through through the, the setup and the frame, and maybe we, you can just think about it overnight. Um, we can talk off the line, but that's just the question I have in, in mind because I think that is for yellow eyes maybe a better example where they did do it um, state by state, I believe. So, but maybe maybe you could just cogitate it on it. Uh, we can talk about it offline. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to. Uh... We've opened a public comment up, or closing public comment, I guess, and we'll start on council action tomorrow on this on this uh, agenda item. So with that, I will gladly give the uh, gavel back to our, our chair. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. And before we break, I am sure that Executive Director Merrick Burden has a reminder for all of us. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I can do uh, PowerPoint karaoke here, or just read off the screen. So it's time to fall back. We have uh, at 2 a.m. Clocks will go back one hour. Don't forget. Uh, that's my final remark. So <laughs> thank you, Mark. Have a good evening. We'll see you at 8 o'clock Pacific <laughs> Standard Time. <laughs>